I was no more than eight years old when I saw it. Even my sister, who was 10 years old, saw it. We lived with my grandparents at the time, but my grandpa often liked sleeping in the living room because he often wakes up at night to pray at our tiny altar. We don't always close our bedroom door. Basically, the living room was next to our bedroom and our bedroom was next to the bathroom. So we'd see if anybody were to go to the bathroom through our bedroom. One Saturday night, my sister and I stayed up late watching TV in the bedroom. The only light in the house that was on was in our bedroom. My grandpa chose to sleep in the living room again. It was past midnight, so we thought everybody in the neighborhood was asleep. That was until we saw my grandpa walking past our bedroom. We both stared at him until he disappeared from our sight. Of course, who would be scared? It's our grandpa. But for some reason, we had chills because he never came back out. We assumed he needed to go to the bathroom, but we never even heard the door close. And like I said, he never walked back the other way to go back to the living room. What creeped us out was how unusually straight he was walking, as if he was marching, like a soldier, and a bit too slow. It was almost like he was trying to scare us. It was a bit dark, but we knew it was him because of his features, so we called out to him. The first few calls garnered no reply, so we raised our voice so that he could hear us better. This time he came to us, but what shocked us was that he emerged from the living room instead of the bathroom. Note that my grandpa often wears all white clothing when he's at home. It didn't hit us until then that our grandpa was wearing colored clothing that day and not all white. The one that we saw was wearing a white sleeveless shirt and white shorts and was barefoot. So it couldn't have been him. This scared us even more. We asked our grandpa if he had gone to the bathroom just now. He said no, that he was asleep. It was impossible for him to have pranked us because there was no exit through the bathroom. The windows there are barred. We immediately told him about what we saw. He went to check, but saw nothing. We were scared kids. We didn't know what doppelgangers were until then. Our grandpa talked to us about doppelgangers. He said that's probably what we saw, that it was kind of well known in our area, and that if we saw any more, that we should immediately tell the original person about it, because if we don't, then something bad might happen to them. My sister and I never forgot about it. I would also like to share an incident that occurred a few years ago in a different part of my country. I forget the exact details, but it was on the news and all over social media. A young couple was killed in a motorcycle accident. I believe a bus ran over them. But what intrigued everyone was what the townsfolks said. They said that last night they saw the couple riding their motorcycle, wearing the same clothing. But what shocked them was that they were headless. I don't know if it's real or if they were just exaggerating, but the first thought everyone had was doppelgangers. Nobody knew who it was because they didn't have their heads. That was until people recognized the clothing that the dead couple was wearing the next day. Except the couples still had their heads, but their bodies were contorted in various ways and everyone assumed that that was what the bad omen that the doppelgangers brought were trying to communicate. That story reminded me of what I saw when I was a kid, and I still don't have a decent explanation for either. I want to tell you a story about my mother's encounter with a doppelganger. It was about nine years ago when my mom was doing a late shift. She was still an accountant at the time, so she had to work extra hours to complete her work. She told me that at about 11.20, she went for a quick coffee when she sighted a person exactly like her that went past by the break room. 
She thought she was just being paranoid and that her eyes were tired. She was scared that it was a thief though, so she brought her personal bag with her just in case. She went down for the coffee, then came back to the working station. But as she stood at the door of the break room, the doppelganger was standing there right by the computer. My mother was terrified as it just stood there looking at the computer. Luckily, a security officer was doing his last rounds to turn off the electricity and he saw my mom. He touched her, which brought her back to reality. But this time, the officer noticed the doppelganger. He seemed to understand what was going on and proceeded to escort my mom out of the building. When they were outside, he explained to her that it was a bad omen and told her to change where she worked. She did and got a promotion about two months after the incident. She never saw her double again. About two days ago, I had a craving for McDonald's. It was around 10.30 or 11 at night, so I went out and got my food and was headed back home. I usually go through a back alley to get to the front of my house faster. This night was no different, but to give you a picture, it's a back alleyway with houses on one side and a field on the other. Anyway, I'm heading home and I take the back alley going about 30 kilometers an hour. Everything is good, when suddenly a person steps in front of my view, coming from the field side. He was maybe five or ten feet away, so I slammed on my brakes so as not to hit the guy, and I didn't. I was sure of it, but the guy wasn't in my view anymore, so I panicked a little, put the car in park, and got out to see and apologize for not seeing him earlier. Like I said, he wasn't there. I walked out to the front of the car, no dents. I looked under the vehicle and there was nothing there. I moved back a couple of steps to see if there was anyone in the field. I called out, but I got no answer. So I brushed it off as much as one could and I turned around to head back to my car. And that's when I saw myself. Granted, it was a shadow because he was standing right next to my door and I had the headlight aiming at me. I was in front of my vehicle. I asked, are you all right? I'm so sorry. I got no answer. The figure was just standing there. I said hello and still no answer. So I waved my hand and said, yoo-hoo. And he did the same. He waved his hand, but said nothing. It was freaky because it was a mirror image of my hand motion. It really caught me off guard, so I stepped back, and so did the shadow. It was so weird. So I walked toward him, and he did the same. And as soon as he was in range of the light, he was gone. No puff of smoke, no blur, just there one minute, and in the blink of an eye, gone. I was not about to look around anymore. I opened my door and got in, and I drove back home. I still get goosebumps just thinking about it. I was sitting downstairs in the kitchen, waiting for water to boil. I was talking to my brother downstairs for a bit, and he told me that he was going to take a shower. Soon after, my brother went upstairs to go shower. I was alone by myself downstairs, sitting on a chair, playing on my phone, and facing myself toward the opened bathroom. My phone was positioned upward near my face. It's not sitting so low near the bottom. About two minutes later, out of the top of my peripheral vision, I saw my brother walking out of the bathroom, wearing clothes that I have seen him own and wear before. The top half of the shirt is white while the bottom half is black. 
His head was positioned and focused oddly when he was walking out of the bathroom, like straight forward. He wasn't looking at me. I felt kind of startled, so I stood up and called out to him. No one else appeared in the living room. At that moment, I remembered that my brother was upstairs in the other bathroom showering. One thing I remember is that he walked out fast, but didn't seem to completely walk all the way out. It was like he was diminished halfway through. That part freaked me out the most. It was my brother that I saw, but something was just not quite right. I've never seen a doppelganger before, and it really freaked me out. At around 11 years old, I was in my room, sleeping on the top bunk. My sister was asleep on the bottom bunk. Across from my bed was my dresser with a large mirror. If you're laying and you look to the left, the mirror is there. I remember waking up in the middle of the night and looking at the mirror, and I saw what looked like myself sitting on the bottom bunk, staring at me through the mirror with a grin. Except she looked like she was sitting backwards so that she had to turn her head to look toward the mirror, if that makes sense. I was really confused and really creeped out. I stared at it for a while, thinking that maybe it was my sister. I even called out her name, but it wasn't. I strained my eyes to try and see better in the dim lighting, but I got too freaked out, so I turned around and tried to go back to sleep. The next morning, I find a handprint on the mirror. I was beyond spooked at this point. That house always had weird activity too. Bottles in the bathroom randomly crashing down. Once I heard a man shout, hey, when I was alone and leaving for school. Very strange house. I know some might say that this was a dream and maybe it was, but I know that I was wide awake. It felt so real. I remember it vividly. I remember trying to get back to sleep afterward. I'll never forget though, the feeling of staring at myself, staring back at me so menacingly. Has anyone else noticed an increase in doppelganger sightings recently? I just had one yesterday at the library where I work. My coworker and I saw a patron, a regular who we see almost every day, walk in in sweatpants. Neither of us saw him leave. About 15 minutes later, the same man walked in through the one and only entrance and exit, this time wearing something completely different and more formal. My coworker and I stared at each other, completely puzzled. I asked him how he had walked past me so fast that I didn't even notice and why he had changed clothes. He looked at me like I was crazy. He claimed that he had been home all day and this was his first time stopping by. My coworker told him what happened and he was visibly freaked out. It freaked us all out because we looked around for this doppelganger and whoever it was had completely vanished. There is, like I said, only one way in and one way out for patrons. The other doors are either emergency exits, which would have set off the alarms, or the staff entrance, which is a highly restricted area. There was no way he could have left in that short a time without at least one of us noticing. There are no cameras in the building, so there's no way to see how this person could have left. But the only phenomenon that I can attribute this to is the mystery of doppelgangers. I'm very interested in the paranormal, but I'm not a researcher or an investigator. Just a fan, I guess. It seems like there's been an increase in doppelganger sightings. Has anyone else noticed this? I wonder what it could mean.
The experience that I'm relaying here happened to one of my best friends who stays with his grandmother who's in her mid eighties. One day, her daughter picked her up and they went shopping together. My friend Rob went into his bedroom to watch TV right after they left. About a half an hour later, he heard some noise coming from the kitchen. So he poked his head out the door to see what it was. He saw his grandmother in the kitchen, facing away from him, digging furiously through her junk drawer, obviously searching for something. He just shrugged and went back into his room. Another hour and a half passes and he comes out into the living room. That's when he see his aunt's van pull up to the house and his grandmother and aunt come in carrying all of her parcels. He then became uneasy and asked her if she found what she was looking for in the kitchen. She looked at him like he was nuts and said that she had been gone for hours and that she had never been looking in the kitchen drawer that day. He then explained that he had seen her and that whoever it was had on the exact same clothes and the same hair. He started laughing, thinking that she was just trolling him, but his aunt looked very concerned and verified that they had not returned after their initial departure. Rob began to freak out, and when he told me what happened later that day, he was glad that he didn't see its face, whatever it was. I believe him, because he's never told a story even remotely close to this one, and he seemed really unsettled by the whole incident. Honestly, I would be too. About five years ago, my wife and I got into a pretty big argument right after our son was first born. We were all heading to the pharmacy that morning, but both of us being immature decided to go separately. I had the day off, so I brought my son with me. It was only about a quarter of a mile up the street from my house, so we planned on walking. Well, I left a little late and I didn't see my wife in the house prior to me leaving because of us avoiding each other. And when I got about a minute from there, I see my wife turn the corner. So I'm kind of not looking at her. But then when we pass, we both kind of mean mugged each other and didn't say a word. I go in, I get my script and I get home. Well, she's laying on the couch in her pajamas and not even getting ready for work. So I tapped her and I said, what the heck, you're not getting ready for work. Why did you change out of your clothes? Are you not going to work now? And she was like, what are you talking about? I've been laying here in my pajamas. I'm just going to go get my script and a few things that I was going to get later. I was like, you didn't go to the pharmacy earlier. I just walked past you like 10 to 15 minutes ago when you were leaving. You gave me that evil, dirty look. So I gave you the same one in return. She starts saying that I'm crazy and must have been hallucinating. And what did I take? I totally didn't believe her. I thought she was just gaslighting me, trying to make me feel like I was losing my mind. But later that night, when we were cooled down, we all went to Walmart together to get her scripts and a few of the things that she needed. I literally felt like I was in the twilight zone. I kept saying like, come on, Jill, quit messing with me. She swore up and down and actually started getting a little irritated that I kept pressing her about it. Ultimately, I believe her that she had never left the house. It was one of the weirdest experiences that I've ever had. After I believed her that it really wasn't her, things started sticking out to me, like the look she gave me and how things about her face just were a little off. Even when she's mad at me, the look that she gives me is never that evil. And that's exactly what this look was. Just evil. Like even at resting neutrality, this face would have been full of evil and hatred. It was just like that. But still at the time, we locked eyes and I was totally convinced it was my wife. I still have no idea what happened.
My husband saw my doppelganger in our hallway last night. We live in an old farmhouse, and we've had many paranormal and unexplained spirits, noises, and so on. We've had paranormal investigators over to our house, and we're waiting on the report. Last night, I was in the bathtub. My husband came into the bathroom to wash his hands and went back out to do laundry. He was in the laundry room and looked through the kitchen and saw what he thought was me in the hallway. Apparently, I was buck naked. He called my name and he said that whoever this was turned her face toward him and gave him a look like she didn't know who he was. Then she walked a step behind a column and our son came out from the same column going the opposite way. Our son asked who my husband was talking to. When my husband said he was talking to me, my son said that I wasn't there. He'd never seen me. My husband came into the bathroom where I was still in the tub, and he made me swear up and down that I had never left the tub. He was very freaked out and made us follow him from room to room for the rest of the night and announce ourselves if we came into a room where he was. He had spoken to a medium a few months prior. She's coming Saturday to bless us and our home. She said she would try to see what spirits were there and try to release them. And also she told me to place black salt around our doorways and the four corners of our home. It's easily the weirdest thing we've ever experienced. Does anyone else have a doppelganger story? This was a long time ago when I was in the third or fourth grade. I used to live in a slightly haunted house in a small town. While I lived there, I would sometimes get the feeling that someone was following me around town or in the house. Sometimes I would also feel a couple of light taps on my shoulder, like someone was trying to get my attention. Other times, I would hear someone call my name from behind me. Every time I turned around to see who it was, there would be no one there. I could never see whatever was following me but sometimes other people did. The first time it was my sister. She had finished washing the first load of dishes and was looking for me so that I could dry them and put them away. I was upstairs and I heard her yell my name. I yelled back and came downstairs. When I got there, she was staring at me like I had grown a second head. She told me that she came into the living room and saw me laying on the couch watching TV. She asked me if I was going to come in and finish the load of dishes. I didn't respond and kept staring at the TV. She yelled my name to get my attention. That's when she heard me yell back from upstairs. She looked up the stairs, then back to the couch, to find that I had disappeared. Things like that happened a few more times around town with a few of my friends. They would see me somewhere they would say hi, and they would get no response. Then I would show up shortly after, and the other me would vanish. I never got to see what it was that followed me before we moved. It never followed me out of town, or maybe it did and I never noticed, because the next house we moved into was haunted as heck. Either way, I thought it was an interesting experience. For some background, early in my childhood, we moved around a few times, but it was in the same general area, so I never had to change schools. The first seven to eight years was in a home my dad built himself. He was a builder, and the area was very bad. Mosquitoes were everywhere. The terrain outside was great. There was a creek and forest area for me to play in. It was huge and eventually we decided to move out. We rented a place a few minutes away, but we kept working on that house, patching it up for selling it, and eventually we moved into another place. 
My dad stayed in that house for a bit to work on it some more. So my brother made the decision of living with my mom or my dad. He chose to live with my dad and I stayed with my mom. My brother would occasionally come over, but I had to sleep in my mom's room when that happened because we shared the same room, but never slept in it together. On the night of this encounter, I was sleeping in my room alone. I rolled over in the bed and saw that across the room, there was a figure. I was horrified. I remembered that my brother wasn't there. The bed was made, and again, we never slept there together. The sheets were scrunched and lifted, like a figure was under them. I silently got up and went to my mom's room, and she was reluctant, but she let me sleep with her. When we went to check, the sheets were made and nobody was there. It took some bit of time to tell her the story, enough time that someone could have made the bed and run, I guess. I'm not sure if it was some deranged weirdo or a mimic or a copy or what, but I'm so glad I noticed it because if it was the first one, I don't know what would have happened if I hadn't rolled over. My boyfriend of two years and I go to the same college. We both take night classes and live in an apartment complex across the street from campus. Neither of us are paranormal enthusiasts, no Ouija boards, etc. And we're also agnostic. So class is from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. We walk over together, but usually I walk back on my own unless I run into him coming back from the lecture building. This time, I was walking alone. It's about a 10 minute walk to the apartment. I could see the light was on as I approached the building, and I thought he had gotten home first. I thought that was a little strange, since I hadn't seen him walking in front of me, but I figured his class had let out early. For some reason, I stopped to look in the window before I went in. I could see what looked like him sitting on the couch, but something was weird. He was sitting very stiffly, with his shoulders kind of lifted, and staring out the window. He, or it, must have seen me, because he gave me a very hateful scowl, got up, and walked to the back room, down the hallway, and out of sight. When he stood up, he kind of swayed, like he was drunk. This was bad, because my boyfriend is two years sober, also, he has never scowled at me like that, for no reason. I went inside, calling out to him, but I got no response. I went to the back room, and nobody was there. I searched that whole apartment, which didn't take long because there's only two bedrooms, and only so many places a grown man could hide. The only way that this thing could have gotten out other than the door would be to take the screen out of one of the back windows and climb out. But we had to replace one of the screens last year, and it was difficult to remove and put back in. You needed to remove four screws. It was an old building. It would have only had seconds to do this entire process. My boyfriend got back at around 10.30, and I told him what happened. He's a lot closer to an atheist than I am, and managed to convince me in the moment that it wasn't real but I'm not so sure really. Nothing else has been weird since, and this happened a week ago, but it keeps bothering me. I barely remember this story but my brother, who is four years older than me, remembers it vividly. My dad was on dialysis and went through eight hour cycles. One night, my brother and I are in the computer room playing games at like 2 a.m. Suddenly, from around the corner, my dad appears. He starts being mischievous and trying to scare us. My dad was never a jokester. Plus, he was supposed to be on his dialysis machine 
My brother was so unnerved, he said, Dad, what are you doing off your machine? My dad replied, Oh, it's fine. The facial expressions and manner of speaking prompted my brother right then and there to ask, Are you a ghost? To which my dad replied, laughing, No, of course not. Then started heading up the dark stairs. My brother watched as my dad climbed the stairs and decided to follow him. When he reached the bedroom door that my dad turned into, he saw my real father was in there fast asleep and was already hooked up to his dialysis machine, which was running properly. Not only was my father never one to kid around, he was also very sick at this time with kidney failure and cancer. To scare us in the computer room, he would have had to go out of his way to literally come from the dark shadows of the dining room, which meant going down the stairs and looping around. My brother knew something was up right away, and he won't ever forget this story. When I was at art school in 1992, I was preparing for assessments. So I spent three days before the deadline awake and preparing everything at the last minute, which is my preferred style of doing things. I knew the house in which I lived then was haunted and I hadn't seen anything manifest as such. But many times when I walked past the back door, it would shake as though the handle was being pulled on from outside. When there was no one there, and no rational reason for this to occur at all. That part of the house had a concrete slab as a floor, so the weight of a person crossing it had zero effect on the structure of the back room, so it couldn't cause the door to react in that way. One night, as I was walking past that door, I looked through the kitchen window into the kitchen, and I saw a figure sitting in the middle of the wall, as if defying gravity. After a second, I realized that the person I was looking at was actually me, wearing a blue two-piece suit with a short, neat haircut, grinning maniacally and looking into my eyes with a strange knowing. As I said, I knew the place already to be haunted, and so, when I saw this figure, I was mentally prepared for the door to shake as I passed it. So far, I was not shaken by the sight of this being, as I might have had I not already been experiencing so many spooky things. Having a general interest in the paranormal, I had also researched ghosts, and I knew what a doppelganger was, or a double walker, one that imitates a living being. I was forearmed with this knowledge, and I knew that traditionally, a doppelganger is believed to kill those to whom it appears over time through the excitation of a fear within them that gradually weakens its victim through repeated appearances, all of which somehow grant the entity an increasingly proportionate greater strength. And so I deliberately ignored it as much as possible and did not stop or react to it at all. Quickly returning to my room upstairs to continue my work, which at that time I was thoroughly obsessed with completing, I tried not to think anything else of it. The fact that I had so much work to do at that time also helped me to ignore this vision, but I kept it in mind as a memorable event to later consider when I would have more time to spare, and I forgot about it for the time being. Inevitably, I handed in my work for assessment and entered into the first weeks of my summer holiday. One day, I took acid and went back to the house and lay on my bed and tried astral traveling to the very edge of the cosmos, to the point where matter expands into the void which exists outside of matter. I had the feeling that I actually got there and was instantly repelled back into my body, but I actually probably ended up just falling to sleep and waking up again, interpreting that as having achieved my goal. A little while later, my lovely, caring mother asked if I would like to obtain some help trying to find a job for the summer. As she was aware, I was a poverty-stricken, dope-smoking art school student living on a small government grant, and she thought I probably needed her help, 
which was very nice of her. She drove me to the city and we looked through opportunity shops to look for some cheap but nice business-like clothes appropriate for job hunting. Then she paid for me to have my hair cut. At the end of our expedition that day, she dropped me off at home and I walked in, still wearing the $15 suit that she'd bought for me. Out of vain curiosity, I hurried to the downstairs bathroom mirror to check out my new haircut. Looking at myself in the mirror, it was then that I remembered and realized that with my hair cut short like that, and in that suit, which was a blue two-piece pinstripe, I looked identical to what I had seen sitting in the middle of the kitchen wall that night, just weeks earlier. This happened when I was in college. I had just gotten to school that morning, pretty normal day. Students were wandering around and chatting with one another. When I was nearing our building, I recognized a classmate from one of my subjects. We're not that close, but we greet each other. When our eyes met, I smiled at her. She didn't smile back. I thought that was really weird because she's a really bubbly girl. She was just standing across from the building. There were quite a few students around her too. I can still remember that she was wearing a yellow blouse and was holding something in her hands. She was literally just staring at me, poker face, while I proceeded to go inside the building. That's when it got weirder. Just as I rounded the corner, I saw her, but in different clothes and with a much happier attitude. I told her right away that I had just seen her outside, but she just laughed it off. She said that she had never been there. I knew she didn't have a twin sister. It was so weird, and I got really confused. I didn't know what I had experienced, or who or what I had seen, so I just headed to my classroom without telling anyone else about it. About four years ago, we had to live with my mom's friend for a while. The day we came to her house, we were moving things in and I went out to get some of the last things in the car. When I went outside, sitting in the car, clutching the steering wheel, was my mom's friend, staring at me, wearing a red dress with her hair down. I knew it wasn't her because I had just seen her 10 seconds earlier in the house with her hair up in a bun and she was wearing a light pink sweater with white pants. I ran back inside and found my mom and her friend talking in the kitchen. I told them what I had seen. We looked out of the window of the living room where the car could be seen from and nobody was there. None of us left the house for the rest of the night. We finished getting the stuff out of the car the next day. That was not the last paranormal thing that happened to us in that house. I was a CNA working third shift at an end of life senior care facility in Upper Michigan, near Lake Huron. The hours were usually quiet, as everybody was in bed or heading there, and meals were over. The overnight job entailed lots of cleaning, mopping, dusting, and prepping for breakfast at 8 a.m., as well as answering night calls or being on death watch every 15 minutes. Those were the worst, as you knew death was soon. One resident was close, but would linger for days, the doctor said. People said and did the oddest things at those last gasps, too. Needless to say, it was not an easy job, but the pace sucked equally as well. Small town blues for job prospects. Watching other people's family members die is not for the faint of heart. It's a constant reminder of life's worst parts and the limited time we've been given. 
One of my favorite co-workers with a great upbeat attitude, Val and I, shared this night shift together. We knew our preferred tasks and set about them, happily chatting to each other in the dining room, getting it ready for breakfast. Val needed to use one of the nearby employee toilets for an extended stay, so I proceeded to mop the opposite hallway facing the nurse's station and bathroom where Val was. I mop backwards, pulling rather than pushing so I don't leave footprints. So naturally, I don't see where the carpet begins. I need to dip my mop to turn my direction until my shoe heel hits the edge. I can mindlessly do this while looking around the hallway. I was in the process of dipping and squishing my mop when a form caught my eye in the hallway arched entrance to the doors leading to both the nurse's station and the opposite bathroom where Val was. I thought it was her returning back to the floor refreshed and unburdened of previous meals, but no. What I saw gave me this great open-mouthed silent scream pause peeking and stretching out across part of the hallway ceiling, maybe 15 feet long into the main, taller hallway where I stood frozen, was a dark human shadow form, all smoky and eyeless. It stayed there for maybe two to four seconds, and then it shot back into the hallway. I stood there scared silent and immobile as I heard the bathroom door open. Val screamed and then slammed the door again, I heard her call my name through the closed door and slowly crept to the hallway to see nothing there but the doors to the nurse's station, the bathroom, and now the break room across from the utility closet where the cleaning supplies lived. The hallway was clear. I called Val's name from outside the door, knocking too. She asked, squeaking, is it gone? I responded quietly, yes, what did you see? Because I saw something. Get out here now. Don't leave me alone with that. Val came out and grabbed me in a hug so hard I knew she was scared. Val shook, saying that she had opened the bathroom door and should have seen the nurse's station through the open door and part of the hallway. But what she saw blocked the door and most of the wall. It was huge. It filled the wall and was smoke black. She didn't see a top or face shaved to it but it blocked her exit like a smoky haze right against the door and leaking in. So she slammed the door fast and screamed my name. We worked side by side for the rest of our shift, never leaving each other's sight until it was time to leave. The morning shift supervisor wondered why we both clocked out and then bolted in a huge hurry that day. Val told her about it later in a text message, saying that she was taking a day off. I'm not sure if it was a reaper we saw, but right after we clocked out, a resident died. Growing up, one of my favorite things to do was to sit down with my grandma and listen to all of her stories. Happy stories, sad stories, and everything in between. As a kid, my grandma was the best storyteller ever, and she would always be open with me. My favorites were her scary stories, and every one of these stories that she would tell me were true. My family has experienced a lot with the paranormal in the past, and this story is just one of many that makes me believe and respect the supernatural and what's beyond. During one summer, my aunt and uncle in Alabama were planning to make the trip to Michigan and spend some time with us and our other family members up here for a few days. They were planning on driving and wouldn't get in until very late in the night. They were planning on staying with my grandma and grandpa. My grandma was such a sweet and genuine lady who felt that it was her duty to take care of everybody in the family and make sure they were safe at all times and were doing okay. She would normally stay up very late watching her TV shows, so waiting for my aunt and uncle to arrive wasn't a big deal for her. As the night went on, my grandma heard my aunt and uncle at her side door, talking and using their key to get into the house. All of my aunts and uncles and my mom have the key to my grandparents' home, 
because no matter what you need, my grandparents' home is always open to family. So my grandma went ahead and pretended to be asleep and let my aunt and uncle get settled in and then surprised them afterwards. But as my aunt and uncle approached the living room to go upstairs to their guest room, something inside my grandma's head told her not to open her eyes. Not because she would ruin the surprise, but because there was something there that she shouldn't see. After a couple of minutes, my grandma got up from the couch, and that's when she heard my aunt and uncle's footsteps and my aunt's laughter upstairs. So she just decided to go to bed. In the morning, my grandma gets up and begins to prepare breakfast. While she's doing that, she hears and then sees my aunt and uncle arriving through the side door with their luggage. Confused, my grandma asked them if they had stepped out after coming by the house last night. My uncle answered, no. And he told her that they just ended up getting a room at a local hotel since it was late and they didn't want to disturb my grandparents. She then remembered that when she was pretending to be asleep to surprise them, something told her not to open her eyes. My grandma knew then what it could have been and was happy that something inside her told her not to look. Until this day, we still bring up this story and wonder what it could have been that made it seem like my aunt and uncle had arrived that night and were in the house. My grandma has passed, but her stories are always so comforting to bring up and talk about because we know she's still here, watching over and taking care of us. This is an experience that I had almost an entire year ago. My mother is a traveling nurse and she often gets assignments in Alaska and other less populated states. So I usually travel three to four times a year to go see her. This was my first time going to see her in Alaska. She was staying in Fairbanks for three months. While she was at work, I would take her rental car and explore Fairbanks and the neighboring areas and towns. Side note, Alaska is very sparsely populated and towns of just a thousand or more are considered somewhat large. One particular day, I decided to make the long day trip to Denali State Park via Alaska Highway 3, or Parks Highway as it is often called. It's a long, windy stretch of road connecting Fairbanks to the outskirts of Anchorage, Alaska's largest city. Along the highway from Fairbanks to Denali State Park, you pass through three to four towns, the largest of those being Nanana, which only has a population of 365. Once you get out of Fairbanks, it gets really lonely. I remember driving 40 to 50 miles without passing another car you can kind of get mesmerized by the beauty of the landscape and the snowy, icy mountains surrounding you and forget that you're in the middle of nowhere. Quality phone signal is few and far between when you're driving through this area. It was a weekday and off-tourist season in Alaska, so most of the vehicles I passed were log trucks or semis and the occasional regular motorist. It was early April, and there was still heavy-packed snow on the sides of the roads and in the forest and valley, but the roads were completely clear. From Fairbanks to Denali National Park, it's a four to five hour drive, depending on road conditions. My main goal was to see Mount McKinley, the tallest mountain in North America. I hadn't really researched much of how to see it, and it was harder to see it in April than the summer months. There's a road that leads into the National Park, where you can see a view of Mount McKinley, but I had passed it not knowing whether the road conditions were good. I had looked on Google Maps, and it showed that there was something like a scenic view or overlook that you see on American interstates sometimes. I assumed that you may be able to see Mount McKinley from there. If you go on Google Maps, it is across from Byers Lake Campground. The campground appeared to be closed or desolate, but there were no gates or anything stopping me from entering the area. It was at this point that I completely lost cell reception, and the GPS on my phone wasn't working. 
As I pulled into the campground area, there was probably 16 to 24 inches of snow on some of the roads there. Some of the roads had been plowed, so I assumed that there had to be people visiting, but there wasn't a single car or person in sight. There are a bunch of winding roads that almost resemble a maze and lead to dead ends at this campground. Now, for the entire four plus hours I had been driving, not once did I have any uneasy or bad feelings. When I'm usually in desolate areas, especially the desert, I have really bad vibes. But it wasn't like this in Alaska for some reason. That changed about 30 seconds into entering the campground area. Maybe it was the fact that I was turning into some abandoned campground, or the fact that I completely lost cell reception, but something just didn't sit right with me. Nevertheless, I was determined to see Mount McKinley, and I was trying to focus on that and find a good place to take some cool pictures. I drove down these winding roads and hit dead ends, and then suddenly it started to get really cloudy. I was getting more frustrated at not finding an area to take some pictures. And then, I realized that I was lost. It's not far at all from the main highway, but nonetheless, I was lost. I started to get really confused on where exactly I was, and my GPS wasn't working. I started to panic a little. I made my way down this dirt road to the lake, and there was a large opening. My bad feelings went away temporarily, because the view was beautiful. The lake was completely frozen, and behind it in the background was a small snowy mountain. The scene was just something straight out of a National Geographic magazine, so I stepped out to take some pictures. I stood there for a few minutes, just admiring the beauty of the Alaskan wilderness, and I was looking at my pictures to see if they were any good, when I heard this scream in the distance. It was a close scream, but yet it sounded muffled, almost like something was able to control the volume of their voice to make it seem far away, when in reality it was close. My heart started racing as I looked around to try to figure out what it was. Everything in my body was telling me to book it for the car and find a way out, but I just stood there, confused and kind of scared. I felt like I was being watched and all the hairs stood up on my arm. I was wondering if it was a bobcat or a mountain lion, because they are often mistaken for women screaming. I'm aware of this. I looked out on the far side of the lake, and I see this person wearing a light orange jacket and jeans. They had a green beanie on their head. I waved at them, and they waved back immediately. At first I was super relieved, there was somebody else out here with me. But then, this overwhelming feeling of dread and terror entered my body. I was wearing a light orange jacket, jeans, and a green beanie. The person had brown skin like me. I'm half Filipino and half white. I couldn't make out facial features, but I felt like I could see the black hair sticking out from under their beanie, which is the color of my hair. I just stood there for a couple of seconds, frozen in shock and fear. I raised my arm, and the person raised theirs. I waved with my other hand, and they did. I noped right out of there. I hightailed it up to the hill to my car, and basically did a donut in the snow, spinning my tires trying to get out of there. I started panicking, and I was trying to find the exit. I saw a sign that was almost completely covered to the top in snow, but it had an arrow pointing to the left and that was good enough for me. I came out to the first part of the campground. It was a bathroom facility and office and had a veteran's memorial statue. There was this white owl just perched on top of it staring at me, with its head just sideways like bending over. I found the way out and sped the entire way back to Fairbanks checking my rearview mirror every 10 seconds. I really don't know what to make of the situation. As I entered civilization, I calmed back down, and I didn't really have any other weird experiences in Alaska or anywhere else since then. I've considered the thought of it being a skinwalker, 
or an aswang, which is a Filipino shapeshifter in folklore. One of my friends said I had probably survived a 411 case, which wouldn't be surprising to me because there have been many of those in Alaska. I consider myself neutral on the topic of the paranormal. I think most encounters could probably be explained logically, whether it be uncommon occurrences, mental health disorders, or something of the sort. But I had an experience as a child that has opened me to the idea that there are paranormal events that are real. I remember it vividly because the event shook me up so much. It's not that intense of an experience, but it was very real, and I remember it clearly despite it happening well over a decade ago. I was sleeping in my room and I awoke to find a figure in my door. My room had a street light right outside the window and the curtains didn't block out all the light. It was lit enough to clearly see the silhouette of someone in my doorway, but not lit enough to see the details. I figured it was my mom. At least the silhouette looked like her. Being confused as to why she would just be standing there, I called out to her. There was no response. But before I could call out again, the figure turned and started to walk down the hall. Again, it's light enough for me to see that a figure is turning and walking naturally down the hall, just not enough to see details of clothing, face, skin, etc. I got up and ran after her. No reason for it, probably, just a groggy, panicky reaction. As I reached the figure in the hallway, I went to put my hands on its shoulders, and it vanished like literally vanished before my eyes. I only froze for about a second before I bolted to my mom's room and slept in her bed with her the rest of the night. We've gone over the event. A common explanation is that I was dreaming, but I remember clearly being in the hallway, lucid as everything happened. I also did wake up in my mom's bed, and she confirmed that she remembers me entering, panicked. My mom has a ton of stories that give me goosebumps and are crazy scary. In one of her recurring nightmares, she has a doppelganger that haunts her, and I'm wondering if that's who I saw. When I was a kid, there was this kid who looked exactly like me not just witnessed by me, but by my grandmother as well. My first sighting of her was when I was little and I was sitting in the car, just staring out the window. I looked up and thought I saw my reflection, so I just shrugged back down in my seat. But then I looked down and noticed that she was wearing a different shirt than I was. My grandmother also told me that she spotted a girl that looks just like me when she's been out. And just as she's about to call my name, she notices that the woman with the girl doesn't look anything like my mom. This didn't happen once I got a little older, but it always gave me the creeps. Maybe I have a doppelganger or something like that. Any thoughts as to what this was or has this happened to anybody else? My house was being renovated to be sold, and in the meantime, my mother rented a house nearby my high school. The house was a white weatherboard house, had terrible carpet, seemed to always have slugs, and just felt old. I'm not certain if the house was haunted, but I had some experiences that I didn't otherwise experience prior moving into this rental. Before proceeding, I should mention that I do sporadically experience sleep paralysis and I have slept walked once that I know of. But for now, I want to tell you about the doppelganger at the rental. One evening, I was in the bathroom straightening my hair. I left the bathroom to make my way down the hallway to the lounge room. Between the lounge room and the bathroom is a kitchen on the right hand side. When I passed the kitchen, I saw my sister, about 10 years old, standing just behind the boundary of where the kitchen meets the hallway. 
She was standing in the dark and looked a bit off color, almost gray. And her face wasn't even visible, even though she was standing immediately in front of me. I asked her what she was doing just standing in the dark. I got no response, even after calling out her name. I didn't think much of it, but I do recall seeing her blue dress as extra vibrant, and the kitchen as impossibly dark. I shrugged my shoulders and thought it was weird, and walked down the hall into the lounge room. As I was walking into the brightly lit lounge room, my sister was on the couch, jumping up and down. It took me a whole five seconds to realize what just happened. I was not talking to my sister in the kitchen. There's no way that my sister was just in the kitchen, ran past me down the hall without me seeing her in ten seconds, and then proceeded to jump on the couch all before I entered the room. I was in shock, but I asked my sister how she got to the couch so quickly. She seemed genuinely confused, and said she'd been on the couch the whole time. The other experience was the girl by the door. This experience may possibly have been sleep paralysis. I'm not certain why, but I was sleeping next to my mom this evening, on the left-hand side. I guess I always felt uneasy in the rental. Anyway, on this evening I was fast asleep, and I had an unusual dream. In the dream, the bedroom door was open, and standing in the dark of the hallway was a girl with dark shoulder-length hair and a white dress. The girl met my gaze and stared at me with an expressionless face. She took a step toward the bedroom door, and as she took a step, ended back where she started. Imagine a scene replaying of a person walking toward you, but it's like they're on a treadmill. That scene just starts over and keeps replaying but on every single replay, the person gets closer. It's like the looped video gets closer to you. I was paralyzed with fear and I could only watch as each time she took a step, she would end up back where she started, yet with each step, she got closer to the bedroom. This continued until she was in the room and then her movement changed. She started to move toward me and she appeared to be darting back and forth, frantically inching closer. Her expression changed with her eyes wide, and she stood beside me. She glared at me and abruptly grabbed me. That's when I woke up. It had been a dream. I looked over to the bedroom door in relief. It was closed. But not too soon after, fully awake this time, the door opens and the girl is there again. There in the hallway. She immediately starts darting back and forward and lunges at me. I wake up again? I look at the door and this time she's in the room already and darts straight toward me and lunges at me again. I wake up yet again and straight away she darts and lunges. This happens about six times, each time moving closer, each time being more frantic and aggressive. The last time I finally woke up for real and I sat up in the position as if I was grabbed and woke up during the attack. My breathing was heavy and my mom, who woke up, said that I was having a nightmare. These two experiences make me believe that the rental had something freaky going on. And, possibly, the girl by the door and the doppelganger are the same entity. Anyone else experienced something similar to that? Do we think it's sleep paralysis? I reckon the dream of the girl was, but the doppelganger is harder to rationalize. This happened to my fiancé, but I was in the other room, and I heard the events unfold. So, he was sleeping on the couch. I was sleeping in our bed off the living room. He passed out out there, so I turned off the lights and let him be. At around 2 to 4 a.m., somewhere in there, I heard him say, What are you doing? What did you say? And then a bang. He was wide awake and claimed that I walked into the living room, across the kitchen, in the nude, and then I walked back across, and I was mumbling something weird. He got up to push me a little to see if I was sleepwalking, and that's when I disappeared, and he fell into the table, which was the bang I heard. I was in my bed the entire time, and I didn't hear anything except for him falling. Also, I was not in the nude. 
Does anyone know what that could be? I thought maybe he was dreaming, but I heard him talking coherently and then get up and fall, and he claims he was wide awake. I'm definitely freaked out, so if anyone has any answers, let me know. This experience occurred pretty recently, so my memory is very clear in regards to detail. This past year was my senior year of college, and I was thrilled to be living with an alumni of my sorority, with whom I'm very close. We'll call her Abby. Abby and I weren't actually supposed to live in the apartment we ended up in. We were originally going to be living in a townhouse with two other girls, but they started so much drama a month before we were supposed to move in that we had to contact our landlord to find a different place within their company to live. Thankfully, we found a two-bedroom, one-bathroom basement apartment in a quiet area off campus. The first month was fine and without incident. But as the days went by, some strange things began to happen in the apartment. One morning, Abby woke up to a kitchen cabinet open. She wasn't too concerned about that and figured that I had just forgotten to shut it the night before. The next morning, a different cabinet was open and once again she shrugged it off. However, I went home one weekend, and she woke up to find every cabinet in the kitchen wide open and the sink running. Needless to say, Abby was scared and spent the night at her boyfriend's. Two weeks later, we were watching TV and heard the bathroom door close. I tried to calm Abby down by saying that the fan we kept in that bathroom probably blew it closed. However, when we went to bed, we thought we could hear someone walking around in our living room. There's no way someone broke into our apartment and hid the entire day, only to come out at night to screw with us. I was home the whole day, and Abby was home from 11 in the morning on. That incident took place shortly before Christmas break, and all was calm in the apartment, until February. Abby had gone home for the weekend, and I was home alone relaxing on the couch and doing homework. It was pretty late at night, so I turned on the television for background noise and curled up on the couch to sleep. I woke up at 2.32 in the morning to see Abby walking through the front door, smiling but not saying anything. I blinked, still groggy from sleep, and I asked her if she was okay. She just looked at me and proceeded to take off her shoes and walk into the kitchen. Something about her just didn't seem right. Like this girl looked like Abby and walked like her, but it also clearly wasn't her. I asked her again if she was okay because it was so early in the morning for her to be coming home. Abby looked at me, smiled, and began washing something in the sink. Something inside me felt a profound sense of dread, like I was in actual danger and I needed to get away as fast as possible. I went to my room and locked my door. My roommate followed me, because I heard someone tapping their finger against the door. One, two, three, four, five times. It wouldn't stop. I didn't say another word, because it felt like if I did acknowledge her, it gave her more strength. I know that doesn't make a lot of logical sense, but that was my instinct. I curled up beneath my blankets and stared at my bedroom door, almost waiting for her to kick it in. My eyes felt heavy, and the incessant tapping was almost like a metronome enticing me to sleep. As I drifted back to sleep, the tap seemed to slow down to a trickle. The morning after, I was groggy and exhausted. It felt like I had taken 20 Advil PM, but I remembered everything that happened the night before. Cautiously, I left my room and saw that Abby's bed had not been disturbed or slept in. I went to the living room and her shoes and purse weren't there. A cold feeling crept into my spine as I sent her a text, asking if she'd come home that night. She responded that no, she hadn't and wouldn't be for another two days. But I checked the sink and the bowl that Abby had been washing 
had been cleaned and put away. I firmly believe that I was not dreaming or hallucinating, and I know that this wasn't some elaborate prank by Abby, because she would never do something like that. I firmly believe that something took the shape of Abby that night, and that its intentions were not good. There were a few other experiences in that apartment, but nothing so dramatic as what I went through that night. I'm sure it's not as scary as some other people's stories, but for me, in the moment, it definitely was. This really happened, and it's one of the most unnerving things I've ever experienced. So, it was the 4th of July, and my brother and I were setting off fireworks in the woods behind our house. We were passing back and forth an aim and flame cigarette lighter, and lighting firecrackers and other small fireworks. It was around 2 in the morning, so technically the 5th of July. I left to get something to drink, and left my brother there, lighting the fireworks as usual. I get back around 10 minutes later, and he asks me for the lighter. I told him that I didn't have it. I'd left it with him. And he was actively lighting firecrackers as I left. He says, yeah, I know, but I just gave it to you a couple minutes ago. Where is it? I know, my brother. This isn't something he would lie about. We've talked about this many times over the years, and his story has never changed. The moon was bright that night. Bright enough to see by. He says he saw me, in my same outfit, same face, same hair, and everything. Come out, say nothing, and put my hand out. My brother assumed I was waiting on the lighter, so he gave me the lighter, and whatever it actually was walked away, never speaking a word. These woods were privately owned by my family, far out in rural Texas. Nobody else was out there, and if they were, it still doesn't explain how they looked identical to me. We continued setting off firecrackers until about four in the morning, having to use a short cigarette lighter because that thing stole the aim and flame. We never did find it either. A few years ago, when I was still married to my ex-wife, I saw my own doppelganger. My ex-wife was disrobing one night, and as soon as she got everything off and approached the bed, behind her was me, in shadow form, with a wide-eyed, surprised look, looking back at myself. Now, I've seen ghosts and UFOs, and I don't have any reservations about the paranormal, I'm usually inclined to believe the unexplainable, or at least have an open mind, but this one genuinely freaked me out. It was like me in the darkest tint brightness calibration before a video game. Was I scared? I mean, not enough to not continue with what we were doing that night, but I was pretty young and naive at the time. I've heard that it may mean death for the witness or something. Obviously that never happened, yet. But a rocky divorce and zero friends later, I can confirm a shitload of bad luck. Even got in an unwanted fistfight today. Attacked, even. Things are always happening to me ever since then. I guess I'm asking if anyone has any additional information on this. I can't find much, but closure would be nice. So, this really only started happening this morning. At around 6 a.m., I got out of bed to get ready for work. While I was in the bathroom getting ready, my boyfriend was still in bed. Suddenly, I heard him, and it sounded like he was afraid of something in the bedroom. I walked back into the bedroom to see if he was okay. When I asked him what was wrong, he seemed pretty shaken up. After a few seconds, I was able to get him to explain what had happened. 
When he was just starting to wake up, he stated that he saw the spirit of an older lady that seemed to be cussing him out for no apparent reason. After he told her to go away, she did. But not long after this, while he was half asleep, he thought that I was laying on the bedroom floor and reaching up to run my hand across his chest. As he started to wake up though, he started to realize something about it was really off. He said that she was laying way too far away to realistically reach up and touch him at all. I mean, her arm would have had to have been like five feet long. And with that, he said that her features seemed kind of blurry. She also had a wide-eyed, emotionless stare, kind of uncanny valley-esque. He described it as if somebody had built an animatronic version of me. Later on in the day, after I got home from work, I got up from the edge of our bed to open the bedroom door for the cat. According to my boyfriend, my doppelganger showed up again, but this time she was standing at the foot of our bed and directly staring in the direction of actual me over by the bedroom door. From what we understand, whatever is trying to copy me is definitely trying to fool my boyfriend into a false sense of security. The bad thing though is that we're also pretty sure this is some kind of hostile presence. If anybody has any advice or information on what this may or may not be, especially if you know how to deal with it, we'd love to know. Any help or advice on this is something that would be very welcome. My coworker and I are curious, and a little afraid to be honest, about why we've been seeing doppelgangers of all of our fellow coworkers. I've seen every single one of my fellow night shift coworkers when they shouldn't have been there and weren't there, except for one. In fact, she's the only person that neither of us have seen a duplicate of. Both of us have made eye contact with at least one of the copies. They're around all the time. It's almost a daily occurrence at this point, and we just don't know what to do, what they could be, why we're seeing them, and what they might mean. If you have any information, please let us know. I have a doppelganger that's been following me for a while. The first story was when I was just about seven or eight. It was a summer afternoon and my friends and I went inside our house to drink water and use the restroom. The restroom on the first floor is right beside the stairs. So when I got out, I saw my friends staring up and they seemed really surprised when I came out of the restroom. When I asked them why, they told me that I had run upstairs and that they were waiting for me to come down. I told them it must have been my grandma they saw, but they both insisted that it was me. I was so young that it was trivial for me and I just urged them to continue our game outside. In the same house, I was a college student this time. It's a weekend and I just woke up and felt a call of nature. My room was beside the hallway leading to our second floor bathroom. So I went in there turned the corner, and I saw our maid cleaning. I excused myself as the hallway isn't big enough, and she let me pass. I then went to the restroom, and two minutes later our maid knocked and asked if I was still in there. I said yes, and she left. I was curious, and right afterwards I asked her about it. She was hesitant at first, but she told me anyway. She said she was waiting for me to wake up so she could clean my room. When I passed by her, she thought it was her chance and went straight into my room. When she entered, I was standing there, my back facing her, and she got creeped out when I was about to face her and she bolted out of the room. That's why she went back to the restroom to see if I was still there. The third story happened when I had just moved into a new house, sorting out where things should go. I think it was our second day there. We just finished breakfast and I volunteered to wash the dishes. It was just my mom and I that time. My mom then approached me and asked, were you here the whole time? I said, 
Yeah, I've been washing dishes and organizing utensils in the kitchen. She said, then who helped me carry the mattress to our room? She had a very skittish smile on her face and was obviously scared. She swore that it was me who had carried it with her. But obviously, that was impossible. Finally, I've been sharing this story where I see fit and I'll tell it here too. I moved into a new house with a friend. It's just a small one-bedroom gated apartment. I was inside the room surfing the net and my roommate was in the living room watching K-drama. I heard the door open and close and the gate as well. After a few minutes, I heard the gate open and it was my roomie's boyfriend. He asked her where I was and my roommate told him that I had gone to my boyfriend's house. I heard them talking and I shouted, hey, I'm here. They both ran to the room and my roommate had this bewildered look on her face. I asked her what happened and she said, you passed by me and told me that you were staying at your boyfriend's. And I looked at you and nodded and you left. I told her that I heard the door and the gate close a while ago and she said it must have been that, but obviously I hadn't left or spoken to her. Her boyfriend stayed over that night as we were both pretty scared that the doppelganger would come back. This was six years ago, when I was in primary school. It was after lunch, and my friend and I were walking up the stairs to our classroom on the third floor. On the first staircase, we saw one of the two gym teachers coming down and greeted him. As we got to the second floor and up the staircase, I had a fleeting thought. Wouldn't it be weird if we suddenly saw him walking down again? But then, he actually did come down the stairs. My friend and I were so shocked, we just stood there gaping at him as he looked at some papers while walking down. He didn't really acknowledge us or seem to notice us staring at him. We were frozen until he disappeared under the stairs, and that's when I snapped out of it and peered down. I couldn't see him, but he might have just walked closer to the wall or in the middle of the stairs. I had half a mind to run after him, but I've always thought it best to not interfere with the supernatural. I had heard of doppelgangers before. I was creeped the hell out anyway. So we ran to our class, still trying to process it all, while repeatedly asking each other, did you see that? They were completely identical, except that one had papers with him. We debated him having a twin, but really that was just silly. We'd been at that school for five years and we never heard about that. Plus, they were wearing the exact same outfit and the school only had three gym teachers. If they were, by some almost non-existent chance, actual twins, we would have heard of the gossip, or they would have walked together instead of one floor apart. We tried debating if he ran through the hallway after we saw him on the first staircase, but even if he was a gym teacher, there's no possible way, and there's no reason to go past us, run down a hallway and up two staircases, and then down the hall to meet us again just to freak somebody out. Maybe he did run up again to get the papers, but the time between meeting was at the very most 20 seconds. There was just no way. I haven't heard of him after graduation because we all drifted away, but I don't think anything happened to him. It was just weird and one of my childhood memories that I think back on with curiosity. Another time close to that, we had an extra class day on Saturday. I took the morning off because of family business, but when I came to class, my classmates asked me where I'd gone. I told them that I'd never been there, that I took the morning off, but all of them said they had seen me at class that morning. Apparently, I even went to the bathroom with the class's vice rep. I immediately had a thought and asked her if I was pulling my lips in my mouth. I had this weird habit of pulling my lip inside in the bathroom because I didn't want to get germs stuck to my lips and then lick them up. I know, it's weird. Anyway, she said no. She was genuine and I could see the confusion on her face, like what was that question for? She was a really serious girl and wouldn't participate in a prank for someone she wasn't close to, if at all. In fact, the whole class couldn't be in on it because that would be a really random prank. 
And even if it was, no one would ever really do anything like that. They just weren't that type. There were many divided groups in the class, so the chances of them all working together is zero. Especially against me, who only hung out with two kids and almost never interacted with anybody. So, weird? If anyone has any encounters with doppelgangers, I'd love to hear about it. I'm not entirely sure if it was a doppelganger, but I really can't think of what else it would be. I've had a couple of experience with doppelgangers. The first was when I was about 19. I suddenly woke up from my sleep and immediately had a frightened feeling. I had a wardrobe in front of my bed at the time with a full-length mirror on it. In the mirror, I can see my bed and the windows behind it. In the window behind me, I saw what appeared to be my mom, but she had a seriously twisted look on her face an expression that was creepy and that I've never seen on her before. She was staring at me in the mirror, and for a couple of minutes, all I could do was stare back at her in fear. I thought perhaps I had sleep paralysis, as I have experienced that my whole life, but it turned out that I could move, so I sat up fast and looked out the window, but nobody was there. I looked back into the mirror, and she was gone. It would have been impossible for her to go anywhere, as my room was on the second story, and the window looked out to my balcony, which is only accessible through my room. It's also unlikely that she was able to get onto the balcony through the house. She would have had to come through my room and open the incredibly hard to open, very noisy, banging balcony door that was behind my bed, right by my head. I got out of bed and went to check on my mom who was fast asleep in her bed and clearly had not been through my bedroom or jumped off the second story balcony to go through the front door, up the stairs and back to her room in a matter of a minute or so. I turned all the lights on and I stayed up for the rest of the night. The second time was a few weeks ago. At first, all was fine. I was in bed, woken up in the night and rolled over to hug my boyfriend. Immediately, I felt like it wasn't him. But I didn't want to believe that, and I just wanted to feel comforted. He was making weird noises, and I told him to stop being weird. He then spoke in a voice that was not his. I looked up at him, and he had the same twisted look on his face that my mother's had had. It was even creepier to see it up close. I said, You're not my boyfriend. But I was too scared to move. He tried to convince me for a bit, and I kept asking, Who are you? I got out of bed, terrified, and I just kept demanding, Who are you? You're not him. He then got up and started throwing and dragging me around the room while I kept crying, You're not my boyfriend. He managed to drag me out to the hallway, with many moments of pulling and fighting away and him throwing and dragging me. He was a lot stronger than my boyfriend was, and he was laughing, seemed disturbingly amused by all of this. I suddenly jolt and I am in bed sitting up with my heart racing. I thought, thank god, hopefully it was just a dream. But it felt so real, and I was conscious and in control of my actions the entire time, unlike even the most lucid of dreams. Then I thought sleep paralysis, but then how could I move and make decisions? After searching for a phenomenon like this, I've seen a little bit about astral projection. Could that be the case? I thought I would check to see if any of the details in the house were different to my potential dream, but they were the same, including the bumped frame on the wall that was crooked that I had not noticed the day before. I really hope it was just an incredibly vivid dream, but having had experienced sleep paralysis all my life, I'm pretty good at deciphering what is an awake hallucination or sleep paralysis and what's a dream, and it definitely felt like the former. Has anyone experienced something similar or encountered doppelgangers like this before? Does anybody know what this weird dreaming but feeling absolutely awake and lucid thing is? Any feedback is appreciated. It still haunts me.
I think my son has a double. The first time this happened was when he was three. My older sister was staying in my apartment and watching TV in her room when my son walked in. She asked him if he wanted to watch cartoons and put some on for him. He just sat quietly at the end of her bed while she tried to get his attention. Then she hears him laugh in the other room with me. When she looks to the bedroom door, the copy of my son disappeared. When she told me this, I honestly assumed that she was high and just imagined it. The second time, a friend was visiting from the UK. They got up at night to use the restroom and saw my son's door was wide open, lights on, and he was sitting at his little table with a friend. He told me about this in the morning and thought it was kind of weird since it had been three o'clock in the morning. My son wasn't in his room that night and no other children were present. I rationalized it as him being tired and imagining it. The third time was when my son was around eight. My best friend and roommate, new apartment, different state, got up to go to the bathroom. The hall light was off and it was dark, but she saw my son standing in the hall next to her. She told him to go back to bed and step into the bathroom. She then sees him in the mirror standing behind her. She says, stop it, go to bed. My son then turns and walks away. That's when she realized something was wrong and looked back into the hall, but he wasn't there. She goes to his room and he was still asleep. She ran to my room to tell me. And for the first time I thought, okay, there seems to be a pattern here. Maybe there is something going on. The last time was when my son was 15, and this time I saw it. I was in bed, depressed and tired after having had a miscarriage. I woke up to my son curled up in bed next to me. I thought he was trying to comfort me, which was sweet. I sang a lullaby to him and pet his hair before it clicked. My son was 15 now. This was him at age seven or eight. I froze and asked who he was. He just said, everything's going to be okay, and then got up and left. Everyone just assumed that it was blood loss that made me hallucinate. But I was not hallucinating. I was wide awake, and I didn't have any other experiences like that. No one has seen my son's double in five years, but I still think it is super weird. Recently, my friend and I were recalling unexplained and possibly paranormal experiences that we've had in the past. I remembered this one that I had pushed out of my mind, honestly for good reason. Both of us are believers in the paranormal, but we also try to find a scientific and logical answer of what we've experienced before we jump to a paranormal explanation. However, neither of us were able to reach a logical conclusion on what I'm about to describe. Firstly, a bit of backstory. The house I grew up in was in a neighborhood almost completely surrounded by forest and greenery. While that sounds like it would be tranquil, it was not. Myself and other friends of mine have felt very uneasy walking through those woods, even in the daytime. And not just the usual, I feel like someone's following me feeling that you sometimes do get in forests or other areas like that. It felt like someone was watching you from the second you stepped into the woods. My house was on a street extremely close to the forest. It was about a two minute walk from my house to the main trail. Off the main trail, you were immediately met by thick forest. There were a few small clearings before the huge open field behind the forest itself. So it would take a long time to fight your way through the large forest before getting there. Very few people would make the trek out there, so I could always almost guarantee that every time I went out there, I would be able to enjoy the nature in serene isolation. In the warmer months of the year, I liked to spend my free time walking through the forest, especially in fall when the leaves had all turned orange and red just before they would start to fall from the trees. This story takes place on one of those fall days. I had been walking through the forest listening to music with my earbuds in for at least a couple of hours. 
The last time I had run into anyone else was about an hour prior, as per usual, for my walks. Even though I knew that I was probably very alone apart from wildlife, I remember still not being able to shake the feeling that someone was very close to me. The sun was also setting, so any sane person would be heading home by now anyways. After walking for a while longer, I decided to eventually start heading back in the direction of the main trail. By this time, the sun was barely still out, and it was getting dark pretty fast. I had almost made it to a pretty nice clearing, but there was no way in hell that I was going to go there only to have to walk home in the dark in the forest, especially since I was already very unsettled. As I turned around to head back toward home, I heard a voice, muffled by the music playing in my earbuds, come from behind me. I had been in very deep thought for a few minutes, so I was a bit startled, but assumed that I had accidentally spoken out loud to myself. Before I could even take a couple steps further, I heard someone speak again. Fully aware of my surroundings now, I froze dead in my tracks, my heart pounding as I took my right earbud out and sharply turned around to see who was behind me. I was horrified to see a person standing with their back toward me, looking off into the distance. Everything about them was so familiar, and it took me a couple of seconds to come to the horrifying realization that I was staring into the back of myself. It was wearing my dark navy and white plaid jacket, the black hood of the very hoodie that I was wearing resting on the collar of my jacket. Even my same short, blonde, unkempt hair with its brassy undertones shining in the last bit of light left from the setting sun. And then it spoke again, in my voice. It's not too far ahead now. My exact voice, cadence, tone, everything. It took me a second to snap out of the paralyzing fear I was in and book it home. I didn't try to speak to whatever it was. I just ran as fast as I could to the main trail and out of the forest. As I ran, I could have sworn that I heard someone chasing me the whole way out of the forest, which might have just been a product of being hyper aware of my surroundings and my state of fear, but I didn't dare look behind me, because I was terrified of what I might have seen if I did. After nearly tripping and falling on branches and stumps a million times, I tore out of the forest and onto the road adjacent to my street. I kept running until I was on the complete opposite side of the road from the edge of the forest. I turned around and the only thing I saw were the bushes and branches I'd pushed through on my way out, springing back into their natural place. I stood there staring at the forest for a minute before heading home, in fear that whatever it was would pop out, but I saw nothing. I didn't go back into the woods for some time after that, and almost every returning visit I brought a friend with me. My friend told me she has also had odd experiences in those woods, and so has her sister. They have both seen tall, dark figures standing in the woods when they took walks together. One of them would see the figure, say nothing about it to the other one, and then book it out of the forest together. I had seen similar figures, but I had just always written it off as seeing shadows from bigger trees, my mind playing tricks on me, things like that. I had blocked this out of my memory for a long time, until my friend had brought up her strange experiences in the forest and how she constantly felt uneasy in it. Still to this day, years later, I cannot come up with a rational or scientific explanation for what I saw, and I've had little luck looking online for answers too. Either way, it was by far the craziest thing I've ever experienced. Just three days ago, my friend and I went up to Walmart. There's this pavement trail up by my neighborhood basketball court, and all of a sudden, three people practically materialized in front of us. We thought nothing of it at first, as the trail is commonly taken. However, upon closer inspection, the people looked just like our three friends, down to the exact details. Normally, I would have no problem with this. However, one of the friends had gone to Georgia, and the other one was at their house. 
Around this point, we got creeped out, but oh well, might as well keep going. We get about halfway up the trail, and one of our friend's voices calls out. The voice was the exact cadence and tone. This is when things got weirder. My friend and I both turned to each other and asked if that was really our friend. From there, we braced ourselves for some kind of silly jump scare, turned the corner of the trail, and they were gone. We kept going and saw them again, this time in a home goods parking lot along the way there. We were able to get a good look at them as we were far enough away to not be detected, but close enough to get details. I saw one of them, our younger friend of the group, was standing at an angle. I checked his face for identifiable features, but there was no face. I mean like there were no features whatsoever on his face. It terrified me. The others turned around a little bit at the same angle as they were preparing to get to the next part of the trail that led directly to Walmart. Their faces were all contorted. I mean like physically impossible kind of contorted. Then I realized they were following a particular pathway that we followed about a month ago. I mean down to foot placement, people placement, everything. It was like watching my past. They rounded the corner and we followed not far behind. They were gone. Entirely gone. I mean no trace, nothing, like they didn't even exist. I brought this up with one of the friends that we supposedly encountered, and she freaked out. She was more freaked out by the fact that them taking the trail meant that they were nearby. It's sort of become a taboo topic, but I think they've followed me home. Just today I was taking out the garbage, and down through this alleyway, there was a voice speaking to me. It was that same friend's voice, but just ever so noticeably slightly distorted. I turned, and there were three figures, shrouded in shadow. Their outlines were the same as those very friends I had encountered. Needless to say, I finished taking out the trash at lightning speed. I don't really see this as anything extreme right now. I'm more so just looking for closure on what happened. I don't need anything immediately at this moment, but if anyone has an answer, and I know someone must, please let me know. So, a few weeks back, my neighbor was over talking and just shooting the breeze, hanging out and whatnot. My other neighbor called me, and when I went to answer, my phone randomly died. I told my neighbor, phone's dead, I'll throw it on the charger and head out. When I put my phone on the charger, I waited for the screen to tell me what percent the battery was. It stayed black, as if the battery was completely drained. I waited about 20 seconds and it finally lit up, confirming a 5% charge. I was headed back to the living room when I thought I heard my buddy in the bathroom. I noticed that the light was off and it sounded as if he was in there trying to play a prank on me, scare me or something like that. So I tried to walk in and scare him, but it felt like I was being stopped at some sort of invisible force field. I tried my hand and it just went numb like a dead arm. The harder I tried to get into that bathroom, the more drained and the weaker I felt. I tried to force my way in. The door was completely open and it was pitch black inside. It was about 10.30 at night. I tried with some decent effort and it just felt as if something was grabbing me from the center of my chest, pulling me back and away from the bathroom. I imagined like somebody had a hold of my sternum and forcefully pulled me out of the bathroom and back into the hallway on the floor. I physically collapsed as if I had just run a marathon, absolutely drained and with no energy. I finally got my energy to stand back up and get to the door. My buddy says, that was quick. Hey, uh, what's wrong? I walked to the couch and sat down. I told him that I thought I had heard him in the bathroom and I collapsed when I tried to walk in. He told me that I had walked out of the back hallway and told him, 
I'm going to be right back. I forgot that I wanted to put some cologne on. I have no memory of this. Was that some spirit or entity that took over me? Did my doppelganger come and visit and take over my life for a second? I was completely sober, and I was halfway through one beer when my phone died. So I have no idea what happened. I've had a haunted doll ever since I was a kid, and I just found out. I'm writing this as she's sitting next to me, so that I can make sure she's okay with the post. But when I was little, like six or seven, my great-grandma died. I hadn't known, but she had willed me a vintage doll that she owned. It was a pretty doll, with brown hair and bright blue eyes, that she had crocheted a beautiful dress for. But as a little girl, she scared me, and she was put in a keepsake dresser with other things that reminded me of her. Go forward to just after my birthday this year. It's been quite a while since the doll came into my possession, and I have come into contact with a family of ghosts. I have also converted to Wicca and specialize in divination. I felt a pull toward the keepsake chest, but my altar was on top, so I didn't think much of it. When I finally decided to check yesterday, I found the doll that I had forgotten about. I felt that strong pull again. Her energy wasn't like my great grandma's, but it wasn't negative. It felt like she wanted to talk to me and get my attention. To make a long story a little shorter, I used EVP to communicate, but she didn't like that. So then I used a Ouija board, which got me a little further. Finally, automatic writing got me the furthest. I learned the most from the writing session, which I kept a record of on my computer. I got her name and age, as well as the year of death. Her name is Catherine, but she goes by Kathy. I felt sleepy, and I took a nap with her at the foot of my bed. When I woke up, she was in my arms. I also had a strange dream about her while I napped. So I sat around for a bit, and every time I left the room, she would move a little bit from where she was before. Mostly it was just her arms or eyes, which do blink. I brought it up to a medium friend of mine, the one who had helped me with the ghost family. She explained some things to me, and when I asked Kathy to give me a sign, the fire alarm went off, and my desk lamp's metal cover looked burned. My stepmom blamed it on the candle on my nightstand, but it wasn't lit at the time. While my sister and I talked in the hall, I peeked my head back in a few times, and she kept on moving. We decided to bring her into my sister's room. I told her how Kathy wanted her hair unmatted and wanted me to sew her an orange and lemon dress. My sister unmatted her hair, and I'm getting the thread in the fabric later today. We got distracted once more and I made cookies, but every time that we would check on Kathy, she would move again. When I went to bed last night, I just kept her in my arms because I knew she would end up there anyway, no matter where I put her. No weird dreams that I remember last night, for now anyway. About three weeks ago now, I got this doll from this antique store that I was at with my boyfriend. The doll was sitting in a rocking chair, and it caught my eye. I brought the doll to my best friend's house, and his girlfriend refused to look at the doll. She hated being in the same room as it. My best friend and I started playing with the spirit box, and nothing that creepy spawned out of it. The past week or so has been slightly weird, though. The doll's legs seem to cross on their own. I uncross them, and they always end up crossed again. Now, paintings keep falling down near the doll. My paintings are canvas paintings, and not on paper, so I hang them up over pushpins. 
The pushpins themselves completely fall out of the wall. Today, an extremely small painting was just off one pushpin and it was just crooked. My paintings have been hung up on my wall for a year now, and not once have they ever behaved like this. It could all be a coincidence, sure, but I don't know. It's kind of creeping me out. I'm starting to wonder if that doll really is haunted. I grew up in England in what my family referred to as an upside down house. Basically, the row of houses were built on a hill. So you entered into the upstairs, your hall, living room, dining room, kitchen and toilet, and then went downstairs for the bedrooms, which opened out onto the garden. The house itself was never comfortable. For context, I would have birthday parties where kids would line up to use the upstairs bathroom instead of daring to use the downstairs one. My mom found a cross necklace in her wardrobe one time. Another time, her work shirt disappeared and she tore about the whole house, only for it to show up at the very front of her wardrobe, all pressed and clean. Another time, I was in the downstairs bathroom and I was just singing nonsense lyrics that I was making up in my head. A male voice sang the next line that I had in my head. I ran to the stairs, sat down halfway up, and all I could hear was his laughter. So yeah, funhouse. The doll story, though, still remains the single most terrifying thing that has ever happened to me, paranormal-wise. I honestly can't recall my age, but it was before 10. I had one of those bunk beds with storage underneath. The night before, I had set up a stuffed toy sleepover in my bed. Not relevant, but there you go. I woke up that morning and I didn't immediately open my eyes. I could sense somebody watching me. I finally opened my eyes and I noticed that something felt really off about the line of dolls and toys on the shelf over my wardrobe. It's a long, thin room and this is exactly opposite my bed. One doll's eyes felt different still doll eyes, but not. Not blinking or moving, just different. I could feel its eyes on me, as if it were a human looking at me. That's the only way I can describe it. I closed my eyes and reopened them. Nothing changed. I counted to ten mentally. I threw off my covers and practically jumped down the ladder and I just bailed out of there. No matter what I did, I just felt that that one doll was watching me. I turn back to the door as I'm going, and I swear by all things holy, this thing is leaning out over the edge of the shelf to watch me go. I hid in my mom's bed with her, terrified that it would somehow follow me. I cautiously went back in later and stared at it, but it was just a doll again. I took it down and hid it in the back of the wardrobe for who knows how long. I've never been comfortable around dolls since. Whatever was in that house, at least whatever the masculine presence was, really liked to scare me. I visited the street about eight years ago after having moved out over a decade ago, and that house still gives me the creeps. My mother's friend still lives down the street. She signed up for permanent night shift at her job because she said dark shadows would peer into her windows at night and she'd rather just be gone. She also says that she senses people coming up behind her when she's home alone. So yeah, fun house and fun street. When I was around 13 or 14 years old, my great-grandmother used to collect dolls. One of the dolls I took a particular liking to because of how creepy it was. She picked up on it and actually gave it to me not too long before she passed away. Fast forward to the story at hand. 
My two stepbrothers and I were sitting in the living room, chatting late at night, around 1 a.m. or so. For context, this is a cookie cutter house. So when you walk in, you basically have to choose between going upstairs or downstairs. The living room is directly upstairs from the front door. There's a fireplace on the left-hand wall, but not much else to note since it was an open concept. Adjacent to the wall, there was the railing overlooking the doorway area, and in front of the railing is a couch. There's also a television sitting on the ground on the wall opposite the couch. During our conversation, we got on the topic of childhood paranormal experiences. Joking around, I went and grabbed the doll from my bedroom and leaned it up on the shelf above the fireplace. I made sure that when I put the doll up there, it was leaning securely so as not to slip off. Some things that are important to note. The television was on, but just in the no signal screen. And because we were preparing to move, there were boxes and trash bags piled up in front of the fireplace, at least three to five feet out. We were all sitting on the couch at this time. In the middle of a story that my younger stepbrother was telling about an experience he'd had in the basement of a childhood home, the doll was flung forward from the shelf, landing a good few feet away from the boxes, meaning that it had to fly a good six to eight feet from the fireplace. At the exact time that the doll made contact with the ground, the television shut itself off and then turned back on. We have never had any electrical issues in that house or with that TV. I know people are going to say that it's possible the doll just fell, but the doll didn't fall. It flew forward off the shelf, even though it had been leaning backwards. And things that fall don't typically fall seven feet to eight feet out. They fall down. So, I don't know but I think we might have a haunted doll on our hands. So my girlfriend has been experiencing issues with a dark entity for about seven years since she moved out of an old house a number of years back. This entity started showing up in the house, in a room where she said she felt very ill just being near it. This entity looks exactly like her, to the point that when she cuts her hair, it has her new hair. She's shrouded in all black, and it seems that she has facial features, but you can't make them out. She only seems to show up when my girlfriend is doing bad mentally, and seems to feed off of the negative emotions. She has been described to somewhat sound like my girlfriend, even to other people who have seen her. Along with her, there have been other spirits documented by other members of the house, with a local ghost crew coming over every once in a while. The hot spot is the closet in her mom's upstairs bedroom, where they're most sighted. Any thoughts on what type of spirit this could be? Other than filling people with a feeling of dread, this entity hasn't harmed anyone, but any help would be appreciated. In college, I lived up on top of a mountain road, but still only five miles to town, down a trail through the woods. There was a hundred plus year old oak in the yard, slab stone porch built by hand. I lived in the studio apartment that was outside of the main house. The main house was haunted, but my shack was cozy. The woods up there were weird too, I never really was in the main house at all, but the three who lived there said some nights you couldn't sleep for all the noise. Floorboards creaking, thumps and knocks, that kind of thing. My experiences happened outside. Like I said, I hunted small game up there, as there must have been a rabbit colony in the vicinity, plus a few squirrel drays. Often out there while I was stalking, I'd get the distinct feeling of being stalked myself, 
Keep in mind, this stand of forest is only several acres, but was preserved mainly because of the historic oak trees scattered around. It's old woods. I would hear laughter, like children's laughter, but not quite like in a creepy movie. It was a bit distorted, and almost like flirty giggles that you imagine a fairy might make. It would come from a different direction each time I sought it. I eventually decided to stop following it and hunt. It never did stop. I would sometimes spend an afternoon in town having drinks or hanging at my friend's place. I'd finally leave and have enough liquid courage to hike back up the trail in the dark. That laughter would be replaced by noise, just like things running all around you and dashing about in the trees. I've been an outdoorsman for a long time, and I know the woods are noisy at night, particularly in the southern Appalachians, but this was different. It was dead silent out there, in that stand at night, except for this rushing to and fro by some unseen feet. Not like game fleeing, though. Deer run away and crash about doing it. I was a big-time night owl back then, and was regularly up doing schoolwork until three or four in the morning. One such night, it had just snowed a fresh twenty inches or so, decent accumulation for the area. Our yard and the woods were like a paradise for me and my dog. I was excited to hunt around the next day for tracks and see if I couldn't locate the rabbit den precisely. I was up working and the dog came scratching to get in, not frantic or anything. I let her in and she lay down to sleep. Odd, because she's a husky and preferred the snow to my tiny heated apartment every time. I decided to call it a night too and went out for a cigarette. It was 3.24 in the morning. I can still see it on top of my MacBook display before I closed it. I went out and noted that the clouds were dispersed a bit and the moon was bright on the snow. I lit my cigarette and was just looking out across the fence and into the woods when something caught my eye. It looked just like a silhouette of somebody leaning against one of those big oak trees, like you'd see somebody with a palm planted against a wall with the arm straight out leaning against it. It's not moving, so I can't tell if I'm just tired, or the lighting is funny, or what. So I walked further to the end of the porch, and as soon as I stepped off onto the fresh snow, it took off. The thing was tall. My estimates based on that tree put the thing at seven feet. It ran along the border of the fence and back off into the woods. It was hairless, as far as I can tell, and completely naked. Otherwise, though, its form was just that of a tall, skinny man. I went inside and switched to boots, grabbed my rifle and my flashlight, and I went to check the tracks. I picked up what had to be a set of size 14 or 15 barefoot tracks. It ran along the fence and down the treeless stretch of backyard, as if heading into the woods. But then, the tracks just ended about 20 feet short of the wood line. I don't know if it jumped to the tree line or what. It probably could have, but there weren't any more tracks that I could find that night or the next day. It was like it just vanished. Never could explain that one. One day, I went to my friend Nicole's house with my friend Crystal. While I was there, Nicole tells me this story and asks what I think it is. For anonymity, I'll change out some names, and for context, Nicole, Nicole's boyfriend John, and Crystal all work together. I hope this isn't too confusing, but I'm curious as to what you think. Nicole parked her car at work one day and saw John and Crystal having a smoke together. John was facing Nicole, and Crystal was facing John with her back to Nicole. Nicole went upstairs to her desk, and everyone was asking where Crystal was. She said she was downstairs, 
having a smoke with John. John comes up and goes to his desk. She asks him where Crystal was, and he said he didn't know. She asked him who he was standing with, and he said no one. Nicole then gets a text from Crystal, saying she was going to be late and could she tell their boss. Nicole starts freaking out because she knows she saw Crystal downstairs. She described her in detail, hair up in a top knot, white long sleeved shirt, black leggings and black sandals, with her purse hanging from her right elbow. To be clear, Crystal was just married and John is not her type, so that can be eliminated as a possibility of lying and cheating. I asked Crystal what she was doing while Nicole saw her with John, and she said she was sleeping at home. She also said that she lost those black sandals on vacation a few months back. My mind goes to a few places. Number one, how stressed are you? Your mind can play tricks if you're not feeling well. Two, astral projection, since Crystal was sleeping. Three, residual energy, since this is something that happens frequently. Four, Crystal's mother? Crystal is the spitting image of her mom. Her mom passed many years ago. John's dad went into the hospital the evening I was there, and the event happened a few days prior. Or a doppelganger wearing the missing shoes. Now something else super freaky happened that night when I was at her place. The night she told me this story. I was getting ready to read Nicole's tarot cards and I went to the bathroom to wash my hands. When I came back, Nicole had my cards out already and was shuffling. Anyone who is familiar with tarot knows that you do not touch the cards until they're handed to you, and she had never done this before. I did leave them out for that crazy moon about a month ago, and they've gotten a lot stronger from it, so their pull to touch them is overwhelming. But still, she knows better. I had previously explained the rules to her of how I read tarot for everyone's safety, so I have no idea what possessed her to do that. I sat and took them back and began to shuffle, but the energy was off, like really off. Her dog was chill all night, but the second I began to lay her cards, after giving them back for her to shuffle, he began to bark at the sliding door that led to her balcony. We're talking over 10 stories here, so no one is there. No birds, no other animals, nothing. I started to become unsettled since the off feeling was getting stronger. We tried to shush him and settle him, but nothing was working. I decided to put the cards away since there was something amiss going on. From what I saw of her reading, it was a very good one, but there was something else stopping me from reading her. I urged her to smudge the house and everyone in it, and once that was done, I felt better. The next day, I am so freaking sick. Coughing, sore throat, nauseous, weak body. I can't eat, I can't sleep, I can't drink anything. This lasted for two days and I'm on the mend now, but still not 100%. So what in the world did she see? What was going on? Does anyone have any idea? I am at a total loss. I'm definitely not going to touch my cards until I'm 100% well again and do a cleansing on them. I will eventually ask the question, but I wonder if you may have some input as to what happened that night and what Crystal saw before. Back in 2004 or 2005, I was leaving a buddy's house headed home. He lived on Lake Ariel in Wayne County, Pennsylvania. I was a good 15 miles away, so I decided to take back roads to save time. As I crested this mountain road, I see a van off to the side, doors open, lights on. It's well after midnight and no one is on the road. I slowed my car, a 1989 Volkswagen Ragtop, down to first gear, 
looking for a person or people that might be hurt. Not a soul is around, and the woods are quiet. The van off the road is not running, but all the lights are on, and the driver's door is open. I remember thinking, man, I don't have cell service until the top of the mountain. I've got to call the cops. So I proceeded to go toward where I knew I had cell service. I was maybe going 30 miles an hour tops. I knew this situation was dicey, but then it got worse. No more than three or so miles away, the brush thinned on the roadside, so you had a better view of what was in the woods. I see movement, so I let off the gas, thinking that I don't want to pace a deer. As I let off, this man, soaking in fresh blood, comes from the tree line and into the road. He's so covered in gore, I honestly couldn't tell it was a man at first. He stumbled out in front of the car and waved me down. I was in my ragtop, top down, of course. He was yelling and grabbing at my door. I dropped into first and took off. In another mile or so, I would have cell service to call the cops. The dude was obviously hurt, and his grab from my door scared me. There was a wide space on the mountain where I agreed to wait for the cops. They were there in under 10 minutes. While I waited, I put the top up and locked the doors. An officer took my statement, and he looked over my car with a flashlight. The guy from the woods had left a bloody smear down my door. Another officer found the van, but couldn't locate the guy who came out of the woods. The cops let me go home and said that they would call if they needed anything further. Within a few days, I did get a call, saying the van was located, and they asked if I could describe the man. They never found him that night, and as far as I know, they never did. Apparently, the van was stolen, and the cops surmised that this guy banged himself up and took off in a panic. As far as I know, they never did track him down. This experience has stuck with me, and to this day, I keep a lookout for a bloody man running out of the woods. A few years ago, I was part of a local paranormal investigation team. On one investigation, the client had several dolls among her possessions, many of which were in a display case in the living room. Upon arrival, we were doing a walkthrough to determine the hot spots for us to check out, decide camera placement, and get some basic background information. While in the living room, the client invited us to check out a few specific dolls from the case that held particular interest to her. Three dolls were taken out of the case and looked at by a few of our team members. The one that caught my attention the most was wearing a dress and a cape, had beautiful curly hair, and was about six inches tall. When I was done checking the doll out, I handed it back to the client to be returned to the case. After the normal settling that takes place after the doll was back in its spot, the case was closed. I started to turn away from it. Two other team members and the client witnessed the next thing that happened. The doll reached out toward me, as though it wanted me to pick it back up. I almost ran out of the house, but I reminded myself that I was there to help determine what was going on in the house. Some things were debunked as normal. Other things were determined to be paranormal or unexplained. But that doll freaked me out. I have had dolls my entire life. Baby dolls, porcelain dolls, Barbie dolls. I like them just fine. My dad fears them, and as kids, my sister and I would joke about it with him, since my great-grandmother's house is filled with all kinds of dolls and porcelain statues. But in recent years, especially right now, something feels off. 
My sister recently moved in with us due to her being unhappy living with my biological mother. She is in high school and naturally grew out of wanting her American Girl doll. I would say that I am now the proud owner of two, except here's the thing. The home that my sister was in was charged with so much negative intense energy. I know she didn't mean to bring any negative spirits into our home and I don't blame her for this. I love my sister very much, and it was kind of her to give me her Josephina doll, along with the little things and clothing that came with her. It is a beautiful, well taken care of doll, but I can feel something is very wrong with this doll. Even as I am sitting here telling this story, I feel like something is watching me, something very bad and unwelcome in my parents' home. I am fearing the worst, but I'm not crying for help nor do I need it, because I feel like I should try to assess the situation myself before I decide to involve others with this dark energy that seems to radiate off the doll. Right now, it is very strong. I am afraid to go near the shelf she is sitting on at the moment. When I first got her, I changed her outfit and felt this very sad energy. The doll even looks sad, like it witnessed something truly awful and heartbreaking. Now it feels evil and insidious. I never have gotten this feeling from any other doll I've ever received as a gift in my entire life. I am an adult and really shouldn't be acting like a scared child, but this is terrifying. I feel uneasy and an overwhelming sense of dread, but I do not feel like I need to relocate at the moment since I feel like I'm strong enough to fight whatever this thing may be. I need to protect my family and I will do it but I have no option but to do this for myself. I hate running from things like this, so I won't do it this time. At the same time, I don't know or possess the ability to cleanse the doll. I don't trust online sources for these types of situations. Many things will mislead you. I don't like the idea of putting the doll away because I don't want my sister to feel sad. But at the same time, I don't want to tell her the reason so that she doesn't think I'm crazy. My stepmom is spiritual, but even she would think that I was just overreacting and acting like a scared child. My dad would probably agree with me, but that's just because he's afraid of dolls in general. He's not really into the spiritual side of it, nor does he give it much thought like I do. It's probably for the best, too. I don't know. Maybe my stepmom would believe me, but say that I'm overreacting for fear of manifesting in the fear even more. She's wise like that, but she's also turning a blind eye and that solves nothing. I think I know who gave it this bad energy too. I won't refer to them because they're just that bad and they give off the worst energy. I respect people in general, but this person in my life as well as my sisters is a truly evil being and I can't forgive them. The doll has a story and not a happy one either. And that's just the beginning of things. I keep seeing shadows of a man out of the corner of my eye, regardless of the time of day or night. I went downstairs to get some water when I saw it very clearly this time. The resemblance it took was from this exact toxic person that I mentioned. The same shadow, the same figure, shape, and height. I almost dropped my cup. I'm contemplating on telling a close friend of mine but I also refuse to burden them with something as silly sounding as this. I hope these occurrences stop and I can put it out of my mind. I'm wearing a rose quartz bracelet that has other stones that I unfortunately don't remember the names of, but it does protect me to an extent. I know it might sound silly, but the bracelet was made by very good people and their energy shines through this bracelet. I hope it helps me fend off whatever this is and that I can tell it to leave me alone before I have to act upon it and drive it away forcefully myself. I'm not afraid to do anything that I need to do to protect my parents and sister. I know some people will say, it's just a doll, it's harmless, but I thought that too, but I think I was very mistaken. I hope that nothing like this ever happens to any of you. It's a very painful and draining thing to go through.
So when I was seven to nine, I don't remember what age I was exactly. I had this doll that was about as tall as a German Shepherd dog. This doll had a voice box where if you pressed it, it would laugh and giggle for about 30 seconds. This voice box was placed in a pocket in the back of the doll's dress. Eventually, I kind of got annoyed with the voice box due to it going off a lot. Before this incident, I had thought that some stuff behind it was pressing on it or that the pocket was sewn on too tightly. So it was pressing the box when there was pressure on the pocket. As I said, I just got really annoyed with this box. So I had emptied out a drawer and placed the box in the drawer. I had closed the drawer carefully so as not to move the box in the slightest. After this, I went to sleep. At maybe midnight, I had woken to the sound of the box coming from the doll. The doll I had made sure to place on the opposite side of the room from the drawer that the box was in. Forgetting for a minute that I had taken the box out of the doll, I tried to go back to sleep. About five minutes later, as I was dozing, I remembered where I had put the box and I got up to open the drawer. It was still there, exactly where I had left it. A few weeks later, I got rid of the doll. However, for a few years after that, I could still hear the laughter of the doll's voice box, even when both the box and the doll were out of the house. To this day, I can't really explain it. I have a hobby of collecting older dolls that kind of sit in my room. Some have been gifted and others I just got for me. One that I got recently just doesn't seem right. Others I can feel the energy from, hence why I got them. But this one, there was just nothing. I got her anyway and named her like I do with all the others. Her name is Abigail. Ever since I brought her home, things have been really weird, especially when I sleep. I've been having dreams of drowning and a girl screaming. At first I thought it was just stress because of exams, but now it's getting worse and I'm done with school. Now, maybe it's not Abigail, maybe it's another one of the dolls, but this had never happened until she came into my home. The dreams of the girl, she couldn't be older than maybe 15. Is there anything I can do? Is there anything I should do? I don't really know what to do next. I've been interested in the paranormal for as long as I can remember and have been investigating the paranormal for about 12 years now. I purchased three haunted dolls a year ago, and up until now, all has been quiet, except for one incident that happened a few months ago. I was laying in bed, desperate to use the bathroom, but not wanting to brave the cold. Being the only person in the house, I hear someone say, psst, behind me. It takes me a minute to brave turning over, but when I did, there was nothing and nobody there. I have no explanation for this sound. None of my electronics make this noise, nor does anything else in my house. My cats do not have access to my bedroom or the hallway leading to it while I sleep. We can't hear their noises from the bedroom. Then nothing more happened until last week. My partner has a cylindrical massage roller. It sits underneath the exercise bike. So we're sitting watching TV and the roller rolls across the room out of nowhere. Nothing interacted with it. I accept that there is a possibility that it could have fallen, but with how it usually sits, it seems very unlikely. It's also never happened before and it hasn't happened since. My cats have one of those little balls that light up when something touches it. And the last two days, it's been randomly lighting up on its own. I hear this can happen when the batteries are low, but this was a fresh ball about a week ago. And today, 
sitting quietly, scrolling social media, the guitar that sits on its stand across the lounge from the sofa randomly rings out. All the cats were sleeping at the time, and nothing was around it to fall and hit the strings. Again, I just don't have an explanation for it. I plan to do some EVP work with the dolls and see whether anything comes of it, but my house also sits on the side of an old hospital, and has a church and cemetery just across the street, too. So who knows what might be going on. This is super exciting for me, but I'm remembering to keep my skeptical brain on and trying to debunk everything. Update. There was a little more activity. I was just getting myself ready for bed two days ago, and I heard scratching coming from under the bed. I did the obvious cat check. No cat. I checked for signs of other wildlife outside or something, but nothing. I went for a nap yesterday, and once again was woken to whispering in my ear. This time, it really did sound like my partner speaking words that I couldn't understand. He wasn't in the room. He wasn't even talking elsewhere in the house. Very strange, but still super exciting. Update number two. Things have been quiet for a few days now. It feels kind of eerie with nothing happening. Almost like that feeling you get of the calm before the storm. Update number three. The scratching continues. It's happening in the daytime now, too. I've searched high and low for the source and have come up empty. Balls continue to flash on their own, but nothing new yet. I hope to get some quiet time in the next few weeks to try some EVP. Update number four. I was woken up to scratching again yesterday, last night, followed by a woman quietly singing. This is completely new activity. Every other time that I've heard something that sounded like a voice, it was always male. Update number five. Laying in bed last night, trying to sleep but struggling, I heard a male voice grunt behind me, as if somebody was turning over in their sleep in the bed next to me. It took me a moment to realize that my partner was not in bed yet, so this noise couldn't be coming from him. I've never been scared of any of the paranormal activity that I've ever experienced before, not even when I've been physically touched. But for some reason, this felt different, wrong somehow. I jumped out of the bed and literally ran into the lounge, shaking. My partner searched the bedroom in case someone had broken in, but obviously there was no one to be found. This one has left me very shaken, and I can't yet put a finger on why. This happened a long time ago. My family and I love going to garage sales and thrift stores. My parents are very friendly and polite and people usually like them pretty quickly. So they've been offered several times to take stuff for free and they've even gotten these types of deals. You can have everything for free, but you have to take all the stuff. So we've ended up with a truck filled with random garage sale items more than once. One time, my mom and I were in her bedroom checking the loot of one of these types of deals. We were having a good time while sorting all of the stuff. We got to this big trash bag that was filled with dolls. There were lots of them. So I decided to just open the entire bag and put them all out on the bed. We started checking the dolls one by one, choosing which ones to keep for my sister and which ones we should give away and which ones we should throw away. Most of these deals include taking some trash, but we didn't care. It was fun. We have half the bag sorted out. When we get to this tumbling doll that supposedly can do flips, my mom likes it. Looks like new and seems like a fun toy for my sister, so she wants to keep it. She asks me to test it to see the doll tumbling, but the batteries seem to be dead. Tried again with brand new batteries, but still no luck. After a few minutes, I concluded that the doll must be broken and that it didn't work. So I take out the batteries and place the old dead ones back in. I put the doll back on the bed 
and we keep sorting the items. 15 minutes pass and my mom and I were just taking a break chatting when suddenly we hear this loud noise that sounded like gears and an overcharged motor. We looked at the bed and the sound comes from the doll, the tumbling one. And right in front of both of us, this doll turns its head, looks at me and says, Mama. The movement was so abrupt that I even felt the bed shake a little. My mom and I looked at each other and I saw her face turn ash white. I just punched the doll as hard as I could as a reflex and it landed on the other side of the bedroom. We immediately went to the kitchen to calm down and explain what just happened to my dad. After a few minutes, I go back to the room with my dad to investigate, trying to figure out what had just happened. My mom enters in full rage mode and goes for the doll and puts it in a plastic bag and asks my dad to take it out to the trash out of the house, now. My parents are religious, so after that they prayed and blessed the entire house for almost an hour. I've never seen my mom that scared. It truly felt like a scene from a horror movie. I expected the doll to get up and attack me in that moment. I don't really believe in the paranormal, even though I have had a couple of experiences that scared me that I can't explain. Growing up, I always hated dolls and was scared of them even to the point of having really messed up nightmares about them. Good thing this happened when I was older, around 16, or I'd probably still be traumatized. What still bugs me is that even if I do find some rational explanation for why the doll worked again with dead batteries, with the power switch off and not being touched by anything, the doll wasn't a baby doll. It was a gymnastics doll that was supposed to do flips as it wasn't new and there was no box, I'll probably never know if saying mama was one of its features. And honestly, I'm okay never knowing. A while back, Rando Nautica directed me and some friends of mine to some scary woods. I obviously had a lot of interesting findings over the last few days, but today was definitely significant. Along the same scary woods path that Rando Nautica had led us to, some friends and I were showing it off to another friend. We happened to find a random clearing in the forest with some path just along the road. I was driving, so I stayed lookout at the car while two of my friends went in with flashlights. It was around 9 p.m. When they went in, everything seemed normal until they looked up and saw tons of different dolls hanging above in the trees. I heard my first friend scream and run out of there. My second friend started recording and got it on camera before he also ran out. They told me that there were even more dolls that they didn't notice going in, and the ones near the exit of the clearing were even creepier, having large eyes and, for some, disconnected eyes. None of us have any idea what this could be. Something cursed, some kind of ritual. We don't really know, but it was definitely freaky. My church had a fish fry in the seventh grade. I decided not to go, but to host friends after. I was playing video games when they walked into my house. I noticed that one of them had a strange all black doll in their hands. Obviously, I inquired, and they told me that they had found a voodoo doll. Later, I would learn that the creepy kid at school had thrown it at them. None of us bought it, so naturally, we started putting our hair in it. After messing around with it to no avail, we left it on the floor and turned on a movie. Later on, another friend joined us and not seeing the doll, he kicked it clear across the room. We paid it no mind at first, but seconds later, my friend starts to cry 
as blood comes pouring out of his nose. Freaked out, we run out of the basement and try to move on with the night. For the next couple of nights, my friends and I experienced weird events. The main two people who messed with it got the worst. The number one culprit had footsteps walking all around his room and his door would open during the night. Along with the footsteps and doors, he would hear masculine voices outside of his door. His parents were lesbians, so it wasn't either of them as they both had fairly feminine and higher pitched voices. The second culprit was awoken three nights in a row with bloody noses. Personally, I just had very vivid dreams of family members being killed and horrifying images. Not much has happened since, and I don't really talk to those guys anymore as we kind of all went on our separate paths. I still am not entirely sure what we experienced or how it all happened, but I'll never mess with one of those things again. I just got this beautiful antique baby doll from Etsy. Something about her really caught my attention, and I just had to have her. I do collect antique dolls and trinkets, but I knew since day one that this one was different. I have used two different kinds of EMF meters on her throughout the day, and I have received various intelligent responses, both with the EMF and with the spirit box and combined. She doesn't have any batteries of any sort in her that could give off a faulty reading. I have had my phone in a different room with the lights off while conducting multiple tests with the EMF, and I ensured that she wasn't anywhere near walls or light switches. I'm looking for a logical explanation here. If I can't find one, I may just assume that this doll truly does have a paranormal attachment. I've always loved the paranormal, even as a little girl. I grew up with horror movies and find the paranormal fascinating. I've had a few encounters in the past that I'll probably tell about later, and my house is also haunted. But on to the first paranormal experience I ever had. I don't have any photos or anything because this happened when I was in the third grade in 2003 and I didn't have anything to record with or even to take pictures with at the time. Anyway, I was watching the 1994 version of Little Women with my mom and my grandmother was in the room. I saw movement out of the corner of my eye on my bookshelf where all my dolls were. The air was off, but I could see one of the dolls dresses billowing around her and one of my other dolls was reaching out to her. I brushed it off as my mind playing tricks on me. I should mention that my mom had rearranged them that day and had them all facing in the same direction. Skip to the next day. I had walked out of my room because my grandmother had called me to ask me something. And I walked back in and all of my dolls were turned in different directions and facing different ways. I ran out of there screaming. My mom didn't believe me until I showed her. She fixed them again, but my room had always been off and I had obtained more dolls from a family friend a few years later. And this is when things really got weird. I have two musical dolls and they would go off randomly sometimes. I started to feel like I was being watched and that I wasn't alone, but I brushed it off as paranoia because I never experienced anything major other than some of my dolls appearing to move every once in a while. Skip again to college after years of dealing with minimal doll movement, something changed. I was in my room one night and I felt something breathe down my neck. It scared me so much that I didn't sleep in my room that night anymore. My parents divorced when I was 15 and my dad was dating this girl who loved the paranormal and was a medium. 
I asked her if whenever she came over, she would check out and cleanse my room. The moment she stepped into my room, she looked at me and asked if there was a doll in my closet. My heart sank because the family friend had given me a porcelain baby doll that was practically life-sized, but it had no eyes. That was the one in my closet, and she confirmed that that was the one she was getting negative vibes from. She prayed over my room, saged it, and I still have the rose quartz in my room that she gave me. I got rid of the majority of my dolls, and I don't feel anything in my room anymore. I still constantly check my bookshelf, though, just to make sure everything's all right. And it's been almost two years since I got rid of my haunted dolls. But still, I don't think I'll ever forget. The summer before last, my boyfriend and I took a road trip to Omaha, Nebraska, with the main purpose being to visit the Museum of Shadows. We're both somewhere between believer and skeptic and thought that it would be a great experience for us. Leaning in, he even paid the $20 to rent a spirit box to use as we walked around the museum. If you haven't visited the Museum of Shadows, I'd recommend it, even if only because I found it very cathartic. It's mostly dolls with tragic stories attached to them, but walking around reading all the stories of suffering and sadness that families associated with many of these items was very heart-opening, for lack of a better word. Some items I felt were just creepy, and that's where people's associations of hauntings came from when they owned them. I believe sometimes people create their own hauntings by just simply being afraid of an object same with the dolls owned by children who had passed. The families are just so saddened and grief-stricken that they begin to assign their child's spirit to those items. It's so sad, but it really made me feel a great connection to people that I didn't even know, which I think is great for the spirit, however sad. So our spirit box wasn't giving us anything, literally not a single intelligible word. We weren't angry or disappointed, it was sort of a neat if we hear something, but understandable if we don't sort of thing, because we sort of assumed a majority of the items in there could not be haunted. They've got this doll, Demas, and when I say my heart rate increased just by typing her name, I'm not lying. She lives in a chicken wire cage toward the back of the first floor of the museum, and she is scary looking, not a normal looking doll. I got uneasy when I just saw her, and this is in a building full of frightening dolls. Maybe that's intentional, though. Maybe they put her in a cage to raise your apprehension. There is a sign above her that says if you choose to speak to her, always say goodbye, which of course you should do with any spirit, I guess, but Demas is apparently particularly malicious. I'm a pretty bold soul, so as we're standing there together with the spirit box, I decided I wanted to talk with her. Hello, I said, and the spirit box just kept clicking. I didn't know what to talk to her about, but I'm always worried about lost spirits, so I decided to ask, are you okay? Without hesitation, the spirit box said, Amanda, extremely clearly. My boyfriend and I both heard it. I said, did it just? And he was like, yes, it absolutely just said your name. I said above that I was brave, but I was also immediately filled with a sense of dread. Something about it saying my name and that we'd gotten absolutely nothing else out of that box the entire time we were there was terrifying. And I do not scare easily. I didn't continue the conversation. I just said, goodbye and ushered my boyfriend away from her because I was so uncomfortable with her following that. Just now I went through their Facebook feed to see if I still felt the same about her and even saw an event where they let people hold her. I've never felt so appalled seeing such innocent looking photographs. That doll is the only item I have ever encountered 
that I am 100% sure is haunted and maybe even malicious. As a really small child, I used to be terrified of a doll that my grandmother had that had been handmade for my mother when she was younger. I had repetitive nightmares where this thing would come to visit me for most of my childhood, and even occasionally as a teenager and adult. The last time that I was around it, physically, was shortly after my grandmother died, and I still felt uneasy looking directly at it even at 25 years old. My mom sold it during an estate sale to a woman in the town where my grandmother died, and it's lost as far as I know. I had always written off this phobia as some weird, irrational childhood fear, because Raggedy Ann dolls are creepy as hell looking, especially when they're homemade, and I just assumed that it was normal. But the hold this doll had on me that made me feel as if it was staring into the depths of my soul constantly, I just couldn't shake. Then something crazy happened. And after doing some research, I discovered that the real life version of the Annabelle doll matched the Raggedy Ann version my grandmother had almost perfectly. I know most of this is just a coincidence, but I have always felt that something was off about this doll. It harbored bad energy. Oddly enough, after all of this, I have inquired about the doll to my mother, because I feel like I have this weird connection to it. She told me that she never kept it in the house around me when I was younger, because I always cried and became hysterical at night when it was around, so she gave it to my grandmother. I'm just imagining me finding this thing and then driving it home in the middle of the night and crazy things start happening. For the record, I do not believe in ghosts or spirits, but I will go to my grave saying that I picked up on something evil from this doll as a kid. I really wish I had a picture to share, but I honestly avoided this thing as much as possible and always felt that it was looking at me from around the corner at night. I don't know if anybody else has experienced something like this as a kid, where you just knew something wasn't right. It probably sounds dumb, but... I honestly believe that something was going on, and my younger self picked up on it. This happened a few years ago, and it's something that I consider to be a paranormal experience. For context, I collect vintage clown dolls, and I'm a clown for hire myself. Clowns have been a big part of my life. I find clowns very comforting, so collecting older ones was always something that I've been excited about. I don't have very many clown dolls. Specifically, I collect sand clowns, usually. I have around eight or ten clown dolls, I think. So a few years back, I got a hold of a new sand clown among two others. I instantly had a very strong connection to the clown and I would take him with me everywhere, in the car, around the house, that sort of casual thing. I think I even took him to school once in my backpack. I was in high school at the time. A little while after this, I started having dreams. I still remember them vividly in such high detail I had the same exact dream every time, and I knew it was a dream. I was fully conscious during them. It didn't feel like a dream. It almost felt like it was real life somehow. I had these dreams back to back several times. The dream would be that I was in a house with wooden floors, wooden walls, and a wooden roof. At the end of the room that I was facing, there was one wooden chair with my clown doll sitting in it, staring at me. There were two doors to the side of it, open, with a little toy train track that ran through both of them. There were two doors on either side. The first dream, I just looked through all the doors. 
the two bedrooms, the standard sort of guest room, I suppose. And on the left, the first door was a little girl's room with a crib and some toys like bears. It was very sweet. The last room was a sort of sitting room, couches and a coffee table. When I came back, the clown was still there in the chair. I walked up to it and started talking to it, but nothing really happened. I did feel sort of unnerved, like there was a presence, and I never went through the two gateways because it was pitch black and it scared me. In most dreams, I feel some sort of progress towards something. These dreams never progressed or changed. It was the same room, the same clown, nothing going on, just a sense of unease, like I was being watched. So I kept getting these dreams every night, over and over, back to back. After a while, I start to get scared and I yell at the clown doll. I just sort of ask what I'm doing there and if it was haunted or something. I got really upset at this point. The clown's eyes looked side to side and it really freaked me out. In the last dream I had, I got mad and I told it to leave me alone and to never come back to bother me. I was really scared and started talking about some religious things because I was getting worried that it could have been a demon or a ghost at this point haunting me. I started getting really into it and a little train came out of the doorway and just ran around the track once, whistling a few times. The clown doll's eyes looked directly at me and he said something for the first time and I woke up. I can't remember what it was, I could never make it out. After this, I never had that dream again. I guess whatever I did made it leave, or not? I'm not really sure, honestly. I'm sure a lot of people would say, hey, this isn't supernatural. What are you, stupid? It's just a dream. But it's something that I felt, deep in my core, that this was supernatural, because I've never experienced anything like it. The clown doll is still one of my favorites. After the dreams, I actually feel more attached to it. These dolls mean a lot to me and I have them on my desk and I still take them with me places sometimes. When I hold them now, it almost feels like it fills me with a sense of calm. Sometimes I wonder if it does have some sort of spirit attached to it, but maybe it's just very good and helpful. I got this clown and went through this when I was going through recovery from extensive trauma, and they have helped me a lot in my recovery despite the weird and scary dreams. I almost feel like I know him, like we're friends. I know it sounds kind of weird, and I'm sure this isn't the most exciting story, but that's what happened to me. My daughter has several old porcelain dolls. When she was nine, she got a sudden interest in them. I had never bought them for her because they're often very delicate and I didn't want her to break them. I took her to the Goodwill store and she begged for one. I let her buy it since she takes good care of her things. I quickly noticed that something was different in my house. I felt like I was being watched. Shortly after that, she asked for another doll at the Goodwill. Over the years, she has collected three. I noticed that she was very careful about which one she picked. She treats the dolls like gold and keeps them sitting up on the corner of her bed. She tells me the dolls like me since I'm so careful with them when I move them to make her bed. I see shadows around my house and I hear soft voices. Nothing that makes me feel in danger and I'm getting used to it but it's just freaky, and it never happened until we brought that first doll home. My
My dad died when I was 11. Every summer, we went to a little town which had a porcelain doll museum. I loved going there, hanging out with my dad, and I had several dolls myself, but one I loved the most. It resembled an Indian girl with two braids. I kept it on a shelf facing my bed, pushed into the corner of it. I had it for about three to four years, and I never touched it once. I just admired it. Well, as I mentioned, my dad died in December. Fast forward half a year later, it's June, summer holidays, and I'm laying on my bed with my laptop, chatting with my friend at midnight. Both my door and my window were open, but it was quiet outside, no wind, nothing. The doll suddenly fell to the floor. I was startled by the noise, but confused since it didn't shatter. The shelf was nearly two meters high, about six feet. So I turned off the lights, covered myself in a blanket and went to sleep, hoping that I could. I couldn't figure out how it could have fallen from that height and not broken. The next morning, the doll was still on the ground, face down. And I started to think, how could it have fallen? It was protected from any wind, even though there was none. And there were 40 centimeters of empty space in front of it someone would have had to pull it out and drop it. I got up, shaking, and slowly approached it. I sat on the floor and picked it up. The doll was intact, except for one thing. The left braid was cut in half. Not torn, cut. I quickly put it away and I never touched it again. I didn't even look at it. I still don't really know what happened. Sometimes I think that it was my dad, but I only think that to comfort myself. As I grow older, it doesn't seem logical. Why would my dad, who loved me the most, try to hurt my favorite doll that I got from him? My story happened when I was nine years old. I'm 17 now, and I'm in Belgium. I shared the story with some friends, but I wanted more people to hear it. For my birthday when I was nine, I had tickets to go to Disneyland Paris with my mom. I was really happy because it was my first time there. It was really good, and I had a great time. After I did the Buzz Lightyear attraction, I asked my mom if I could have one of the toys, and she bought me one. I played with it sometimes, and I was the kind of kid that threw his toys around and found that funny. I did that with my Buzz Lightyear, but I was careful so I wouldn't break it. My toys never had a violent impact, it's not like I had an anger problem. I just liked to throw them and see what would happen. I stopped to play with it. But the thing is that one year later, he started to make these really random sounds and shoot his laser at night for no reason. I have glasses, but on my bed, I was able to see the red light and the sound was loud. The thing is that nothing was touching it and he doesn't have any kind of detection thing on him. Nothing was touching him, so it wasn't supposed to make a sound or talk or shoot or anything. Even if I was young, I didn't believe in ghosts, but this still scared me. It was making sounds only at night when I was in bed asleep, or trying to. I was really scared because it just never stopped. I remember asking my dad to please get it out of my room, so he put it in the basement. My basement is really small. But the really creepy thing, the really scary thing that happened wasn't that. My house has two floors and it isn't that big. My toilet is super small and it's next to the basement door. When I was younger, I was really scared of the dark and I was holding my cat downstairs to go to the bathroom when I needed to and turn the light on because my cat brought me comfort. The scary thing that happened was it was two or three in the morning and it was really rare that I would ever wake up to go to the bathroom. My mom was often awake, but not that night. 
When I got down and started to walk to go to the bathroom, at the exact moment that I passed the basement door, my Buzz Lightyear doll started shooting and talking. I immediately went to the bathroom and I don't remember how much time I stayed in there. Even when I was in the bathroom, it was doing those noises and I was terrified. I didn't know what to do. At some moment, it was almost like the sound was getting closer and coming upstairs. I don't know if I was just hallucinating because I was really scared or if it was real. The problem is that I really don't remember how I got out of there. I really don't. I know that I probably would have just run up the stairs to get out of there as soon as I could, but I don't remember coming out of that bathroom or if the toys stopped talking and shooting, but I do remember how scared I was. It was horrible to know that I was the only one awake but at least I was okay and nothing dangerous happened to me. But it's still the worst night that I've ever had. When I was younger, I used to collect porcelain dolls they were my jam something fierce, and I got them for any sort of gift-giving holiday and just because. I had over 200 of them, ranging from brand new from the store to very old from thrift shops and tag sales. So, of course, some of them were haunted. For the most part, they weren't bad, though. One really liked a little chair I had a different doll in, and would constantly knock it out of it until I put her in it, even though she didn't fit so well. And another that was really old, but very pleasant to have around, was kind of like a guardian. I felt so much safer with her in my room. But then, there was him. Boy porcelain dolls are hard to come by. So when my stepmom found this cute magician boy at the store, she snagged him for me for some holiday. Now, he was brand new, like fresh from the store, never been opened, and there were more like him. He specifically wasn't special or odd or anything like that. I was thrilled to have him. He had a little stool that his little top hat sat on. He wore a standard little boy outfit with a generic starry magician cape and a black wand with white tips that tied to his hand to make it look like he was waving it. I put him on a shelf that was by the foot of my bed and next to the door, facing out into the room, not at my bed. One of the few open spots I had left for my ever-growing collection. That night, I had trouble sleeping and I had these weird, scary dreams. Nightmares aren't that unusual for me. I used to have them a lot when I was younger, but these were different than my usual ones. Dark and malicious, but still not abnormal. In the morning, he seemed to be facing my bed a bit more than before. I chalked it up to forgetting how I had placed him. Whatever, it was fine. The nightmares continued though, getting worse over the next several nights until I just couldn't handle it anymore. I'd wake up from something horrific and feel something malevolent staring at me from the doorway of my room, which was basically at the foot of my bed. Somehow, I just knew that it was the magician boy. He gave off this terrible vibe and the area around where I kept him just felt wrong. I finally told my stepmom what was happening and that I thought it was the boy and that I didn't want him anymore. He was too scary. She didn't disbelieve me, but she also said that I was overreacting and that since boy dolls were so hard to find, she would take him. I said yes, but I thought he should just get out of the house altogether. So she brings him downstairs to her room and sets him with the rest of her dolls also on a shelf between her bed and the door. That night, she's all snuggled up with her son, who I want to say was about three or four at the time they shared a bed, when he wakes her up in the middle of the night, a little spooked. She asked him what was wrong, and he points at the door and says, Mama, 
Who's that? I don't like him. The doll was stored in the attic the next day and sold on eBay a few days later. The weird nightmare stopped once he was gone and the scary man was never seen again. Good luck whoever bought him. My aunt has always been a lover of creepy things. She likes gory, spooky, haunted things. She's sort of the lovable oddball of the family. She's always been crazy about these things called living dead dolls. For those of you who don't know what they are, they're just terrifying looking collectible dolls. Basically purchasable nightmare fuel. She had bought a bunch of them and had them on display in her home. I've never been a fan of dolls, let alone ones meant to be scary. So this story creeps me out a lot. She ran into some financial trouble and decided to start selling things on eBay to make some extra cash for bills. As much as it broke her heart, she decided to sell one of her more popular living dead dolls on eBay. Almost immediately after she posted her doll, there was an offer. She said her goodbyes, boxed up the doll, and mailed it. No problem. A week or so later, she got the box back in the original packaging she sent it out in, but with a note saying undeliverable address, meaning she must have written it down wrong or it wasn't an acceptable place to deliver a package. My aunt figured it was just a spelling error and didn't think anything of it. She didn't open the package, she just put it in her closet. She went on eBay to try and contact the buyer. To her surprise, when she logged on, she already had a message from the buyer saying how she got the doll and how much she loved it and couldn't wait to brush its hair. She also described the doll in correct detail. My aunt was pretty freaked out. To this day, she still hasn't opened the package. It's just sitting in her closet. Edit. As a special Christmas gift, my aunt finally let me open the box. The doll was in it. Okay, so this is a story that took place when I was around eight years old in my neighborhood. I was next door neighbors with my best friend, Alex. We both went to the same school and always hung out every day after school. One day, I was bringing my Nintendo 64 to his house so that we could play together. Once I got into his house, his uncle was there watching the television so we couldn't use it. Today, I now know that he wasn't his uncle because my older sibling, who knew Alex's older sibling, told me that his parents rented out rooms to random people from their original hometown. So the uncle was just a random stranger from out of the country. He told us to go into his shed and search for an extra TV. So we opened the shed and started searching. We found an older television, but we couldn't use it. Then something started moving all the things around. We thought it was a rat, so at first we didn't mind. But then we heard laughter, something so scary that I tried to leave, but Alex told me not to worry. We kept searching around for the laughter, and we eventually found this one doll that was around two feet tall. It was torn and battered, so we figured it was just broken. We just sat it down and decided to go hook up the television we'd found in his room. We played for a while until his uncle left the house for food and his parents were at work, so we were home alone. We started hearing noises at the house, but figured it was nothing. But then we heard the laughter. The doll was moving around the house carefully, which we saw through the small peak underneath the closed door. The doll was looking for something, which was probably us. 
We were both freaking out, but we knew we had to get away from the house. We opened the window and jumped out and ran toward my house. Somehow, the doll managed to look at us as we were running away through the window and just laugh. We stayed at my house all afternoon until his parents came home. Ever since that day, I've always had experiences, weird things at my friend's house, like having YouTube videos end abruptly and start playing other random things, like clown videos. I think it's a serial commercial from the 70s. I ignored all of these weird signs for the rest of my childhood, and recently we met up for a while since departing to different high schools. Somehow the topic of the weird things was brought up, and I asked if he remembered all those things. He did remember, which now makes me want to share the story, because apparently it wasn't just my imagination. So let me start with some background information first. My mom and dad have been serving as missionaries in Ecuador for many years and currently are serving in a spiritual stronghold in a small town on the coast. My parents, in all their years as missionaries, haven't encountered many paranormal or demonic experiences, but there was one out of two experiences that kind of freaked my dad out. This story began around the time that my brother was six and I was just a newborn. My dad was driving the family home when my mom wanted to pull over to a small shop that was owned by a woman. The woman was selling homemade household items such as woven bread baskets, carved wooden sculptures, blankets, and things like that. My mom spotted a small doll that looked like an Otavalo woman one of the indigenous people groups of Ecuador. She bought it and showed it to my dad. My dad wasn't too sure about the little doll when he first saw it. He got a weird feeling in his gut once we got back on the road. A few days later, my mom hung the little doll up in front of the kitchen sink window. My dad still had that feeling in his gut, but continued to ignore it. As the day turned into night, my dad woke up from his sleep and glanced at the clock. It was one o'clock in the morning, and he decided to go to the kitchen to get a cold glass of water. As he entered the kitchen, he paused and stared at the little doll hanging in front of the window. The doll was totally still as it hung and stared back at him. My dad rolled his eyes and turned his back to open the fridge and get the jug of water. As he was getting his glass of water, and was putting the jug back in the fridge, he glanced back at the doll and his heart almost stopped. The doll was swinging back and forth all by itself. There were no windows open or any air draft within the house. The house we lived in had no central air system like American houses do. We had air units in each bedroom along with ceiling fans so there was no way that any air was making the doll swing back and forth. My dad was still in shock as he stared at this doll. Then the doll swinging started to pick up its pace, and then it started violently spinning around in circles. My dad thought it was going to fly off or break the string that it was hanging from. As the spinning around progressed, my dad remembered not to be afraid of such things so he literally drank from his glass of water and walked out of the kitchen calmly, even though his heart was beating like crazy. He didn't want fear to be picked up by the doll, and so as he walked back to the bedroom where my mom was, he prayed and asked God for protection. He also checked on my brother and I before going to bed. The following morning, he told my mom what he experienced, and my mom was horrified. That very day, they took down the doll, prayed over it against any evil that might have been within it, and wrapped it up in several plastic bags before throwing it away in the trash that was going to be taken out that day. Since that experience, my parents are much more careful with what they bring into their home. And if they do buy something like that, they pray over it to cast out any evil or demonic spirit 
that might be lurking inside. When I was younger, I would go visit my grandparents all the time. They lived in a one floor house with an unfinished basement. I never liked it down there. It felt small for a big basement. There was a little door down there that was for storage and I always got a horrible feeling when going close to it. Let me add that this was a newer house that was about six years old. Now, during the time that I was about six or seven, I felt so uncomfortable going down there. Even when I was with someone, I didn't like it. I remember going down there with my grandma to help with something. She had to run upstairs because someone rang the doorbell and she said she would be right back, even though she knew how I felt about being alone down there. But I nodded and said, okay. She was gone and I was alone and I started to get a bad feeling in the pit of my stomach. I didn't move and I didn't want to. Even though the lights were on now, it still just felt wrong. Now this is where everything started happening and it still gives me chills. The lights started to flicker and I started to hear noises and what sounded like talking. It wasn't coming from upstairs though, it was coming from the storage room. I heard somebody say my name, and this is the part that really freaks me out the most. The voice sounded like my grandma, but I was confused because how am I hearing her from the storage room when she's upstairs? I didn't want to move, but me being the curious one I am, I started moving toward the storage room door. The closer I got, the worse the bad feeling became. When I got to the door, the lights turned off in the basement. I wanted to run upstairs and hide, go home somewhere that wasn't the basement. I heard my name again for the second time, my grandma's voice asking me to open the door to help her. So I did, and I regret it. I couldn't see anything. It was pitch black. And at first, I couldn't hear anything anymore. But then I heard this faint laughing that felt like forever. But then the laughing stopped and the lights turned back on in the basement. And I felt a little bit better with them back on. On the downside, I could now see into the little storage room. I saw a small clown doll and my grandma hates clowns with a passion and wants nothing to do with them. So why there's a clown doll, I have no idea, but it was certainly not my grandma's doing. Then the lights turned on in the storage room. I saw red that looked like blood all over the place. I screamed and blacked out. And the next thing I knew, I was laying on the couch. My grandma was looking at me and asking me if I was okay. I have no idea if that was all real or if I had passed out earlier and it was some kind of dream, but it sure as hell felt real. If you have any ideas as to what I experienced, let me know. So I was going to my sister's graduation at Binghamton University and my family rented out a well-priced Airbnb for two nights. The only one that had five bedrooms because extended Chinese family. It was a Victorian era house completely decked out with Victorian American aesthetics. Trinkets, paintings of serious children, photos of even more serious people, ornate flower wallpaper and dolls, many dolls. We were picking out bedrooms and no one in the family wanted the room with the creepy dolls. I'm not superstitious and I didn't see the room and I didn't understand the gravity of the situation. So I was like, sure, I'll take the room with the dolls. You see where this is going. 
As midnight approached, I got tired, even after being energized by a tiny bite of baklava and an espresso. So I was the first to go to bed. I went into the room and saw the dolls. They were locked inside a glass case, all facing the bed. I was like, um, okay, don't be silly. Also, you're a brave trans girl and they're probably more afraid of you than you are of them because you're something they've likely never encountered before. Silly thoughts. I decided to take out my black ebony handled open L pocket knife and sleep with it at the nightstand so I would have some protection. I watched YouTube for a while, turned off the lamp and went under the covers. I felt the doll staring, but my rational side told me that it was all in my head. By 3 a.m. I was half conscious, slipping in and out of pure unconsciousness. While I was in a dreamlike state, I was aware of everything going on around me. The dolls staring. Were they next to me? I was afraid to open my eyes. I blinked. And I thought, it's okay, I have protection. I didn't dare look at the ebony handled knife on the nightstand. I was afraid that I would see a doll next to me. Then I remembered statistically, armed victims of assault tend to have their weapons taken away and used against them. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to get stabbed to death. It was at that moment that I heard vividly in a playful childlike voice, it would be my heart's desire. I immediately became alert, like R2-D2 rebooting after being in low power mode alert. Adrenaline rushed through me. I heard a ringing in my ear as my awareness went from zero to 60 in a split second. I stayed like that until the sun started to rise at around 5 a.m. That was when I fell asleep. When I woke up, I dreaded having to sleep there again for yet another night. The next night I thought, you know what? Violence begets violence. So I slept with my pocket knife in my bag instead. I fell asleep and slept through the night. So for slight context, I'm 22. And as my mom was pregnant with me, my grandfather passed away from lung cancer. The only thing he ever got me was this little clown doll that was supposed to hang over my crib. When you pull down the clown's legs, they stretch out, the whole body does, and it plays the little music box style song as it winds itself back up. The tune slowly stops over the course of about two minutes as the clown slowly goes back up to where it started. Now, I know this already sounds like a cheesy horror story setup, but stick with me. When I was a child, maybe seven or eight years old, I used to have the clown hanging from the metal curtain tiles back in my room, probably because I was too young to have read or watched it. But one night, my mom walked up the stairs and into my room while I was asleep because the clown was playing its song, but it hadn't had its legs pulled down. It apparently played for about five minutes, abruptly stopped and never wound down. I do remember that my mom had recorded it on her old flip phone and showed me in the morning. We found out later in the day that on that night, my great grandma had passed away. So my grandfather's mom. My mom is super adamant that it was her dad sending some sort of signal, but I would be interested to know what you guys think. This happened when I was about nine or 10 years old and I was really into soft stuffed animals. My step grandma was rich and pretty close with my sisters and I and lived close to us. So we would see her and my grandpa quite often and she spoiled us. We went to a store, not a secondhand store or anything, but I don't remember what store it was. 
There was a shelf of lambs with cute outfits covered in plastic flowers, with what I think was actual wool covering them. They were very cute and soft, and I immediately knew that I had to have one. I asked my grandma and she gave it to me. I was delighted and I brought the lamb everywhere I went for a while. After a few days, I sat the lamb on top of a little toy chest at the foot of my bed. One morning, I was asleep, but I woke up to the sun streaming in on my face. I looked around my room and my lamb was pacing around next to my bed. It looked like it didn't have much control over its limbs, so it was kind of stumbling. It circled around and eventually it was facing me. It looked me in the face and I don't remember anything after that. I woke up later and the lamb was where I had left it, sitting on the toy chest at the foot of my bed. I was so afraid that I buried the lamb under all of my other stuffed animals inside the toy chest and I tried my very best to never look at it. A few years later, my grandma died of leukemia and I felt extra guilty about the lamb since it was a gift from her. But I told my mom about what happened and she said I should just get rid of it. I donated the lamb to Goodwill, so hopefully it's not actually possessed because then I just made it someone else's problem. Probably everyone reading this is convinced that it was just a dream. And you're probably right. But if it was, it was one of the most vivid dreams I have ever had. It took place in my bed, where I was lying down. My messy room had all the same things sitting on the floor, as in real life. And every time I saw the lamb after it happened, I got a weird feeling and just got really uneasy and sick. It could have been a dream but it was so creepy that it still freaks me out to this day. When I was around seven, I got this stuffed animal named Sparky. I slept with Sparky every night and would carry her around everywhere. Anyway, a few years ago, one random day, I just couldn't stand to be around her. Every time I was, I would get super cold and I would get this really bad feeling. So I left her behind my bed for a few months and eventually I forgot about her. Then when I finally got her from behind the bed, she seemed normal again. That was a few years ago. She's beside me right now, and she's normal. I randomly thought a few minutes ago about when she seemed off, so I asked my pendulum if she had a spirit or something attached to her a few years ago, and it said yes. Also, I asked if it was an evil spirit, and the pendulum said yes. I just thought that was interesting, so I wanted to share. Let me start off by saying that my family and I have always thought of this to be a super strange phenomenon, but to this day, I have never been able to understand what the heck happened. When we were younger, our cousin Daniela always talked to us about how these two dolls she had were possessed and plotting to kill her. Well, one of the dolls belongs to her and the other was a porcelain Tinkerbell doll that belonged to her older sister. They shared a room, by the way. We never paid mind to it because she had a wild imagination. Fast forward into months, maybe even a year, into her telling us these stories. One weekend, my older sister and I stayed over at her house. It was four of us upstairs playing in their room and we knew to stay on Daniela's side of the room and away from her older sister's side. It was a small room though, and we were children, so we didn't listen. Somewhere in the middle of being all over the place, we knock down the Tinkerbell doll and it completely shatters. 
Immediately, we all freak out because we were told by our aunt to stay away from that side of the room, and we completely disobeyed her. Not to mention, my aunt was terrifying, so we knew we were in for a beating. We try to think of ways to fix it, but there was no way. It was completely shattered. So, realizing we're screwed, we start crying. We go downstairs and, in tears, we apologize to our aunt for disobeying her and breaking the doll. She starts yelling at us and then decides to go upstairs and clean up our mess. Well, here's where things get weird. Once she gets upstairs, she starts screaming at us again, but this time, she's calling us liars. We run upstairs and come to find out that the doll isn't shattered. It's completely intact and back to where it was before. We immediately look at each other with our jaws dropped. It was then that my cousin Daniela went from being scared with us to almost being relieved and starts saying, I told you guys I wasn't crazy. The doll's possessed. I told you, I told you. The rest of us ran out of that room and called for our parents to come and get us. After that day, we refused to go back in that house. A few years ago, I was part of a local paranormal investigation team. On one investigation, the client had several dolls among her possessions, many of which were in a display case in the living room. Upon arrival, we were doing a walkthrough to determine the hot spots for us to check out, decide camera placement, and to get some basic background information. While in the living room, the client invited us to check out a few specific dolls from the case that held particular interest to her. Three dolls were taken out of the case and looked at by a few of our team members. The one that caught my attention the most was wearing a dress and cape, had beautiful curly hair, and was about six inches tall. When I was done checking the doll out, I handed it back to the client to be returned to the case. After the normal settling that takes place after the doll is back in its spot and the case was closed, I started to turn away from the case. Two other team members and the client witnessed the next thing that happened. The doll reached out toward me as though it wanted me to pick it back up. I almost ran out of the house, but I reminded myself that I was there to help determine what was going on there. Some things were debunked as normal and other things were determined to be paranormal or unexplained. But that doll freaked me out. Two months ago, I purchased this doll. I found it at a Goodwill store and I purchased it as a Halloween decoration. Ever since, I've got some really off-putting issues going on. I started to notice whenever I had it out, like when I bought it and set it on my dresser, I would have nightmares. And I just had this weird feeling, so I would shove it in the drawer when I woke up in the night. One night, I had sleep paralysis. This happens to me every now and then, but this was the first and only time it ever involved another person. In my sleep paralysis, as I stared, paralyzed at the wall, I heard a voice say, Wake up, you two. I instantly got chills and eventually was able to get up and realized that I had put him back on the dresser. I've never been so scared. Even with all of this, it still felt like a fluke or just me psyching myself out. Until tonight. Tonight, my family and I were moving out. For three months, we'd had some dry flowers hanging from a pot rack in the kitchen. I pulled this puppet out of my drawer because I was emptying it, and I put it in the garage. 
At 6.50, we left the house to take the second truckload. Nothing abnormal. At 10.12, we got back home to find the flowers that had been in the same place for months on the floor. I told the people who helped me move. Later, my cousin sent me a picture he had taken of the puppet. I didn't realize they were playing and messing with him downstairs. When I looked at it, I realized that the flowers had fallen almost, if not exactly, where my cousin had taken that photo. Please advise. Maybe I'm just psyching myself out, but this is really weird. When I was in the first grade, I had just moved to a new foster home. I started having this nightmare every night about the devil doing really bad things to me. I remember him bringing me into his room. I remember everything. It's still vivid in my mind at 19. The weird part about it is I had an aerial doll that would move around my room ever since I had started getting this dream. It had a button on the back that would make her sing. Sometimes I would wake up with her singing on my bed when I remember putting her somewhere else. Ever since it started moving around, I have started putting it in places that I would absolutely remember putting it. On my bookshelf where my teddy bears were. Even in other rooms. But every single day, for months, when I had that dream, she would be laying somewhere else. Most of the time, in my bed, singing. The last night that I had the dream, I woke up to her walking toward me, on my bed, singing. I freaked out and ran out of the room. It's always insanely vivid in my head, and I only started telling people as an adult because I didn't know how to tell people when I was a kid. I have no idea what that was, but it still affects me to this day. I bought a haunted doll on a whim, and it's been an interesting week. Esther, which is what the previous owner said her name was, has been here since Wednesday, and we've already had little things happen. Most notably, if we leave the lights on as we leave the house, they're off by the time we get home. Doors that were closed open just slightly, as though somebody's peeking inside. Doors that were open are closed. Also, I've watched a doorknob turn and a door open twice, when I'm fully awake, standing at my desk at the time. My wife and I will have a lot of conversations along the lines of, Did you come home during the day? Nope, I've been at work all day. Okay, because I know I left the bathroom light on and the door closed, but I came home to the light off and the door open. The bedroom door is open too. This is notable because we always keep our bedroom door closed. We have an old cat that likes to sneak in and do their business under the bed. In my office during the winter, I run a space heater to keep it warmer for the reptiles. I do keep the door ajar so that the cats and dogs can come in and out. This morning, I most certainly left the door open as there were three cats and a dog in here sleeping. When I got up, I was asked if I knew that I had trapped three cats and a dog in my office by shutting the door. I said I left the door open before I went back to sleep because I knew they were in there. Oh, well, the door was open when I got up. There's been one instance of, are you humming? What? No. Well, someone's humming. We've also had numerous incidents of a light being turned off that we had left on. And this morning, I woke up to the bedroom ceiling fan being on when it had most certainly been off when I went to sleep. It takes the wall switch and pulling the light chain to have it on. And, well, no lights. And I'm 100% sure that I didn't do that before I went to sleep. Nothing scary, can't say I've ever felt unsettled by any of the above, because I grew up in a house with the ghost of my great-grandmother, 
and I'm sort of used to things like that. I'm not worried about anything actually scary happening. The woman that we got the doll from was very clear that the spirit attached was pretty much nice, very motherly, which I suppose explains turning off the lights that we leave on. Apparently it's a middle-aged woman who's really more interested in plants and pets than in causing problems for or scaring or playing tricks on people. The worse she does, according to the lady who sold her, is hum a little random tune and occasionally manifest physically. Or if you have plants in one area of your house, the doll might move to sit near them, which I haven't seen, but like I said, we have heard the humming. That's partially why I settled on that one. Just to err on the side of, I don't want a doll moving around the house, we have dogs that might mistake it for a toy, I put a small succulent garden next to her, and I set her near a window where she can see the garden we have in the yard. Not that it's much of a garden in the middle of winter, but, you know. The most surprising part is that I am completely not creeped out by the doll, and dolls usually leave me feeling very unsettled in general, haunted or not. So far, I think we'll keep her. This is my story about a haunted doll named Claire. She's been featured in the book Haunted Objects, Stories of Ghosts on Your Shelves, on a couple of paranormal podcasts, and the TV show Haunted Towns that aired on Destination America back in 2017. You can still catch reruns of the show on Travel Channel every now and then. She was in the season finale, featuring McDonough, Georgia. Here's my story. As an eight-year-old child, I was given an old porcelain doll by a very dear family friend, Miss Marion. She was all the time coming across things and giving them to me. This doll was the last thing she gave me. I was never really into dolls at all growing up, but I took the doll and placed her in my room in a small child-sized rocking chair. The chair sat next to my closet and dresser, right beside my nightlight. The doll was very pretty. She was dressed in a peach and cream colored dress with an apron and petticoats. She had little black Mary Jane shoes that, when removed, showed her delicately painted toenails. Her body was soft. Only her head, forearms, hands, and legs from the knee down were porcelain. Her lips were pink, and her dark brown hair hung in slightly frizzed and now loose curls. Her eyes were brown, her cheeks were a rosy peach color, all like mine. Miss Marion made a point of saying that the doll reminded her of me, which is why she gave her to me. From the moment that that doll, which I named Claire, came into my house, things began to happen. I was always uneasy with Claire. I never wanted to touch her, and when I played in my room, it was as if she watched me. It wasn't anything to panic about, but I do remember feeling like if I did something wrong, she might actually tell on me. How ridiculous does that sound? My first real occurrence that I remember was when I was reading in my room, ghost stories actually, when a musical carousel horse that sat on my dresser began to play. Not just a couple of notes, like old mechanical music boxes will do from time to time, but like somebody just wound it up fully. I sat, stunned, and stared at the little horse as it moved up and down in time with the music. Then it just stopped. It didn't wind down, it just stopped. I was a pretty brave kid. I didn't run, and I didn't tell my mom. I used to see a shadow man in the hallway or in my parents' bedroom door all growing up, and if she didn't believe me about that, she wouldn't believe me about something as mundane as a music box playing on its own, so I just let it go. The next thing that happened was the voice. For several nights, and on into these years, I was awoken by what sounded like a woman, inches from my face, shouting my name. 
Jill, wake up. I would jump up and sit up to find my room empty. Those happenings died down after a few months. She then started to plague my little brother with the same thing, and now that he and I are grown and gone, she's moved on to my dad. The little things started to get to me. I'd put something in a certain place, only to find it later on on the floor or on my dresser, right next to Claire. All of my missing items eventually turned up around her. Once, a ring ended up in the pocket of her apron. Books would fall off my shelves, and a perfume smell would sometimes fill my room. The doll itself didn't smell at all, but the air around her would. My catalyst to finally getting Claire out of my room was the night I woke up after hearing thumping around in my closet. I opened my eyes, sat up in bed, and of course my eyes were drawn to the nightlight where Claire sat. I realized that it wasn't coming from in the closet, but near it. As I watched, the source of the thumping became clear. The rocking chair that Claire occupied was rocking on its own. I had thick shag carpet, so there was no way this thing was just rocking by chance. If that wasn't enough, Claire's feet, which were both turned to the side facing opposite each other, slowly straightened themselves to both be pointing directly up. Twenty years later, this part still freaks me out. Then she turned her head, which was quite impossible to do since it was attached, fixed to her cloth body. She looked toward me and every music box in my room, four of them to be exact, started to play all at once. I was frozen with fear. I didn't feel endangered so much as I just felt scared of what was happening. I screamed for my mom and dad. The music stopped, but Claire maintained her gaze in my direction. And this is why I hate dolls. Even after that, I couldn't get rid of Claire totally. I ended up stuffing her in a box in the back of a storage closet. She's still there as far as I know. So is the woman who now screams my dad's name in the middle of the night. While I think she explains some of the oddities that happen in my parents' house, I don't think she's the tie to all of it, especially the shadow man. My friend Tim Weisberg is a paranormal radio and podcast host of the show Spooky South Coast, and also is an author. He asked me to lend him Claire once. He heard my story back in 2011. I obliged and Claire went to stay with him for a few months. He wrote about his experiences with Claire while she stayed with him in the book Haunted Objects that I mentioned earlier. Temperature changes in the room that she stayed in, along with hearing voices, were two of his noted encounters. Claire also stayed briefly at the Lizzie Borden Bed and Breakfast in 2012. The guys from the Haunted Towns show encountered some things in my parents' house while Claire was with them. I was really young when this happened. I don't even think I'd started going to school yet. I don't remember much about that stage of my life, but I still think about this experience to this day. It was near Christmas, and there was a doll that my younger sister and I looked forward to playing with every year. It was an angel, where if you pressed a button, she would sing Silent Night. The thing is, though, once I was done playing with it, I had to return it downstairs. My parents eventually realized that we had forgotten to bring it down, so I was sent upstairs alone to retrieve it. As I went up to my room to get it, I heard the doll sing Silent Night. The doll had a history of going off on its own, so I thought nothing of it. I went up and opened the door. My room was completely dark at the time, but when the light from the hallway came on, it shined on the pitch black figure of a little girl who was playing with the doll. The girl immediately turned her eyes on me 
and I stared back at her, shocked. My vision blurred, and my ears were ringing, and the next thing I knew, I had to pick myself up from the ground. Nobody seemed to notice that I hadn't come back downstairs. Confused and unable to comprehend what had happened, I would just go downstairs with the doll, seeing as the girl had left. I returned the doll and carried on with my day because I had no idea what had happened. It wasn't until I looked back on it when I was older that I realized just how terrifying that was. So, I know this is really weird, but I have always been obsessed with the idea of having a haunted item. So I went on eBay and I did a very thorough search of trusted sellers and stores where I might buy haunted items. I eventually settled on my doll Evelyn because the seller stated that the vessel was inhabited by the spirit of Evelyn, who died at age 17 and had hopes of going to college and being a teacher. I felt a connection to her there because I am currently a senior at university and I'm about to start working as an English teacher. I hope to read to Evelyn often and ask her advice for my lesson plans. I even fantasize about giving her a place in the classroom to sit so she can still achieve her dreams. Update. So the first day and night with Evelyn and I only have a couple of out of the ordinary things to report. First off, my cat won't stop rubbing against the doll or sniffing it. And secondly, I fell asleep last night with my TV on, watching South Park on Hulu, which means that my DVD player was also on. I woke up at 1am to both of those things being shut off. Now I know that there's probably a logical explanation for that, but honestly, I'm kind of hoping it's just her. Update Night 2 Nothing happened last night that I know of, except that I woke up at 2am for no reason, but that's becoming typical for me anyway. Today as I was getting ready for class, I turned on a paranormal story time on YouTube. Right after, my door that had been shut opened by itself about a quarter of the way. My cat and I both shot our heads to the door when that happened to look. And I know y'all will probably say I'm stupid for this, but I used the ghost radar app, and it said that there was an entity right in the direction of where my door is. I'll let you know if there are any further updates. About a week or so ago, I received an Elmo doll. I was on vacation, visiting a few relatives, and my 90-year-old great-aunt gave me this red Elmo plush. At first, everything was normal about it, nothing out of the ordinary. However, the activity began when I returned back home. I placed the doll on my bed and lay down to sleep for the night. During the night, I began to see shadows moving across my room and a feeling that I was being watched. Of course, I at first thought I was just imagining things, so I brushed it off. The next night, however, things started to get weird. The number of shadows moving around my room increased, and I felt like there was something standing over me, watching me. I put two and two together and grabbed the doll. My stomach began to feel nauseous. A sense of anxiety filled me when I held the doll and I felt like a negative energy was being transferred into my body. I immediately removed the doll from my room and placed it in a different area of the house. I told my parents, but they just joke about it and think I'm crazy. But I swear there's something wrong with this doll, and I have no idea how to go about investigating it.
This happened when I was in the fourth grade, during Christmas time, around 2014. I live in Salem, Oregon, which is relevant to the story. Downtown, there's this antique store called The Unicorn. We went there to get my older brother World War II stuff for Christmas, because he likes that kind of thing. It's a really big store for an antique shop, so like normal kids, my brother and I went off to explore. Around the front of the shop, past a couple of bookcases, was this kids section. It was mostly full, with old board games and those tin toys, like those red geese with blue hats. What I did find was this old doll with a sticker on its face, just all dirty and broken. It said, Cursed Doll, on this piece of paper, with a warning sign at the bottom. I don't really remember what the warning sign said. Being ten years old, I just looked at it and called Bull, and then flicked the glass and told the doll that it needed Jesus. Later that night, I went to sleep and had a dream of a green face in a dark background that kept trying to eat me. I woke up all gross and sweaty, but I realized that the bathroom light was on. My room is connected to the bathroom, so it's not outside my room in the hallway like in most people's houses. So when I woke up, I could clearly see the light reflecting off my wall. I could hear the light switch being turned on and off, but the light was still on. Eventually the light turned off, but the switch kept on flicking. Then the banging on my wall happened, and it lasted for a good two minutes. It just kept getting louder and louder, and then all I remember is not being able to breathe and passing out. When I woke up the next morning, I asked my brother why he kept banging on my wall. He said that he was at a friend's house last night, so he couldn't have banged on the wall. That scared the crap out of me. I told my dad what happened, and he believes that I pissed off whatever possessed that doll or made it cursed. I don't really mess with that stuff anymore, but cool story, I guess. My uncle was such a sweet guy that for my 18th birthday, he gifted me with a creepy but adorable porcelain clown sitting on a swing. It had two red dots on the cheeks, a red nose, a frilly costume, and white gloves. It had a pointed hat and brown curly hair. What he didn't know was that I had an extreme fear of clowns, and I still do. I accepted it anyway because it was such a sweet gift. I hung it up on my curtain rod, kind of proud that he had even thought of me at all, because it was rare that he gave me presents. The first week was fine, but after that, weird things began to happen. I started to grow creeped out by this doll to the point where I wouldn't even get dressed in my own room. There were a few times where it would swing on its own. I never opened my window, so I know that it wasn't the wind and it wouldn't have been able to swing without some sort of force. Several times I would walk out of the room and come back in to find that the head had twisted to look outside my door. For a long time, I thought it was my family members playing a joke on me because they knew that I didn't like clowns, so I just grinned and put up with it. I also locked my door from the inside with one of those bolt locks, just in case. I did this for a couple of months. One morning, it was taken too far, and it was the last straw for me. I woke up and hit something with my hand. I turned my head to come face to face with the clown doll. I looked at the curtain rod, but it definitely was not there. The only way it could have been brought down was if you lifted the rod and took the doll off by the swing ring. I know for a fact that my family didn't do it, because my bedroom door was still bolted shut. I had had enough, and I took the doll and threw it in the big bin, and then put it on the verge for the bin man to come that day. I told my uncle that I had accidentally broken it when I was putting it away to paint my room. I actually regret doing that, 
I kind of wish I had kept it. I was creeped out by stuff like that when I was younger, but now I love haunted stuff and creepy things. I kind of wish I had it hanging in my house. When I was about eight or nine, my entire family went to a quinceanera. I guess we were good enough friends with the birthday girl that we received the quince doll, which is basically meant to look like the birthday girl. To give you an image of what it looked like, imagine a doll with a white dress and curly hair. We kept it in the living room where I slept on the floor, which is another story. And my brothers and I always had some weird feeling about it like it was watching us. I'd say around three to four months of it being in the living room is when I started to notice weird things happen in not only the living room, but also in both of my brother's rooms. I'll start with my experiences first. Like I mentioned before, I used to sleep in the living room. I would lay down near my parents' door and I would start to hear the strangest noises coming from near the TV or near the small cabinet that we put the doll on display. From hearing things in the kitchen fall on the floor to hearing a little girl laugh on the couch, a lot of weird things started to happen. I pretty much tried to ignore all of this with tears in my eyes, doing what kids do when they're scared. I covered myself with a blanket, but one experience will forever haunt me, and I still get chills thinking about it. I was crying one night for Lord knows what. My brother tells me it's because I was claiming I heard voices near my ear. My parents didn't believe me and told me that I was delusional. He invited me into his room to sleep, and I jumped at the opportunity. Just before entering his room, I went to the restroom. It's literally right next to my brother's room. While I was in there, I felt someone's hand right on my shoulder. I immediately turn around and get freaked out. I hurried up and got out of there, but that wasn't the worst thing. I entered his room and slept on his bed while he just played on the PS3. I slept from maybe around 20-ish minutes to 30 before waking up to him coming in the room with food. I kid you not, the moment he sat down, the closet door swung open with enough force to hit the wall. We looked at each other in disbelief about what we just saw. My dad bursts in to ask what the hell was going on. We tried explaining it to him, but he just shook it off and told us to go back to sleep. He walked out of the room and my brother continued to play. We were trying our best not to talk about it when we hear the toilet just flush on its own, along with the shower curtain moving. Mind you, nobody was in there. We would have known since the door always creaks open and shut with a pretty distinct sound. That room, I'd like to say, is where most of the activity always happened. The guy that we let rent out that room always said he was scared of it, but because he needed a place to stay, he just dealt with it. That was my experience when I was younger. But now, let me tell you about my older brothers. I'll start with the youngest of my older brothers. We'll call him Dave. Dave slept in the room on the other side of the house, completely away from the doll, but with a massive window that had a hole within the curtains. He had things happen in the afternoon, like tools being thrown from one side of the room to the other the TV falling, and unexplainable scratches on his chest. But the one thing that scared the heck out of me was that he had this dream. In the dream was the girl in the white dress. Let me clarify, not the doll, but a girl. This happened to both of my brothers. The dream started off normally, until he noticed the white-dressed girl at his school and went near her. She turned around and, as he remembers, she didn't have eyes. It was just black holes and she had a sad expression on her face. He woke up to my parents trying to calm him down. 
I remember being right outside his room, peeking in. He was legit crying his eyes out, and I've never seen him act that way before. I have another older brother. We'll call him Mark. I believe that he had the worst of it, since he slept not even five feet away from the doll. He also had a dream about the girl in the dress and the doll as well. But his dream wasn't scary, just anxiety-inducing, in my opinion. All he remembers is sitting at the dinner table. The doll was not too far away from the table. It was right in front of the table, if I remember correctly. The girl with the white dress was sitting across from him, with the doll next to her. Apparently the doll was blinking, and the girl was emotionless, not blinking whatsoever. This is when he started to hear a clock tick. It ticked and ticked and ticked until he suddenly woke up in a cold sweat. But the problem was, when he woke up, the doll wasn't in the cabinet. Instead, it was right in front of him. He screamed and threw it toward the closet, breaking the head of the thing. My mom came in and thought somebody had broke in. She saw the doll with the broken head on the floor. And the creepiest thing was that the doll was upright, with the head right behind it. While she was extremely angry, she was just glad that he was safe, and she threw the doll out. That was the end of it, really. A few more things did happen, but nothing as bad as what I just told you about. Needless to say, we're glad the doll is gone. Ever since I was five years old, I've had an extreme fear of dolls. I am terrified of them. Now, I know that there are a lot of people who are, but when I reached the age of about 16, my mother finally told me where my fear may have come from. It's from a personal experience. To this day, I can never fully answer whether I believe in the paranormal or not. But my personal experience with a doll given to me by an aunt who practiced black magic haunts me until this day. When my mom told me this tale, I had minor flashbacks of the feeling that I had with this specific doll. From the first day I was born, I never slept properly. Never did, never have, and probably never will. I didn't cry or anything when I was awake early. I would just quietly play with my hands and wait for my mom to come get me. I did this from when I was an infant until I was a toddler. Around age five, we had an aunt from my biological father's side visit us. Now, keep in mind that I have nothing to do with my biological father, and this aunt may have wished my mother harm. Fijians from that generation are typically very superstitious and many of them believe in black magic. The things I began to do made us believe that there was something very wrong with this porcelain doll that she had given me as a gift. My mom began to notice that I would spend a lot of time with the doll. My younger brother, who would have been around one to two years old at that time, spent a lot of time with my mom. I was a very jealous child when he was first born, so at first, she wasn't too surprised that I spent my time away from them. One morning, she came to my bedroom and was surprised that I wasn't there. Like I said before, no matter what time I was awake at, I never got up without her. We had a basement that my brother and I were strictly forbidden from opening and going into because the stairs were spaced quite far apart and being small, we could easily have fallen through or down onto the concrete. She had a lock put up on the high door, just in case. Besides that, the basement was freaky as hell, and I never even wanted to go in there alone. Ever. This particular morning, along with noticing that I was not in my usual place waiting for her, she noticed that this freakish doll wasn't there either. Before she called out my name, she heard me sniveling, downstairs. As she climbed the stairs down toward me, she saw that doll sitting on the couch. She heard my crying get louder. 
As she got closer, she saw that I was trying to open the basement door lock while crying. Sharissa, what the heck are you doing? Didn't I tell you to never go down there without me? I started screaming and crying and ran to bury my face in her dress with relief. Such relief that she was there to stop me. I kept telling her, Mommy, the doll made me. The doll made me. Through my tears. I have no idea what this doll's name is anymore, but I apparently was saying the name of the doll instead of the doll. My mom, who is not a believer, was thoroughly creeped out because she said that my tears and hysterical crying were not that of a child trying to find an excuse for getting caught doing something bad, but actual relief of being saved. She packed me up and we were off to my grandma's house, without the doll. We got rid of that doll stat. I know that this is a hard story to believe for anybody. I probably would have just played it off as me being a child and trying to blame the doll for getting caught. But I know that I never dared to get up without my mom, because I was scared to get up by myself, and I liked the attention of her coming to get me out of bed every morning. I also have very creepy memories of some things about that doll that I'm still too scared to even think about, let alone write down. This is a very long story, but it's worth telling, and I hope I can find some answers. I live in the state of Georgia, in a rural town not too far from a major city. There's a set of woods that's behind our house, and it divides two neighborhoods. It's about a mile wide, if that. Strange occurrences have always surrounded these woods. Small things like random trash, tarps, etc. show up seemingly without warning. I should mention that it's more swampy marsh than woods, so it makes camping in there impossible. One night, I was taking our dog out. He stays in the back half of the house due to him not liking the other dogs. I took him out the side door and walked around the house to the fence. For some reason, when we left the house, he was absolutely terrified. He didn't want to go out. Very unusual for a dog who's quick to snatch someone's soul if prompted. Not thinking about it, we pushed onward. After he tinkled, we walked back. This is when I noticed it, or rather heard it, the crunching of leaves. At first I thought it was one of the dozen cats on our property, until I realized that it was matching my steps. If I walked, it would walk. If I stopped, it stopped. There's a small clearing between the woods where one of the sheds is, and that's when we saw it. My dog was the first to see something, and then I saw some creature of some kind. It was taller than the shed, so maybe a good eight feet tall, and it darted across the clearing at a crazy fast speed. My dog, who again isn't scared of anything, bolts so fast that I dropped his leash. He ran in the door, whining. I was quickly behind him. Once we were inside, I bolted the door, and I ran to tell my girlfriend what had happened. She immediately wanted to investigate, saying that it was probably a woodland creature. Armed with two flashlights, we went out the front door. As we walked toward the wood line, we could hear something moving around. It sounded maybe 200 yards away. As we scanned with our flashlights, we saw nothing but kept hearing it. Then we heard it get closer and closer until it was maybe 20 feet away, but still nothing. No eyes, not even an animal call, just rustling. My girlfriend, now scared, heads for the house. I decided to check with the neighbors to see if maybe one of their many dogs had gotten out. When I arrived at his house, my neighbor, who we'll call Dave, explained that all his dogs were accounted for, but he was curious, so he came to investigate. This is when I noticed that whatever this thing was had followed me along the wood line to Dave's house and was now behind his house. Gun in hand, we went into the backyard scanning for something. We could hear it rustling, or maybe running, about a hundred yards away in the thick, swampy woods. 
way too thick for a person to walk in, let alone run in. And then it stopped. It was dead silent. Scanning and on edge, we hear and see nothing. And then, bam. All of a sudden, it was five feet in front of us, sprinting at me. It slammed the fence so hard that it rocked it back and forth. Dave, scared shitless, shot randomly at, well, nothing. We never saw it. We never heard it get close to us. Again, as I mentioned, the woods are thick too thick to run in, so what teleported silently in front of us and slammed into the gate? Spooked, we were about to run, but then we heard it. It was human in nature, but not English. A language sounded alien-like, but not a known language, that's for sure. Dave, a hunter for the last 40 years, still to this day cannot explain what that was. Anyway, after we heard that, we bolted. He covered me and I ran to the house. Not ten minutes later, we both hear a loud explosion coming from the woods. It shook our houses and flickered our power. I ran outside to see what it was and, of course, nothing. But when Dave came out and confirmed that he felt the same thing, we were both once again terrified. Moments later, a few strangers from the neighborhood came driving down to our cul-de-sac and they all agreed that the blast sound that they heard came from behind our house. 911 was called, and the two police officers interviewed us separately. Our stories matched. The responding officers refused to go anywhere near those woods. They took the report and left. To this day, we're still not sure what that encounter was. Also, Dave doesn't go outside at night anymore. That's how bad it spooked him. The next night, earlier in the day, my mother-in-law and a police officer for a town 40 minutes away installed two motion-activated trail cams along the wood's edge. They were brand new. Keep that in mind. Thinking maybe we would see something, we waited for nightfall. Later that evening, I went outside to feed our outdoor cats. That's when I heard it again, rustling. This time, not taking any chances, I ran inside and told everyone what I heard. They all piled by the back door and urged me to go out there and look. Reluctantly, I agreed. I took my flashlight and walked to the edge of the woods. Knowing that there was a trail cam covering this area, I figured if it got me, it would be on camera and my sacrifice wouldn't be for nothing. As I got to the woods edge, I could still hear it rustling. I'm shaking at this point because I could tell it was maybe less than 15 yards in front of me. Everyone at the door was just watching me and could hear this thing. And then it was quiet. For a moment, it was gone. Or so I thought. Just as I'm scanning with my flashlight, trying desperately to see a normal woodland creature so I can laugh this whole thing off, boom. Something fell out of a tree and hit the ground so hard that it shook the soil beneath my feet. It was so close that I was sure it was going to lunge out of the brush and snag me. I dropped my flashlight and ran the hundred yards back to the house in what felt like two seconds. I just kept screaming, Get in the house! Get the F in the house! As everyone was already scampering inside. They had heard and felt the thud too. Our neighbor Dave called my mother-in-law to ask what that loud crash was. For him to have heard it from well over 700 yards away is insane to me. Once the adrenaline died down, we realized that this happened right next to the trail cam. Problem solved, right? We got the evidence of this thing. The next morning, we checked the SD cards on the trail cam. Both of the cams had videos up until 11.47 p.m. The rest is corrupted. They were brand new trail cameras and brand new SD cards. We reset everything and set them back up, and to this day, we've still never encountered the creature again or caught anything on camera.
I bought a little porcelain doll at the Salvation Army this past weekend. I used to collect them as a little girl, and it was cheap, so why not? I wanted something to scare the trick-or-treaters that came into work. Since I've had the doll, I've had a horrible time sleeping. My house feels strange, and when I'm up at night and alone, I feel uneasy. I'm sleeping with the covers over my head. Any small sound makes my heart flip, and I can't sleep very well. It reminds me of the terrible nights I had sleeping as a child and being afraid. Even during the day, when I'm alone and getting ready for work, I feel so off in the house. It's been the past few days since I've bought that doll and kept her in the house. Today I brought her into work, and I'm hoping that the strange feelings I have at home will subside. Maybe I'm just being jumpy, since it's Halloween, but I'm 26 and I haven't had these feelings since I was a child. Has anybody else had a similar experience? When I was younger, between the ages of 7 to 10, I lived in a small house in Missouri. We lived in a small town. Nothing was abnormal about the house. I mean, there were the normal house settling noises which would cause me to have nightmares frequently, but nothing else. Until this incident, the only weird thing that had ever happened was our keys had gone missing. When you walked in the door, there was a giant metal wood stove that we would put our keys on. They went missing for weeks. We destroyed the house looking for them. And one day, they just reappeared and nobody knew where they came from. Anyway, there was a doll back when I was younger called an Amazing Grace doll. She had holes in her ears so that she could hear you and she would turn her head to wherever the noise had come from and would say, Mama. Well, I loved this doll. I explicitly remember cleaning my room and propping Grace against the wall so she was sitting up. I laid down on my bed to read, and I heard the clicking she would make when her head turned. So I looked up and stared at her and got the normal mama that she would say after she heard something. So I tossed my book down and picked her up to make sure that she was turned off. She was. So I flipped her switch and then flipped it back to off, thinking that this was just a normal malfunction. I sit her back in her spot and plop down to continue reading. It's completely quiet. As soon as I start reading, I hear the sound of her head moving again and she says, Mama. So I went and took out all of her batteries. I was over it at this point, so I just kind of tossed her on the ground and got back into my spot. That's when she started clicking quicker. Her head was moving back and forth, back and forth, and she just kept saying, Mama, Mama. I took off. I ran to get my dad, and he saw it and decided that we would burn the little doll. We did, and nothing happened again to my recollection, but my nightmares got worse. This was when I was still religious so I would put all my stuffed animals around me in a circle to protect me. I had a turquoise dream catcher, and I would pray every night for the nightmares to go away. They never did, until we moved. They weren't every day, but definitely several times a week. Regardless, I was very glad to get out of that house and away from that doll. My wife and I have been having a lot of paranormal activity. After moving into a wooded area just outside of Pittsburgh, everything started. Our house is isolated from the neighborhood. That only makes the fear of something terrible happening even worse. I would like to point out that my wife and I are logical, rational thinkers who are educated to some degree. 
Since we can't explain these events, and we fear ruining people's perception of our family, we've turned to all of you. All of these experiences have happened while sober and within the past two years. There's a lot, so please give us a chance and let us know what you might think it is. Incident 1. First things first, animals dying in the wild is common. Duh. But hearing the screams of struggle and pain, almost as if the animal is being tortured, I don't know if that's normal, but the sound sends chills down my back. This incident happens frequently. Incident 2. When we're walking in the woods, accompanied by my wife and kids, I stumble upon a small clearing in the trees. Under the leaves were children's shoes, shoes that were worn out as if they'd been there for a very long time. Incident 3. This one is hard to believe, and trust me, I know. I was in denial and didn't tell my wife what I had seen for weeks because it just sounded so fake and I didn't want to catch any flack for seeing whatever it was. Smoking a cigarette out of the second floor bathroom window last fall, while scrolling on my phone, I had that feeling as if someone is staring at you. I glanced away from my phone to look. I caught, in my peripheral vision, a humanoid-type being. I used peripheral because before I could really focus on it to see it, it bolted into the woods behind my house on the east side. I was completely caught off guard and terrified. I didn't even watch it run into the woods. I looked straight ahead and acted like I'd never seen it, like a deer in headlights. I acted like scared prey. This creature was not human, and that's why I was so deeply terrified. It was tall and had shoulders and a head, no hair, and a color of skin that I couldn't really make out, but it just wasn't normal, you know? It's weird because my brain didn't know what to do. I couldn't process it fast enough. I just stared completely ahead and stayed straight, completely frozen from fear. Hearing the strides this thing had was unexplainable, and the speed that it had, rilling through with such ease in the middle of the night in the woods, is beyond human. I don't know what it was. Months go by. I was in the same bathroom window where my wife and I tend to smoke when we don't want to go outside at night. We opened the window to smoke, but it sounded like it was pouring rain. Both of us were completely confused because no water was falling from the sky at all. I walked downstairs to go outside to try to understand what was happening. The garden hose was on and the handle was pushed into the dirt, shooting water into the trees above, making a surprisingly loud raining sound. We have no idea how that happened. Incident number five. This is another ongoing incident. Basically, we always feel watched at night. In the daytime, the woods are normal and somewhat peaceful, but at night, it's totally different. You have that constant eerie feeling that you're being watched. Incident six. At this moment, we've become interested and are sitting by our window every night trying to find explanations as to what humanoid thing that was. We were in mid-conversation on a random subject when a loud crack came from the ground right below us. The noise was loud enough and close enough to make both of us jump. We were super scared and locked the window and decided to stop for the night. It sounded like a bat or an axe, maybe, hitting a tree really, really hard. From the humanoid creature to this loud sound, we've become so afraid that we actually have our children sleep in our room. Incident number seven. As we were laying in our bed, my wife woke me up at 2 a.m., freaking out, saying that she smelled burning plastic and thought that something was on fire. We have a two-story house and had our bedroom window cracked. We looked outside where we thought the smell was coming from. That's when we saw a lit up triangular shaped thing in the back of the house, deep into our woods. It was orange lights and blue lights and orbs next to it. You could see shadows of people walking around this thing. We immediately thought of a cult. We were so scared we were about to call the cops, but doubt set in when we double checked the window. So we never ended up telling anybody. Incident number eight. 
After all of this, we still have to stay active, so we went on a walk one evening with the children around the neighborhood. Noticing that the sun was setting, we headed home. Obviously, this place is weird, so who would want to be outside in the dark? We got to our gravel driveway, which is about a hundred yards, tall trees on one side and bushes and smaller trees on the other. As we're walking about 15 feet onto the driveway, we notice bats flying down left to right and right to left. We'd only ever seen up to this point maybe a couple in our yard, feeding off the bugs, I guess. I started to walk down the driveway. My wife stayed behind, opposing this idea. The farther down I got, the scarier it became. I had completely underestimated the amount of bats. I started running because my children became frightened. As I start running, bats, and I'm not kidding, began to line their flight path with my head. They would turn away probably five feet from my face, maybe closer. This was completely terrifying. As I'm trying to avoid these demons, I hear my wife screaming as she flies past me and beats me home. My daughter, on the verge of tears, was saying that she was so scared she thought she was going to pee her pants. Now, before everybody loses their mind, I know that bats are docile and pose absolutely no threat to humans despite rabies. These bats were not acting like normal docile bats, which is why this was so weird. I cannot explain why or how it happened, but it was as though something went off in their brains that just said, attack, or at least make us really afraid. They came in a line at us and then veered off right at the last. I've certainly never heard of that happening, and I know that's not normal. So, we didn't treat them like docile bats because they weren't acting like docile bats. Incident number nine. I didn't personally see this, but it was weird and doesn't add up, so I'll include it. One Sunday, my parents were over for dinner. When I came back down to talk to my wife, I said, Yo, my mom said she saw some chubby girl with a black sundress come out of the woods walk in the tree line and then go further down. This lady came out of the north side of the house, like east northeast. I know it's hard to picture if you don't know what the property looks like, but that's what happened. The odd part of this is that the northern tree line of the property is pretty rough terrain. Steep hills, torn bushes, loose soil. It would be hard to hike it, let alone in a sundress. Although about a mile and a half north through the woods, you do pop out right outside of a small town. So, I suppose it could be rational, but it still seemed really odd with everything happening. Most people wouldn't go hiking through that kind of terrain dressed like she was. The last incident, so far anyway, is that if either one of us goes to smoke at night, at the window in our bathroom, we always hear this kind of bell. It kind of sounds like a symbol. Being skeptical, we thought it was wind chimes. We've looked, though, and there are no wind chimes at my neighbor's house. It's the only neighbor we have, for about 200 feet in between each other on our south side. The bells are coming from the southeast side of the property, and this is something else that we cannot explain. We're pretty scared, and as you can tell, it's pretty unbelievable what's going on. We don't really know what to do. All these weird things just keep happening, and we're afraid that it could escalate or take a turn for the worse. It's already overwhelming. So overwhelming that it's the only thing we've been able to talk about for a long time now. Anyway, if any of you have any idea what could be going on, let us know. I live in the suburbs of Dublin, Ireland, where I'm surrounded by greenery, beautiful hiking trails, and lots of Celtic mysticism. One particular hiking trail is called the Hellfire Club. There's a lot of stories that have been passed on from generation to generation as to where it got the name. But the most popular, as far as I'm aware, is that on top of the mountain where the trail passes, is an old, completely deteriorated stone house. Legend has it that back in the day, 
It was a hangout spot where men would drink, play cards, and have a merry old time. One night, a group of men were playing cards, and a stranger asked if he could join in. During the game, one of the men dropped a card, bent down to pick it up off the ground, and realized the stranger that had joined them had hoofed feet. So, present day, this trail is very popular for hikers and campers. This particular day, three friends decided to go camping and set up tent beside an old hunting lodge. After a few hours, they noticed that someone had set up camp quite close by. Not weird, but maybe a little odd. This guy decided to approach the three campers and introduce himself, and ended up chatting with them for a few hours. After some time had passed, one of the campers decided that they needed more firewood. The stranger went with him and the other two went off in another direction. As the camper was about to get firewood, he was grabbed from behind by the stranger, who put his left hand across his mouth and attempted to cut his throat with the knife. He was sliced across the throat three times before he managed to push the attacker away. He fell to the ground and was then stabbed in the chest. The knife broke, leaving the blade embedded in his chest. The other two realized something was happening and tried to intervene, one being knocked to the ground and the other escaping to go get help. The cops were called and went searching for the guy who they eventually found. It turned out that he had recently spent a lot of time in a mental institution, suffered from a deep-seated mental illness, paranoid schizophrenia, and he had had an acute psychotic episode that day. As far as I know, he got locked up for a few years, but this happened about 10 minutes away from my house. Horror movies come to life. I don't know if these two events are connected, but people say the Hellfire Club in that area, which also happens to be where these people were camping, is cursed. About 15 years ago, I lived in Sulphur, Oklahoma. My playground? The Chickasaw National Recreation Area. I loved that park so much. I rode more miles on my bike there than anywhere else. I've walked nearly every trail and ridden nearly every road. Every day I would ride my mountain bike up and down the trails and would be home by nightfall most days. One night, however, I had ridden out a bit further than usual. On my way back, however, I decided to ride the trail from an area known as Buffalo Springs. As the name suggests, they have live buffalo roaming and there's a large spring and fountain for all to enjoy. As I was riding back, I knew the end of the trail was coming up, and I would have to cross a stone bridge across the creek and then up the road to my home. It was dark at this time and all I had to see by was the full moon. I was maybe a few hundred yards from it when I got a sharp pain in my left thigh. I stopped and looked around to see what had just hit me. Then I heard a noise sounding like something hitting the ground hard in front of me. There was a rock, about the size of a baseball, rolling across the trail. Me being confused, I looked up the side of the hill. Just as I turn to look, I almost fall off my bike when another rock comes flying down hitting my front wheel. I finally get my eyes to adjust to look and see someone very tall and dark and covered in hair at the top of the hill, throwing things at me and screaming. I yelled that I had a cell phone and was going to call the police. I didn't actually have one as I didn't have a cell phone yet. This seemed to have pissed him off. He started charging down the hill at me. For obvious reasons, I lit up my bike and took off. Just as I crossed the bridge, I heard a huge splashing noise in the creek. I saw that it was a huge rock that had been thrown. I was in the clear to home, but was frightened all the way there. I went to the ranger station later the next morning and told a ranger I knew there about what happened. He said, So you're telling me you were attacked by Bigfoot? He started snidely laughing. I said, 
Listen, I don't know what it was, but something was trying to hurt me out there. The ranger just laughed. Okay, Justin, if we have any more Bigfoot, I'll let you know what we get. I said fine and left. The very next week, I was riding in the daylight when the park ranger pulled up next to me and told me to get in. I asked him why, and he said he needed to show me something. We headed to the police department in town. Before we got out of the car, he turns to me and says, Justin, I owe you a huge apology. I'll be honest, I didn't believe you when you told me the story of how you were attacked, but it's come to my attention that a couple was out in the same area last night, and they were attacked in the same way, saying they had seen a large hairy creature throwing rocks and sticks and screaming at them. They called the police and they came out with some of the other rangers, myself included. I immediately thought about what you told me. When we arrived and started up the hill, sure enough, we were having rocks and things thrown at us. Guns drawn and yelling, two officers tackled a man to the ground. He was six foot five, naked, covered in mud, had long hair and a large beard. Turns out he had escaped from the Veterans Center across Veterans Lake. Apparently, in his mind, he thought he was back in Vietnam and he was trying to, quote, take out the enemy. The park ranger said that I was very lucky because while he wasn't Bigfoot, he was trying to kill me. We went inside so I could give the police my statements as to what had happened. They had to send him somewhere to a more secure facility and... To this day, I still get shivers when I hike that trail, and I always keep my eyes on the ridge top. I definitely feel bad for the guy. That was also one of the scariest things I've ever experienced in the backwoods. This is a story that my mother and aunts told me when I was in high school. I'm 21 now, and it has never left me. I think about it constantly and ponder over what happened. My grandfather passed close to a year ago in June of 2020. He was 96 when he died, and it caused some issues in my family. They don't really pertain to the story, but there are some things about him that I have to share in order to explain the story in the best way. My grandfather, John, was a man who was extremely calloused and old-fashioned. He was bitter, abusive, and a complete macho man. My mother was raised never showing emotion or pain due to his abuse and lack of compassion for others. He had many secrets in my family that are now coming to light after his death. Everything that happened around him was brushed off and forgotten because he had more important things to do, like drinking or having affairs. Just an overall intense and very no-nonsense type of man. He was also not religious at all and found things like faith or hope stupid. This story takes place sometime in the 70s, most likely early to mid-70s. My mom was born in 65 and remembers this story clearly. My aunts, as well, remember this happening, but nobody knows exactly what year. One summer day, John decided to take his family on a small outing with the intent to have a picnic in the woods. My mother, her three sisters, and her mother and my grandmother were all there and very excited about this. Where we're from, my family is more accustomed to the woods and has lived in this area for generations. Going into the woods for a fun family activity was nothing out of the ordinary and seemed to be just another normal day. They made their way down a dirt backwoods road and stopped once they found a clearing large enough to accommodate them. As all the kids started jumping out of the car and messing around, as kids do after being stuck together, my grandmother began unloading their food and picnic supplies. John began surveying the area and deciding where to set up. As he was doing that, something in the woods past the clearing caught his eye. Before going to see what was out there, he yelled to the family and said he would be right back. The kids and my grandmother thought not much of this, since they're all used to the woods, and these woods in particular were very familiar to them. 
They continued unloading and setting up the stuff that they had brought. One of the girls pointed out something in the clearing that caused a sudden shift from a normal day to something worse. It was a dirt mound that looked like something was buried under it. This mound was about the size of a small person, maybe even child-sized. It was too big to simply be any animal in these woods. There were nothing but squirrels and raccoons in the area. Scattered amongst the mound were larger river rocks. There was no pattern, but they were definitely placed on the mound intentionally. Also, the dirt seemed to be fresh, as though just buried. It was loose and slightly darker than the area around it. The mood immediately shifted to something dark. My grandmother became concerned and told the girls to stay away from it. She was clearly upset and worried about it, but did her best to ignore it. The girls, all being children, didn't have the same amount of worry and continued playing while just avoiding the mound. They tried to return to their picnic, and the girls were already chasing each other in circles again. It was supposed to be a joyous, sunny day, and my grandmother wanted to keep it that way. Things seemed to return to normal for a beat. The trees around them created a wall of dense foliage, blocking their view from anything inside the forest. One of the girls again took notice of something strange. It was clear immediately what it was. Along one of the long branches of the tree hung a noose. It was tied with a rope and hung high above their heads. A lump of dirt can be explained away by nature, but someone had to have placed the noose there. My grandmother stopped dead in her tracks when she first saw it. Something was wrong. Very, very wrong. They couldn't just pack up and leave. John was still out in the woods. Even children can recognize a noose as a symbol of death. The children started to become very anxious. Whatever innocence was keeping them from worrying about the mound had completely vanished. My grandmother, the resilient woman that she is, soothed her children and told them that it was just left by deer hunters. But she knew in her heart that they needed to leave. No deer hunter would hang a deer and then bury it. At least, no sane deer hunter. It wasn't until they started hearing something in the woods that they really began to panic. My grandmother, as well as all the children, began hearing a rhythmic chanting from deep inside the woods. It sounded as though there was a group of people all singing in deep voices to the beat of a drum. It went in a quick bum 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 pattern. Three steady beats followed by a pause, and then it would repeat. It sounded far away, but immediately fear began to take hold of each of them. They each listened and gathered together. As the seconds passed, it began to increase in volume. It was getting not just louder, but closer. What started out as a distant echo soon began to engulf the entire clearing. My grandmother was terrified and wanted so desperately to leave, but John had yet to return. They waited, fear-ridden, as the sound began to fill their chests. It felt like they were at a concert as the deep bass began to vibrate within them. It was everywhere and constant, as though the sound was being made by the trees themselves, surrounding the family in every direction. Suddenly, the sound of yelling broke through the constant drone of chanting. John's voice was yelling out to them from the trees. Go, he yelled. Get in the car. He came running out of the woods, yelling that they needed to leave. They had never seen terror on this man as they had at that moment. He was a man afraid of nothing, unbothered by the world around him. This was in fact the most emotion any of them had ever seen from him. He saw something in those woods, something that shook his very being to the core. My grandmother began throwing everything back in the car as the kids got in as well. John and my grandmother picked up their things as quickly as possible and threw it all into the car. They had no care for the things that they were packing up due to their fear. Food was all over the trunk, items were broken. After everything was tossed in, they both got in the car and drove away. This is where the main grunt of the story ends. But one fact from this story is what really has caused me to wonder all these years. My grandfather has refused to ever speak of what he saw. 
He never told any of the children, or even my grandmother. Every time this was brought up, he quickly rebuffed it and angrily told them never to ask again. He never went to the police or told someone outside of the family. My grandfather is the only person who knows what happened that day. When I first heard the story, I swore to myself that I would ask him one day. Now I can't, and I regret it greatly. By the time I was in high school, he had moved out of the state with other family members, and I mostly lost contact with him, outside of occasional happy birthday calls or letters. This story doesn't have an answer to go with it. When he died, the only thing I was sad about was never knowing what happened that day. We weren't close when I got older, and once I learned of all of the abuse he caused, I separated myself from him. His death looms over me, and this story still haunts me. My mother and aunts just look back on it as a spooky memory from their childhood. Nothing more than a story to spook the little ones at Thanksgiving with. I am one of the only people in my family who is still curious about what happened. I've always been interested in mysteries, horror, and conspiracy theories. This story piqued my interest more than any others in my family. This isn't the only strange story from my family, but it is definitely the strangest. I wish I had answers, but I hope you all find the story as fascinating as I do. A few years ago, my friends and I went on a 45-mile, three-night kayaking trip down the Green River in Kentucky. It runs above the Mammoth Cave System, the world's longest known cave system, with more than 400 miles of surveyed passageways. We brought everything we needed in our kayaks and one canoe, food, tents, water filtration, etc and we camped each night on the riverbank when it started getting dark, and we found level enough ground most times. The first night was uneventful, except to say that there's nothing like a wall of fireflies against a mountainous black tree line at night in the middle of nowhere. The second day, around sunset, after a long day of kayaking and baking in the July heat, we came upon a stream on the bank that opened up into a large ravine. The stream, as we found out, was a cave spring, pouring out blue, freezing-cold cave water into a lagoon, about thirty feet wide and so deep the blue water turned black after a few feet. The lagoon had a long, sandy beach, secluded by hills on either side, and a tall, overhanging cliff behind and above us. It was a beautiful, otherworldly place. Time moved very slowly there. We decided to camp there for the night. The sand was soft, white, and very fine, ideal for sleeping. For some reason, the place deeply frightened me, but I didn't speak up. We were all tired and everyone was having fun. We built a small fire and enjoyed the stars through the leaf canopy for a while before everybody went to bed. I slept hard that night. At around 5 a.m., I woke up with an urge to relieve myself it was still dark. I had the tent door zipper about halfway opened and had just popped my head out when I heard a loud and terrible roar or scream. I immediately cowered back into the tent and zipped it closed, and I waited. The scream came from about ten feet to my left, near the dwindling fire. It was high-pitched, but not like an owl screech, although I'm not ruling that out. It was a wretched, pained scream that got lower pitched at the end. Being that we were in the middle of nowhere Kentucky, most likely it was a fox or a boar or some kind of bird. Whatever it was, I lay awake for an hour, listening. I heard absolutely nothing. Granted, we were on a soft beach, but I didn't hear a single twig snap, not a single leaf crinkle, when, whatever it was, finally shuffled away. It was bizarre. I should mention at this time that up the beach and off to the side of the lagoon was a small, dry cave opening, maybe three feet wide. I cannot say with any certainty that it was not some ancient cave-dwelling creature that surfaced to investigate our camp. I somehow fell back asleep and awoke the next morning shaken. 
I asked if any of my friends had heard the terrible scream, but no one had. We pressed on down the Green River. The third night, at dusk, we came upon a large rocky beach. We pulled our boats ashore and decided this would have to do, as we didn't want to go farther down the river and risk being stuck on the water at dark. This rocky beach was where the river split into two, and in the middle formed a collection of pale rocks, tall grass, and dried out wood, a desolate pile of muck the size of a football field. The land mass was covered in jumping sand spiders and tiny frogs, again, otherworldly. We set up camp, ate, and all went to bed at around the same time. It was silent for probably 20 to 30 minutes, I'm not sure. I was asleep, as the others most likely were as well. I was having a dream, but suddenly, my dream was interrupted by what sounded like a booming, loud, mechanical, wooden beast. I awoke and shot straight up. It was truly the loudest thing I have ever heard. It sounded like a massive bulldozer tearing down a huge steel and wood building. Then came a boom, followed by its echo throughout the river valley. The animals shifted and the birds flew away. We were all awoken by the crash and yelling and confusion to each other in our tents. Nothing but silence followed outside our tents, and nobody was particularly willing to shine a flashlight toward the woods. Eventually, we all just decided that it was a falling tree, and went back to sleep. The next morning, I thought about it some more. It didn't sound like just a falling tree. I must stress that it had a metallic quality, and it was projected purposefully. It almost sounded like a roar. In the morning light, we found no evidence of anything out of the ordinary, nor any obvious fallen trees that could have made such a loud sound. So we packed up and headed out onto the river, one last time, to head home. My friends and I still talk about that trip and all the weird things that happened. We did the same kayak trip a couple of years later, and nothing out of the ordinary happened. No mysterious forest noises, no crashing, no metallic groaning in the middle of the night, nothing. To both my disappointment and relief. It's not unusual for me to trek out on solo hiking day trips. For context, I'm a 31-year-old female. I frequently visit the nearby provincial parks in Canada that are generally well used. It's rare that I end up on a hike not at least seeing one or two people. I grew up going on camping and hiking trips, and I feel very comfortable out in nature. I always inform people where I'm going and when I am expected to be back. Safety first, right? One day last year, I was going stir-crazy, so I took myself out to a popular nature educational center. A bunch of trails stem from this one spot. They're not long trails, but they are all interconnected, so it's easy to create your own distance. It was midweek, so I wasn't expecting to encounter many people, maybe a school group at most. I grab my backpack, lock the car, and head out. It was a beautifully sunny day, mid-autumn, so it was a little chilly out. I was listening to the sounds of nature surrounding me. Some squirrels, birds, even a deer crossed my trail at one point. I was sticking with the main trail, which had educational signs identifying the different types of plants as you went along. I have been trying to teach myself how to identify different trees on site, so this path was the best. I made my way up the first little hill, and then I made my way down the path, where it takes a sharp right turn. Up ahead, I caught sight of a man wearing a dark blue jacket. Strange, I hadn't seen any signs of the person or heard them, but whatever. Normally, I'm comforted seeing somebody else on the trail, 
but this time my gut instinct was not happy. I made a note of which way the person went and continued along. Blue Jacket had taken the path that I wanted to take to create a longer hike. It would have been a lot more secluded and less traveled. So for once, I tried to be smart, listen to my gut, and just follow the main route back to my car. Keep it short and safe. There would be other days for a long hike. I still had about two kilometers to get back to the parking lot. Clouds decided that they wanted to skirt across the sky, making the woods a little dull and ominous. I kept looking over my shoulder, feeling very unsettled. The trees cast finger-like shadows that did not help calm my imagination at all. One of my favorite spots on this main trail had a few huge boulders or rock formations right smack dab in the middle that you had to go around. Really neat for photos and climbing on a normal day. But today, they filled me with even more dread. I couldn't pinpoint why at first until I noticed some scuffs around the base of the rocks going the wrong way around. The trail is very obvious which way to go, left, and these marks were to the right. It was like somebody walked around the rocks dragging their foot behind them. An animal? Maybe. I couldn't figure it out. I wanted to turn around and go back the way that I'd come, but that would have added another four kilometers to get back to the car. I stuck close to the far side of the real path, keeping a close eye on the rock formation. As I made it to the other side of the rocks, I caught sight of some blue fabric, the same blue jacket that I saw earlier. The person moved as if ducking down between some rocks to avoid being seen. For Blue Jacket Man to reach the rocks before me, he either cut his own path through the woods or sprinted through about five to six kilometers of trails. I didn't like the thought of either option as I didn't know this person, and at this point, I didn't want to know them. Maybe he was taking a leak. Yeah, I'll go with that. I picked up my pace and dug my phone out. I texted my usual hiking friend, telling her all the details in case I went missing. Yes, I attempted to do this while following the path. I only walked into one tree. I glanced behind me again while the rocks were still in sight and I saw the man just standing there looking at me. I ran the rest of the way back to my car, hopped in, and immediately locked the doors. Curiously, there wasn't a single other vehicle in the parking area or on the road nearby. This place was nowhere near any towns, so I have no clue where Blue Jacket came from. I took a couple of minutes to sort myself out in the car, and as I pulled out to leave, I looked at the trailhead. There was that damn blue jacket on the signpost I had just passed to get to my car with nobody visible nearby. I was so spooked by this encounter that I refused to ever hike there alone again. Maybe it was all just an innocent misunderstanding, but it sure scared the hell out of me. This is my father-in-law's experience. This happened to him probably 10 years ago at our hunting camp in Alabama. It popped into my head as we're headed there tomorrow for a few days of deer hunting. He told me to go ahead and share his story. It's short, but as I get a little creeped out in the woods as it is, this would have freaked me out. So as some people probably know, you get out an hour or so before light and climb into a tree stand, a ladder leading up to a seat in a tree, usually fairly deep in the woods to hunt. This foggy morning, my father-in-law has been in his stand for a couple of hours, and it was getting light. He was reading a book as he waited for something to happen. Out of the fog, he hears a woman's voice, much closer than anyone should have been to him at the time. She's calling, Hunter. Oh, Hunter, in a very sing-songy voice, 
almost like a mother calling her child in for dinner as he played outside. Now, as I said, he's pretty deep in the woods, and there are sticks and dried leaves everywhere. You generally make a pretty good racket getting to your stand, which is why you go out so early. Not only that, but in order to know where he was and spot him camouflaged in a tree, she must have seen his light when he walked out, followed him into the woods, and waited hours before calling to him. That's the only way she would have gone unnoticed. At first, he thought that the woman was calling someone named Hunter, maybe her son. She called again, and that's when he realized that he is the hunter. So he turns around, peers into the trees, and sees a young woman. She, in very few words and halting speech, explains that something is wrong with her hot water heater and asks if he can come down and look. Now, the strangeness of the situation hadn't quite set in yet, and he's a give-you-the-shirt-off-his-back kind of guy, not to mention 6'2", nearing 300 pounds and carrying a gun, so he wasn't too worried about a small woman. He starts getting down the tree to go have a look. He follows her back to her mobile home, which borders our hunting land, probably a 10-minute walk. She walks inside and leaves the door open. He's trailing behind a little, so he gets to the door, kind of knocks, and sticks his head in to say hello. No answer. Where he entered is a laundry room, and he can see that there in the room is a hot water heater, and water is just pouring out of a valve at the bottom, just absolutely pouring out onto the floor. He walks over, turns off the valve, sticks his head in the house to say hello again, and nothing. No answer. The house seems completely empty. Empty of people, anyway, but it's a disaster inside. At this point, he's starting to see how strange it all is, and decides that this is just the sort of situation that gets you robbed and murdered. He nopes out of there and hurried back to our cabin. Now, we've hunted this land for years, and we've never seen anybody at this place. Although until this season, it has shown obvious signs of being lived in. So, every time I pass her place, which backs right up to the road we take to our hunting stands, I always wonder about her. I'm not entirely sure if she's actually a real woman, or if maybe it was some ghost or something trying to get him to go there for a particular reason. But... It was a creepy experience, nonetheless. This happened when I was growing up, around 2004 or 2005, when I was about 13 years old. It took place in rural Texas. The town itself was really small back then, and not much to look at. It's just one of those towns that really isn't on the way to anywhere important. My father knew someone who owned a deer lease that was about a thousand acres, I think, down outside of that area and was complaining about a ton of hogs that were tearing up their land. Being open season on hogs in the south, my dad thought he would surprise me that summer and take me down for a week to go hunting for them. Not only did that help him with networking for his job, but it also gave us some quality father and son time. I remember the drive down there from Dallas was torture. It was about seven hours in my dad's hardtop Jeep Wrangler. The car was so uncomfortable. I hated it. All I had to do was either stare out the window or try and beat Super Mario Land 2 on my Game Boy Pocket, something I was never able to accomplish in my youth. The drive, obviously, took most of the day, so we got there in the early evening. The owner of the land had told my dad that he hadn't had anyone lease it that year and that the cabin in the property might be a little rough and dusty. I didn't really care. At this point in my life, I had been in scouts for a couple of years, and I spent a lot of my free time in the woods or fishing with friends. Needless to say, I was pretty comfortable roughing it. So, after unlocking the gate and driving to the cabin on the land, we settled in. The cabin was pretty rough, dust and dirt everywhere, flies. 
I remember that it looked like some raccoons had gotten into the cabin and crapped on the floor. After cleaning up a bit and getting the sleeping bags out and then setting up the cots, we decided to sleep. Something about that night was weird. I was never able to get comfortable enough to fall asleep for any restful amount. I couldn't put my finger on why, but I had that feeling of being watched. I was finally able to drift off for what I guessed was an hour, maybe. When we woke up, it was early, about 7 a.m. We decided to scout around the land for tracks and signs of hogs and find a good place to set up a blind. It was the summer and horribly hot in the afternoons, so morning was the best time to be out and about. After walking for an hour or so, we came to an area of trees, lightly dense, and luckily found some signs of hogs, typical torn up ground where they'd been rooting, so we followed them into the trees. I was looking for more signs when my dad stopped me with his arm. I remember looking up and seeing someone standing about 50 yards away. Some of their body was blocked by trees. This was private land, so they definitely weren't supposed to be there. We also had confirmation from the owner before we got to the lease that nobody was there, not to mention the gate was locked up when we first arrived. The person was wearing some bright colored red jacket. We slowly walked toward them. My dad called out something like, Hey, we're, we're hunters. This is private land. The person didn't move at all, dead still. We were about 30 yards away and could see that he was turned away from us with his hands in his pockets. Weird thing was that the person was in a ski jacket and what looked to be ski pants. Now this is Texas in the summer. It was about 98 outside by then. My dad called out again, no reaction. He told me to stay behind him and unsnapped the clip to his pistol holder. That's all we had at the time since we were only scouting the area. The rifles were back at the cabin. We approached the person's right side, and then my dad told me to stay put about 20 yards away. I stayed and crouched down, watched him circle around to the front of the man, all while talking to him, asking if he was okay. He finally passed around to the front of the man, and my dad stood straight up with a really confused look on his face. I called out and said, what's wrong? He called back saying, it's a mannequin. I walked over to it while my dad stood there staring, and as I got closer, one thing stood out the most. The clothes it was wearing were brand new. No dust, sap, bird droppings, or signs of being outside for more than a day at the most. At that moment, I looked at my dad and I could see him get worried. Almost immediately after, I felt that feeling again, like we were being watched, and I knew that my dad felt it too. I wanted to start crying. I remember feeling suddenly like I was so scared. My dad whispered, we're leaving right now. He grabbed my hand and drew his pistol. He scanned the area the whole way back while I was trying to hold back panicked tears. We got back as fast as we could. I was terrified, so it felt like an eternity, but in reality, it was probably only about 45 minutes max. After returning, we packed up and beat feet. We drove back home that day and didn't talk much on the way back. I remember right after we left, my dad called his buddy, the owner of the land, and he was confused. He said that he would go check it out next week when he was in the area. He also said that he had never had an issue with people on his property because it was high fenced. My dad normally isn't a paranoid person, but me being young and the least possibly having someone there that we didn't know about, he decided to be cautious and just get out of there. After we got back home, we talked and my dad wasn't able to sleep the night before as well. He had the same feeling, but didn't want to wake me up because he thought I was sleeping. Turns out that next week he got a call from his buddy and he checked the whole property and never found a trace of anyone, including the mannequin.
I was backpacking through Pisgah National Forest in North Carolina with my dog. Just the two of us, and we were exploring the woods around Little Lost Cove. We were going open orienteering style, so we were not on an established trail. We'd been hiking throughout the day, following a creek, and toward the evening, I noticed my dog was acting abnormally. She was very much caught in a scent of something, and wouldn't ease up. This continued for about two hours before we made camp. That night in camp, she remained on edge and stared off into the wood line. I went about my camp business as usual, and then, at around midnight, I got this prickly feeling, like I was being watched intently. I felt the feeling ride for a little bit and I kept tinkering with the fire. And then, I heard the brush rustle. I got up from the fire and shone my flashlight up the hillside. A figure on all fours just managed to escape the beam, all but the tail. It was a tail that I knew was not supposed to exist in the southern Appalachians. I cast my light again across the hillside, and this time I caught its eyes. Two glowing yellow orbs, just watching and waiting. At that point, I went into a fury, grabbed my tomahawk, and charged up the hill after the beast, screaming and cursing all the while. The watcher ran off, but neither I or the dog slept that night. The following morning, we left camp at first light and began hiking up the mountain to the ridgeline, which would lead us out. Atop the ridgeline in the fresh mud were a series of tracks. Tracks left by an animal that officially no longer exists in the eastern U.S. They were catamount tracks. They commonly go by cougars in the east, but we'd been stalked by a mountain lion just the same. Those tracks ran across the ridge, revealing that it had been watching and stalking us throughout the entire previous day as we hiked through the creek bed below. They weren't bobcat tracks, I know those. They were way too big, and so were the eyes I saw. I truly believe that if my dog hadn't given me some red flags, I would have been mauled that night. It remains one of my personal scariest experiences ever, and it just goes to show that sometimes, when you feel that something's creepy and off, it can be a lot scarier than a ghost. So I live in Kentucky, in the city now, but we lived way out in the country when I was younger, in a very old, giant farmhouse. My family got it for cheap because it was falling apart, and the basement would flood and have a crawfish infestation because it was so old. The basement floor was basically dirt and mud. My dad and I would go on walks across the property to our neighbor's pond to fish, he allowed us free access to do this. This neighbor also owned a herd of cattle. One day, we were walking there, and at the top of a very tall tree, it had to have been 40 to 50 feet off the ground, there was a young calf simply impaled on one of the top branches. It had not been stormy for days, so it couldn't have been a freak tornado. It's worth noting that I was also abducted from this house twice. This was over 20 years ago, but I will never forget that moment. It is one of the things that's convinced me there's so much to this world we don't understand. When I was working as a backpacking guide in western North Carolina, my schedule dictated a full eight-day shift with six days off. During those six days, myself and other co-workers would play in the woods. In the summer, you can't beat a mountain swimming hole. One of our favorites was called Paradise Falls, alternately called Wolf Creek Falls. 
This is a cliff jumping spot with a huge swimming area, a tiny slot canyon, and an inner pool. Most will venture to do the small jump into the inner pool. Even though it's the smallest jump, it's arguably the least accessible. Even though the jump is 9 feet at most, you have to work through a 10 minute rock scramble to get to the top of it. We were all venturing in, and from inside the tiny canyon, you can't see the main pool. Well, we got to the jump and coaxed the first person off, a fellow guide who had never been to the spot before. She jumped successfully and swam out into the main pool and beach area beyond our eyesight, and then screamed. Because she was now out of sight, myself and another guy jumped in together and swam the short distance to her, with others in tow. Of course, we figured she was injured somehow. She was treading water and just staring, wide-eyed at the riverbank. When I looked to the shore, I saw what she had screamed at. There stood a man. He was massively large, easily 6'6 and a little change. He wore beat-up overalls and no shirt. There didn't appear to be a hair on him. Perhaps the most disturbing was that he had folds of skin all over his body. Imagine the Michelin Man, but made of flesh. His face, his arms, his chest, everything had a uniform layer of shingled fat rolls. And he was brandishing a shotgun. The area around Wolf Creek is just holler after holler, but there are a few residences, and those few have been there for generations, propagated by the same families. These people don't like outsiders, and so they keep relations within the family. I could only surmise that this individual was the product of inbreeding over decades. He just stood there and watched as we scrambled to grab anything important and stuff it in a bag. He stood and watched as we hightailed it out of that basin and back toward the parking area and never said a word. When I was a junior in college, I went camping with four friends in Bald Eagle State Park in Pennsylvania. We had reserved a campsite that was pretty remote, pretty deep in the park, way up on one of the mountains and not near any of the other campsites. It was located at the end of a narrow dirt road, maybe about 75 feet long, which itself broke off from the main road, which was also dirt. There was nothing at the end of the little road, except for our campsite. We parked at the entrance and spent the day hiking up to the site, setting up camp, and then hiking around. We made a fire, made dinner, and then turned in. Not long afterward, we discovered that one of the guys with us snored, loudly, like walls of the tent shaking snores. Truly deafening stuff. After probably an hour or so, the rest of us gave up on trying to sleep and climbed out of our tents, leaving our loud friend snoring away in his. My friend at the time was a DJ for our school's radio station, and she had a late night show. I think she was on between midnight and 2 a.m. Since we couldn't sleep, we trekked up to the main road, where the reception was a little better, and where we would actually be able to hear the radio over the snoring. When we got to the road, we stood in a loose circle near the entrance to our site. As we stood there, a black pickup truck, with its lights off, appeared out of the woods and passed us, very slowly. It was unmarked, not a ranger. We listened to the radio for maybe half an hour or 45 minutes after that, and we even briefly called in to say hi. Finally, though, we decided to head back to bed. One of the girls went off into the woods to take care of some things while I climbed back into the tent I shared with her and got into my bag. After a couple of minutes, I heard her moving through the leaves toward the tent, coming from the right. 
At the same time, I also heard the unmistakable rumble of tires on the ground. I stood up and looked out of the little screen window on the tent. We hadn't bothered to put up the rain fly, as it was a perfectly clear night with a very bright moon, so I could see everything. I saw my friend come sprinting back to the tent and duck behind it, just as the black truck pulls into our campsite, still with its headlights off. Then it shuts off its engine and sits there. Our friend is still snoring. I have a little knife in my tent, and I know my other two friends have at least one in theirs, but we have no other weapons, no guns, not even bear spray. So we just watch. As I said, it's a clear night, and I can see the truck just fine. It's maybe 20 feet from my tent, but I can't see who's in the truck or how many people there are. Nothing seems to move inside the truck. I still remember the metallic clunk sounds as the engine cooled off. I honestly have no idea how long I just watched it. My friend had ducked down behind our tent, and I could hear her breathing. I could hear that she was terrified, but neither of us said a word. It felt like it was a really long time. It had to be at least ten minutes that went by but it could have been a half an hour or more. We just kept waiting for something to happen. Nothing did. Eventually, the truck starts up again and then backs up along the narrow dirt road. It never turned its lights on. I heard it drive back in the direction it had originally come from, and that was it. My friend burst into the tent a second later. Now we're all talking. Did you see that? Holy shit! But our friend is still asleep. Eventually, we just went to bed. We packed up and headed out in the morning just as we had planned. And yes, we checked with the park and they don't own any black unmarked SUVs. Nor did any ranger come to check on our site during the night. To this day, we have no idea who they were or what they wanted. This story is from when I lived off the grid in the forest of Western North Carolina. Some friends and I all lived in these small shacks, essentially a shed with a loft. They were very close together, so we all lived together in a community. Living in such primal and close conditions breeds a kind of deep, trusting friendship that you just can't get from living anywhere else. Naturally, we did almost everything together. By our little semicircle of houses, there was a railroad track. If you followed it south, it would lead to a waterfall. This waterfall, in particular, is where everybody would go to get high. It was a normal night, humid, sometime in early July. A group of about six friends and I, Laura, Andy, Nick, and some of Andy's friends that I didn't know that well but recognized, decided to walk out to this waterfall in the dark. I was the only sober one in the group, so I felt a higher sense of responsibility for everyone and was therefore on edge and hyper aware of our surroundings. Others would walk faster or slower or stop altogether in the group. So it was natural and expected that we wouldn't be able to see everyone at the same time. Andy was in rare form though, when Laura had to stop to pee, he came out of the bushes and scared her, and then ran off ahead behind the rest of the group. This pissed off both me and Laura, since it was such a clear invasion of privacy and unnecessarily spooky in the already creepy night. Laura and I eventually got to where we could see Andy again, but he was walking by himself, and then he slipped back into the bushes without even looking at us. Dismissing it as him just being affected, we kept moving forward. Still not back with the whole group yet, we realized that Andy had followed in behind us, just far enough away that we could only see his silhouette. 
Finally, we catch up with the rest of the group and see that all of us are accounted for, even Andy. We asked him how he got ahead of us and beat us to the group, when he had last been seen at least 15 yards behind us just minutes ago. Everyone went dead silent, as Laura and I realized that whoever had scared her when she peed, and whoever had followed us after that, wasn't Andy or anyone else from the group. We never made it to the waterfall. A little bit of background about myself. I've worked my entire adult life in the Pacific Northwest woods, over 15 years in total, with about seven years of that being for the park service at Olympic National Park. Many, many experiences over the years could warrant the title of creepy. This one in particular has always stuck with me. While working for the park service, one of my jobs was that of a restoration carpenter. We would travel to old backcountry historical cabins, emergency shelters, homesteads, and things like that, tasked with repairing and restoring them to their original historically accurate states. This was a wonderful and demanding job. I'd spend eight days at a time living off the beaten path, usually deep in the backcountry. Sometimes we'd be flown in supplies, Sometimes we would use llamas or mules to pack our gear. All the while, we would sleep in thinly walled single tents, cooking over a fire or whisper light stove, using the same tools and techniques the original homesteaders had at their disposal in the late 1800s to construct and survive in this unforgiving environment. One late fall, I was assigned to work near Lake Ozette at an old homestead off the trail near the constructed boardwalk. For those unfamiliar with the area, Lake Ozette is eight miles long and three miles wide. It sits as the largest unaltered natural lake in Washington state. Lake Ozette has a long and rich history of Native American culture. The Macabre Tribal Center in Nia Bay houses discoveries found in the area dating back 2,000 years along with a local village that was well preserved over 300 years ago by a mudslide that left most of the artifacts intact. The Ozette Loop Trail, which the homestead was directly adjacent to, is approximately 9.4 miles through and through. The man-made boardwalk takes you under giant cedar groves, meanders through huge patches of chest-high salal, before delivering you to Alstrom's Prairie about two and a half miles from the trailhead. Alstrom's Prairie, a giant, soggy meadow, was once farmed by two Swedish immigrants. They constructed a small cabin and some outbuildings on the 150-acre bog. With cattle, sheep, vegetable gardens, and the help of a little Swedish ingenuity, they managed to etch out lives for themselves here for over 50 years. Over time, the forest, as it always does, decided to take back what was once its own. The now decades-long abandoned farm was hardly recognizable. Our job was to beat back the encroaching forest, put new windows in the main cabin, pipe in a new stove, apply fresh paint, and fix up portions of the semi-dilapidated barn. The ultimate goal was to allow guided tours to take place at some time in the future. For about three weeks, we stayed at the Ozette bunkhouse while working at Alstrom's. This was good duty for us. We weren't sleeping under the rain, our beds were warm, our hike was short, and the terrain wasn't difficult. We even had a TV. The bunkhouse was located near the highway and ranger station. We would hike the five-mile loop every day, bringing with us boards, tools, paint, and everything else we would need on our backs. These were full, 10-plus hour days. Usually, we started our morning hike at around 7 a.m., and we began our evening return hike back to the bunkhouse at around 5. At one point during the fall, there were four of us working this project, 
but at the time of this event, there were only two of us remaining. Most of the hard work had already been finished. We needed to hike a few last boards into the prairie to complete a portion of the woodshed before we could call the job done. I volunteered to be the pack mule for the day, my only job being to carry as many boards as I could muster in each trip to the prairie before returning to the ranger station for the next load. It was late in the season for hikers at this point. The weather had turned, and we'd be lucky to see two to three people in an entire day doing the loop. After around my fourth or fifth trip, I was pretty wiped. It was getting late in the evening now, around 4 p.m., and my co-worker had called it a day. I thought I could get one more trip in before it got too dark. My rationale being that the more trips I did today, the less I would have to do tomorrow. We passed on the trail, I told him my intentions, and I continued on. I delivered the last boards for the day, took a look around the prairie as the sun started to tuck behind the trees, and started my hour-long hike back to the ranger station. The lighting on the boardwalk was quite low at this point the cedars blocking most of the ambient light left by the setting sun and making visibility quite diminished. I'm not a nervous hiker, and I failed to spook easily. Having solo hiked for weeks on end in the backcountry, I've been stalked by cougars, confronted by Kodiak bears in Alaska, and even ran into a few demented hillbillies over the years. As I left the prairie that evening, though, the hair on the back of my neck stood on end, Goosebumps erupted from my forearms. An uneasy feeling swept over me, and suddenly I found myself wanting to walk faster, to jog, and then to sprint. I didn't. Instead, I convinced myself that I had been reading far too many novels before bedtime. I walked another five minutes or so before I started to hear something faint, something that sounded like music. Impossible, I told myself. I'm the only one out here, and still at least two miles from civilization. That civilization, in reality, being likely the only other soul out there, my co-worker. Sure enough, however, I heard music. More specifically, a piano. It started out so faint, I had to stop moving and actually try to hear it. The steps on the wooden boardwalk were too loud and covered it up. Every time I paused to hear it, it became unmistakable. It got louder. I stood there, sun now fully hidden behind the horizon, in total silence other than this piano. I became aware that there were no longer the noises of life. No birds, no insects, no wind, no rustling of leaves or underbrush. Absolutely nothing other than the piano. It was as if everything was being weighted down by a fog of emptiness of some kind. I've encountered this dead time before in the woods. Certain places have it. But this was different somehow. Unique to this location. Unique to this moment in time. I tried to focus on the keys, but I couldn't quite recognize the composition. Unsurprising, since I mostly listened to Metallica and Korn at the time. It was playing with a purpose. It was controlled, in tune, thoughtful. It was a song, and somehow I felt that it was meant just for me in this moment. I started walking again, almost on cue, the music got louder. As my pace increased, so did the tempo of the keys, still in tune, never faltering. It reached a climax. The perfect combination of my haste, my dread, my heartbeat, and the tempo of the music. And then, as quickly as it came, the piano stopped. Whooshed away in the fraction of a moment. It didn't trail off. It didn't fade into extinction. It was just gone. Suddenly, everything that was absent was swept away as if by a gust of wind. The stillness was gone. The gloom, the stagnation, and weight of everything was just lifted. My next step on the boardwalk was once again in reality. 
The evening was just as absent of light as before, but it felt like life, somehow, was once again injected back into the forest. The woods seemed normal again. I didn't hear the piano again that night, nor did I sense anything unusual. I told my co-worker every detail when I reached the bunkhouse, and he showed no sign of disbelief. We didn't talk about it again until years later, when something similar happened to another Park Service employee. I told my grandfather about what happened. He was a retired park ranger who had worked at nearby Mora just the next station over. Without the least bit of hesitation, he goes, Did you hear the bagpipes along with it or just the piano this time? The neighborhood where I grew up was more or less suburbs, except the back end of it borders a massive field where nothing has been planted for decades. Part of that border is buffered by woods, and it's in those woods where my friends and I would always play. One sunny day, we were particularly deep in the little section of forest. We were attempting to pick through what looked like very overgrown dozer tracks. The woods are thick across North Carolina, but the central and eastern portion is thick with kudzu in particular, and it was giving us hell. We had probably made a mile of progress into this track when we came across a depression full of water. I hesitate to even say that it was a pond, because it was perfectly round, like a crater. The water had obviously receded, and in the middle of it was the exposed roof of an old car. At about that time, one friend found a license plate under the pine duff. It was tagged with buckshot. Next, a door. A full car door, half buried under pine duff, riddled with bullet holes and shot. Certainly not an uncommon way to have fun in the South, go out, have a few beers with your buddies and see some old junk. But what we found next wasn't a run-of-the-mill Saturday night. Bones. Our still innocent minds first assumed it was a white-tailed deer. We started dragging out bones and laying them out side by side. I'm not sure if our objective was to make a museum-quality deer skeleton or what, but that's what we did. Then, the pelvis came up. I recognized it immediately, because my uncle was a chiropractor and had a full model skeleton in his office named Mr. Bones that I would always look at. The more I started to look at our growing collection, the more I started to see Mr. Bones taking shape. I got this weird gut feeling, and being the oldest, I told everybody to stop digging and that we needed to go. There was some protest, but I convinced everyone that this was the best thing to do. We hiked back the way we'd been coming in and went back to the pool down the road, finished out the day and went home. But I couldn't stop thinking about those bones. That night, I told my mom about what we had found. Then I had to tell dad the story. At first, they weren't convinced, but I wasn't a dumb kid. I knew what I had seen out there. They talked behind closed doors, going back and forth. The next day, I told the story to two sheriff's deputies and took them to the area where we had entered the woods. About an hour later, there were police vehicles packing the tiny dead end leading off to the woods. Chainsaws cleared brush and men in white shirts with detective badges smoked cigarettes and talked amongst each other as men carried bags from the forest and put them into vehicles. Then they were gone. I waited months to hear something, anything, nothing. I asked my parents what had happened. Did they figure it out? And over time, their answers would get more and more uninteresting. Eventually, I quit asking and forgot about it for the most part. It faded into a memory, fuzzy and dreamlike, the way childhood memories are. Eventually, I came home from college and I was sitting out by the fire with an old neighborhood friend who had been there that day. 
he saw everything I saw. We started talking about it after a few beers and got curious about the outcome. We started researching online and couldn't find a single word of information on a skeleton discovered in our neighborhood. It was baffling. I asked my parents the next day, and they said they had no idea what I was talking about. His parents said the same thing. Whatever happened that day, whatever they found, it was intentionally buried and forgotten. To this day, they all hold adamant that it never happened, but we hold adamant that it did. So this happened last year in Virginia, and is also the reason I never backpack alone anymore. I was taking summer courses at the time, and we ended up with a three-day weekend in June. So I thought it was a great time to go explore some of the Virginian wilderness. I did a Google search, found a state park with a trail that looked nice, and let my roommate and family know the trail I was going to be on. When I got close to the park area, I saw a little outdoor shop where people hiking the Appalachian Trail stop. I went in to grab a map of the area, just in case I got lost. As I was talking to the owner, he mentioned a trail that's not well known that has a pretty cool waterfall and a swimming hole. This piqued my interest, so I had him show me on the map. It took me outside the state park but he said it was a great place to go. I paid for the map and thanked the owner. I texted my roommate and my parents about the new trail, and I parked my car and set off on my adventure. I should note that the waterfall was going to be a side trip from my journey. I was planning three days and two nights. I started on part of the Appalachian Trail, and it was pretty packed with people, and some of them are really fun to talk to. As expected, I got further and further from the main trails, and I saw fewer and fewer people. Around early afternoon, three miles from my destination, I noticed it was unnaturally silent. No birds. No bugs. Not even wind. And I had the distinct feeling of being watched. I shook it off as me overanalyzing the situation. I got to the waterfall, and it wasn't too spectacular, but it was cool to look at. Plus, it had a good size area to swim in, so naturally I stripped down to my skivvies and took a dip. It was pretty refreshing. As I was getting my clothes back on, I started whistling to myself. That's when I heard something whistle the same tune back. I thought it was a bird copying me, so I went back and forth with it and it would repeat whatever I whistled. I thought it was pretty neat. As I was setting up camp, I couldn't shake this feeling that I was being watched again. Like I would get goosebumps and my hair would stand up on end. As night fell, I built a small fire and lit my jet boil to make some dinner. As I did this, I became hyper aware that again, there was no sound just deafening silence. Some part of my brain was telling me that I wasn't safe and that I should leave. I ignored it and crawled into my tent with my flashlight and book. I went to sleep without incident. When I woke up the next morning, my sight was trashed. My camp stool was nowhere to be found. My bear bag with my food was cut down and the contents were thrown across the site. My first thought was that a crafty animal had chewed through the rope and got the bag. But I looked at the rope, and it was cut with something very sharp. Plus, none of the food was even touched. I also noticed bare footprints, human footprints, all around my campsite. Keep in mind, I'm at least six to eight miles from any road. As I was looking at the mess, I heard a branch snap off in the distance. I turned to look in that direction. I saw nothing. But 
I heard that whistling again. My whistle from yesterday. But it was different. It sounded more sinister. It made my hair stand on end. And this is when I listened to my instincts to get the hell out of there. It sounded like it was a little off in the distance, so I packed up my camp as fast as I could. As I did, the whistling got closer and closer as I finally finished stuffing the tent into my bag. I didn't even bother with putting anything away properly. I just wanted to get out. The whistling was incessant and sounded like it was coming from all directions. I got fed up with it and finally I stood and yelled into the woods, Shut up! What the hell do you want? It stopped whistling, and it was quiet for a moment. And then it repeated everything I had just said, in my voice. It sounded just like me, but distorted like it was coming from an old television. After I heard this, I immediately threw my pack on and ran in the direction I'd come from. I heard it moving just behind me, fast switching between the whistle and my voice. It felt like it was toying with me, not coming too close, but never being too far. Eventually, it sounded like it got farther and farther away from me, and then it suddenly stopped. When it stopped, I stopped and turned around. I wish I never had, because I heard the most bone-chilling screech I've ever heard coming from right next to me. That's when I started running again. I didn't look, I just ran. Less than a half mile, I ran into a couple that was also backpacking. They saw the look of terror on my face and asked if it was me that had screamed and asked if I was okay. I told them about what happened and they decided not to go down from where I had just come from. We moved to a more populated trail and, as quickly as we could, all got the hell out of there. As soon as I got back in my car, I drove to one of the park's ranger stations and reported what had happened. Since the site was off park grounds, they told me it wasn't in their jurisdiction but that they would send a ranger to investigate. The ranger station's parking lot runs right up to the woods. As I was getting into my jeep, I hear the whistling coming from the woods just in front of me. 